Hello everyone, uh, my name is Klaus Aranha from the University of Tsukuba and today I introduce the course Experiment Design for Computer Sciences uh, from the Department of Computer Sciences. The idea of this course is to introduce to you how to do a proper experiment, how to plan this experiment, how to gather the data, analyze and draw conclusions. So this is a very important course for all of you who are planning to be uh, computer scientists. Uh, many of you will have to include experiment in your analysis. And in this course, I want to tell to you the, the right things to do and the not so right things to do when preparing an experiment. Uh, there is a short description of the syllabus. You can see the, the syllabus in the, in the course line. The idea is that based on the scientific method, uh, gathering experience is one of the important parts of this, and we'll study the general idea of the methods behind this. So you can see this course, I try to introduce this idea in a way that might be similar to some of the you, that the idea of plan, do, check, action. So before you do an experiment, for many of you, uh, doing an experiment is just, okay, I run the program, I get the data, I put it in my report, and it's done. And I want to give you, to put into your minds the idea that doing an experiment, gathering the data of the experiment is the smallest part of the experiment. Before the experiment, you need to plan what you're going to do. Make sure that your plan makes sense and make sure that your plan will guarantee you a fair and robust experiment. You gather the data and if you have a good plan, gathering the data is automatic. You let, leave the computer running, you get the data, and that's done. Now you have to analyze the data, which is most, very important. And after you analyze, you have to think of your analysis. What are the correct conclusions that you can draw from your experiment? Uh, this course came from the idea that I observed many students do the same errors again and again in thesis defenses, in Zeni presentations, in papers. Some of the errors uh, are included in this slide. So in many cases, I see students that run a computer program, measure a time, and put the time on the paper. And if you think about it, do you think that you could run that program again and get exactly the same running time, not even a nanosecond of difference? Well, that's a noise, right? Uh, you run the program three times and you get three slightly different running times for that program. What is the correct one? How do you determine that, right? Uh, we have many students who do comparison experiments between standard methods and proposed methods. And in these experiments, the standard methods, it's like, okay, uh, the student last year wrote a uh, run this experiment and wrote a table. I'm using this data from the table. And here is my proposed method that I fine-tuned the I fine-tuned the parameters. I rewrote it many times. I ran the experiment many times, and finally, my my proposed method is better than the last year. And if you stop to think about it, that's not really fair. Is are you really showing that your method in general is better than the one that you are comparing against, or are you showing that if you really put an effort, you can do you can get over it in one experiment. So how general is that comparison? Uh, many times the experiments are not reproducible, so there is no information in the thesis or in the reports that will allow future students to use that data again. And that's why the student from the previous example did not run the code from his uh, antecedent student, because the antecedent student did not leave the code for him to run. So reproducibility is also super important. Falsiability, and I see this a lot in um, experiment done with inter human interfaces. Uh, the, the experiments are done using only students from the laboratory who already know how to use the computer system. And there are surveys that ask some very uh, simple questions with no clear comparison, no clear baseline. So do you think that these, um, do you think that these Interface is nice. Do you think it? Are you going to tell to my face that the interface is nice and the person doing the experiment will go, hey, you know what? Yeah, yeah, it's a nice interface, very good. 
and then they shouldn't get the report that and put on the report. Eight people out of 10 told that my interface was really nice. So my experiment is a success. So yeah, that's experiment is not really falsifiable, is it? We're gonna talk about this later. And in many, many, almost all of the cases, the experimental conditions and the assumptions are not clear. Is this data an average of many experiments or from only one experiment? Uh, what is the data that was used? Um, what, is this a mean? Is this a median? Uh, is there, so you're showing some uh, deviation. What is the source of this deviation? So the final result of all these errors is the same. The result that the ex student is presenting does not support the conclusions that he wanted to show. Sometimes you have, I, I have seen the presentations where the experiment said one thing and the student said something completely different. In order to avoid that, I have established this course with some very basic uh, ideas, some very basic, um, how do you say, some very basic ideas for you to do some reliable and robust experiments for computer sciences. Now, this is not a problem only with students. Uh, this is a problem that you see very often in papers, in journal papers, in conference papers, sometimes in very big uh, journals. Uh, the thing is that we, in computer science, we do not have a formal education in experiment design. If you go to the medicine, if you go to biology, uh, chemistry, um, uh, even um, well, physics, of course, social sciences, in many of these disciplines, there are subjects about how do you do an experiment? How do you do um, a, how do you analyze an experiment? So how do you design an experiment? And this is something that is many times not done in computer science. And when it's done, the proper necessity of that is not clarified. Uh, when I was an undergrad student, we had a physics experiment lecture where we would drop some balls and calculate the, 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 the gravity from the speed of the balls. And that was uh, experiment design. And no one in that course said that what I was doing for physics, I also would need to do for computer science. And many people think, oh, the computer, it's a simulation. It's perfect. We don't need to replicate, replicate it. There is no errors. There is no noise. And there is a lot of noise. There is a lot of things that need to be designed. Uh, an experiment in computer science needs to be as rigorous, if not more, than experiment in physics, in social sciences, in biology, medicine, etc. Now, uh, in the last five years, I have noticed that the situation has gotten much better. For instance, in large conferences, you usually cannot get a paper accepted anymore if there is not at least a statistical analysis of your uh, results. But there is still a lot of work to be done. So, and if this work is not done, we might face what is called a reproducibility crisis. There was a reproducibility crisis a few years ago in social sciences. We, they saw that many papers, they could not reproduce the results. And that was because of poor experimental design that was made 10, 20, 30 years ago. And if we don't be careful, a lot of the papers that are coming out today, they will not be reproducible. If, and if they are not reproducible, what that means is that whatever conclusion they, they made, it's 99% useless. You don't want your research to be useless, do you? Unless you want to graduate and go to, to, to a company right away and forget that you have ever been in a master's degree. But even then, and this is one something we're going to talk, even in companies, you need to do experiment design. You're not publishing a paper, but you need to show, for instance, if you're building a a system that needs to be robust and that needs to execute within a certain time, you need to prove that your system has a minimum and a maximum rate of errors or a minimum and a maximum executing time. And to do that, you will need to do an experiment. So this is not only for scientists, this is very important for engineers as well. So what are we going to learn in this course? The basic idea of this course is that you are going to learn how to design experiments for your own research, how to analyze your experimental data, 
and how to read and criticize scientific experiments. And this last point is very important. Um, it's not only learning experiment design for your own experiments. As a scientist, you have also the duty to be able to look at a newspaper talking about some scientific discovery or to look at some other paper and know if that paper is reliable or not. To know if the science, if the results being proposed are backed by experiment or not. Okay. Uh, so for instance, right now we have the coronavirus crisis and there is a lot of news coming out, some very good sciences from epidemiologists and some not very good sciences from other people. Uh, Elon Musk. But <clears throat> so you need to be able to actually have scientific background to look to a research and say, look, this research I'm looking right now, it's not backed up by the data. The experiments do not support this hypothesis. So that's your whole role. You're being trained as a master, as a master degree student. You're training as a graduate student, as a scientist. And you also have a duty to use your knowledge to point to society what is good science and what is bad science. What is science that is supported by data and what is science that is not supported by data. Each of us is a potential fact checker in the world. So we need to be able to do the best out of this. Okay, so more in more detail, what is an experiment? Okay, so we're going to talk about what is an experiment, the characteristics of an experiment, what is a reproducible experiment, what is a reliable experiment, how we design the experiment. So remember, plan, act, check, do. So the plan part, how do you plan an experiment? And we're going to talk about pitfalls, things that if you do to your experiment, the results will not be reliable. Or in a word that you might also be familiar with, how do you introduce bias to your experiment? If you know how to introduce bias into your experiment, you also know how to avoid bias in your experiment. And this is very important. So, and we are also in, in a more technical way, we are also going to study statistical tools for analyzing experimental data. So we're going to talk about uh, some basic statistics, median, mean, uh, confidence intervals. We're going to talk about statistical inferences. How do we calculate if a, some set of data is, is, if a difference is statistically significant or is stati not statistically significant. And we're going to talk about special cases for statistical inferences. Pair tests, single tests, multiple sample tests, etc. The materials of this course, they can be found in the Manaba system. So you can see the link over there. If you are a member of the University of Tsukuba, you can access this. If you are not enrolled on this course, if you're enrolled on this course, you can access this link automatically. If you're not enrolled on this course, you can access this material using the self-registration code that is on the screen right now. If you are not a student at the University of Tsukuba, you can access this material uh, using the GitHub link that you can see below. Almost all of the material is on the GitHub link. There are a few papers that are not publicly available and there are a few, uh, you cannot access the reports, but other than that, you can access everything, okay? Uh, these materials that you are seeing, the main materials for this course are the lecture notes and the lecture notes are based on the design and analysis of experiment materials produced by Felipe Campelo from the University of Aston. Thank you, Felipe. And everything that you see that is cool, say, oh, this is very informative, this is very nice, this is thanks to Felipe. Anything that you see that is a mistake, this is because of me. So please leave a notice on GitHub if you see any mistakes on these materials. Uh, now, this book, uh, no, sorry, this course is mainly based on the, uh, on the lecture notes. There is no one textbook for this course, but if you want a main textbook to study the technical parts, it's Design and Analysis of Experiment by Douglas Montgomery. So this, will talk, this book will uh, survey most of the technical parts of this course. Uh, there are other links, other texts in Manaba. Every lesson I will give a series of recommended links that you can follow as well. 
Now, one thing that is very important is that this course is an introduction to experimental design. Every experiment is different. So maybe your experiment uses some different type of data here or has different assumptions or have different conditions. And in that case, the, some of the, the methods that we are introducing in this course may not apply directly to your experiment. However, the general idea applies. So the general idea that we are going to teach here, it's, uh, it will be available, to, uh, it will be uh, useful for a large uh, variety of experiments in computer science. And if the specific methods do not apply to your specific experiment, you should have enough knowledge to go after the material, the, the specific test that you need. So the idea here is that you're gonna learn the basics about experiment design and analysis, and you are expected to continue your learning. Being a scientist is studying always, learning new things always. So you are expected to study more ways of testing data, more ways of analyzing data by yourself, okay? Now, uh, how is this course organized? This course is organized of in le regular lectures like this one, and review and discussion lectures. Now, the re regular lectures, uh, you're gonna see the, um, the videos like this. These are offline videos. You can download them and watch them anytime. They will be published at the regular time of the lecture. So we have the lecture calendar. The video will be published on the day of the lecture calendar. You can see this later. However, I recommend that you see the video and read the materials as soon as possible because you will need the information from the video to write your reports, okay? Also, we have uh, review and discussion lectures. In the review and discussion lectures, uh, they will take place using an uh, online meeting tool. I have not defined it yet, maybe Zoom, maybe YouTube Live, maybe Twitch, maybe Nico Nico Doga, I don't know. Uh, in this, the idea is that everyone will log in at the same time I will review some of the reports. I will maybe do a case study and you can ask questions about anything regarding the lecture. Now, usually uh, uh, when the lecture is presential and not online, I like to stop the lecture many times and ask questions of the students, ask their opinions and have some class discussions. This time it's not possible. So please use the forums in Manaba or the KGBAN and ask any questions you want. It can be something that you don't understand. It can be something that you thought that was important. It was something that you disagree. That's fine. Uh, for instance, I was talking about that this course only touches a few topics. We're only going to talk about inferential statistics. We are not going to talk about Bayesian statistics. Uh, we're not going to talk about other kinds of ways that are used to uh, do data analysis. So if you want to talk about those, we use the forums, use the KGBAN in Manaba. If you're not a student at the University of Tsukuba, but you want to join the discussion, uh, leave a comment. The comments are moderated to avoid spam, but if you have any interesting questions, I will be happy to answer in the YouTube comments. Now, this is the lecture calendar. Today, we're going to give an introduction about what is an experiment in the next video. Uh, the next week, we're going to talk about point and interval indicators. And then we're gonna spend two weeks talking about uh, statistical inference testing. And then uh, we're going to have the first review and discussion lecture in the beginning of June. Uh, during June, we're gonna talk, touch some more advanced topics like power and analysis, ANOVA, and blocking and parameter selection. Then we have a second case study. And you can see here, we have the deadlines for the three reports. The first reporting is in two weeks from now. The second report is in the middle of June. The last report is in the beginning of July. So what are those reports? So the grading of this course is based on three reports. There is no final examination. The first report you have to submit before lecture three. The second report you submit before lecture seven. And the third report you uh, submit after lecture 10. And these reports are weighted 30, 30, and 40. And if you remember the rules of Tsukuba University, you need uh, Six, uh, 0 0.6 or more to pass the class and 0 0.9 or more to get an A+. Each report is a mini paper 
So it's basically you're going to discuss a scientific idea, scientific hypothesis, and you are going to describe and design the experiment to verify that hypothesis. You will do a data analysis based on your experience. You collect the data for your experiment, you do a data analysis, and you are going to discuss the results. The idea is that in this mini paper, you are going to use the techniques that you have studied in the course so far. So for the first report, you are supposed to make sure that you're using all the techniques that we teach in lecture one and two. In the second report, you have to use the techniques that we discussed from lecture one to six. And in the third report, you have to use all the techniques that are discussed in the course. Of course, you have to use the techniques that are appropriate for your experiment, okay? So about the report, the report must be submitted in English. I will not grade you if you have some English mistakes, but I will ask you that the report needs to be intelligible, okay? Uh, besides the report text, the report must be submitted in PDF format, but you also must include any files that are necessary to reproduce the experiments in your report. So here it's very important, I'm going to uh, say over and over again the importance of reproducible research and in these reports you are supposed to be reproducible as well so you need to if you are using data you have to submit the data that you are using uh, if you're using code to generate the data you have to submit this code if you're using script to generate statistical analysis and figures you have to submit the script as well and the easiest way to do all of this is to use R markdown for your for to generate your report I'm going to put some links in Manaba and on the GitHub on the R tutorial. Uh, but using R Markdown, R Markdown is similar to um, Jupyter Notebook, if you are familiar with Note Jupyter Notebook, but it's based on R and it has many um, useful um, features to produce a PDF report using R Markdown. The report will be graded by the correctness of the analysis and the quality of the discussion, but not on the result of the experiments. So one thing that I will uh, talk about in the next video is that you must first design the, your entire experiment. How are you going to do the experiment? How are you going to collect the data? And what is your analysis method? And if you do all of that, it might happen that you are going to do an experiment like this. Oh, I'm going to compare algorithm A and algorithm B because I think that algorithm B is better than A because of these and these and these reasons. And you do your experiment and the result of your experiment is that no, algorithm A is not better than algorithm B. And many students think, oh, my experiments show that algorithm A is not better than B. I'm lost, I cannot graduate, the world is done. And in fact, there are some people that think like that. But that's not science. Science is not knowing if you're right or not. If you know the results before you do the experiment, why are you doing the experiment, right? So science is not knowing. And in this course, we're like that. If you propose an experiment to say that you think that A is better than B, but the result is that A is not better than B, that's great. You learn something new. You need to be honest. The idea is that we're doing honest experiments here, okay? So I did, I expected A to be better, this is the experiment, my experiment design. These are my data. And in the result, it showed that A was not really better than B. And I think that the reason was this and that. And you do that and that's perfectly fine, okay? Uh, last point, you are encouraged to use your own research topic. So the idea that I have here is that this course will be useful for your research. So if you already decided your research team or if you have a general idea of what is your research team, feel free to do reports related to your research. It doesn't need to be exactly your research, but it can be the same area. It can be an analysis of something else in the literature. That's fine. But the idea is that this is a win-win. You are doing the reports for this course, but you are also advancing your research. So I win, you win, your advisor wins. Great for everyone. If you cannot do that, that's fine. Uh, in, the, in the past years, students did reports based on experiments in the kitchen. Cooking is a great way to do experiments. 
some students did experiments related to physical activities, that's fine. Some students did experiments regarding going around and observing the world, that's okay as well. Okay, final point, I want to talk about the computer science English program. So the computer science English program is a sub program in the computer science department. The idea is that we, we, are, we make available several lectures in English so you can graduate, you can get all your graduate requirements only taking courses in English, okay? If you plan to take all your courses in English, I encourage you to enroll in this program. This will give us information about what is the demand for courses in English in uh, our department, okay? So to enroll in this program, you need to send an email with your name in Roman letters. And if you have a name in kanji, you send uh, your name in kanji as well. And send your student ID to this mail address that you see right now, s uh, slash uh, dash d30 at cs.scuba.ac.jp. Uh, in your email, you write, I want to enroll in the computer science English program. If you're going to take your English classes all your classes in English anyway, uh, you will already satisfy all the requirements of this program. If you decide that you do not want to take all your classes in English, if you take more than half your classes in Japanese in the end, there is no penalty to join in this program. You will just be removed from the computer science English program, but there is no penalty for you. You're just a regular computer science student again, okay? If you want more information about what is the Computer Science English program, what courses are available, please see the new student orientation course on Manaba. There is orientation material for the Computer Science English program there. Okay, so that's the end of the material. And to finish, I just want to do a quick self-introduction. As I said in the beginning, my name is Klaus. I am from Brazil. I have been in, working in Scuba University since 2012. Uh, my research topics are evolutionary algorithms and artificial life. If you are interested in these topics, please feel free to talk to me at any time. And my hobbies are game programming and astronomy. Also, feel free to reach out to talk for those. I'm happy to talk. And one thing that I want to say in this course is that even after this course is finished, if you need help with the experimental design in your, uh, in your research, feel free to contact me. Uh, past students of this course have come back to me time and time again to show, oh, this is the manuscript of my paper. What do you think about my experimental analysis? What do you think about my experimental design? And I'm happy to answer to talk about these questions. So feel free to reach out. Okay, this is done. Uh, the material that you've seen is um, Creative Commons. You are welcome to copy, reuse, and remodify. Uh, some of the images are made by other authors. All of these images, they have permission to be redistributed and you can see the credits for the images in the last slide. Thank you very much. And I see you in the next uh, video. Bye-bye. Hello, I am Klaus Aranha from the University of Tsukuba. And this is Experiment Designs for Computer Science, uh, lecture one. What is an experiment? So before we go for what is an, ex the, the outline for this course uh, covers the following topics. First, we're gonna have a discussion about what is science. And then after that, we will discuss inside science. What is an experiment? The characteristics that make a good experiment and some good practice to guarantee that your experiment is useful and scientific. And finally, I will describe uh, the report number one in a little bit more detail. So let's get going. Well, all of you are masters, well, the students that are registered for this course are master's students. So you are being trained to be scientists. So what is science for you? Pause the video for a little bit, think for maybe five minutes, 10 minutes or so, and write down an answer. What do you think is science? What do you think is your role as a scientist? Okay? 
Um, well, there is no one answer, okay? Uh, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more. Uh, here are some answers that students from the past year gave that I, th I think were very uh, insightful. For instance, many of students usually when they ask what is science, they say, oh, this is how we learn about the world. Uh, this is how we get new knowledge, how this is we learn new facts. And that's, uh, that's a very good way to see about it. You use science as a method to learn things that you don't know, to learn about things that you don't know. Another point to that is sometimes science is not to learn about new things, but to understand what you don't know. By carefully thinking about what you know, and by being really honest about which facts you have and which facts you don't have, you cannot also understand what you don't know. There is this great book uh, of scientific literature called "You Have uh, We Have No Idea" that talks only about what are things that science still does not know, and it's a fantastic book. It's a book by uh, Jorge Chan and Daniel. Uh, forget his last name, but uh, it's the two guys who do PhD comics. Highly recommend that book. Other people, uh, they, take, they take one step back and they say that science is a method to reach the truth, which is an interesting take. And I think definitely we can learn a lot of about what is truth and what is not truth uh, by using scientific experiments. Uh, but of course, uh, there are many truths that are not directly observable by the scientific method. For instance, if I tell you, I love chocolate. How do you prove that scientifically? Right? So that shows a little bit of the limitations of what we can do and what we cannot do by using the scientific methodologies that we are going to discuss uh, on, this, um, on this course. Okay? Uh, and then uh, one new student that uh, one or two years ago said something that I found really interesting. Science is useful when it contributes to society. Uh, now, this is a point that is not exactly a definition of science, but it's a way to think that if we're doing a study that does not give back to society in some form, then what is it useful for? And I think that is a question that is worth thinking a little bit about. So if we think like, okay, what about pure science? Does pure science contribute to society? Well, you could say that yes, because uh, applied science is based on pure science. But we can also think about a part of pure science like that does not contribute to society. For instance, there are thousands and thousands of papers published to archive every week. What the, is every one of those papers useful? Does every one of those papers need to be useful? Is, it, is there a useful, is there use in science besides the product? Like if I make, if I study, I learn a lot and I make a scientific discovery, is the scientific discovery the only thing that is useful about science or is the process also useful for some reason? That's something that I talked about in the last video, maybe you remember about it, like when you know the process of science, uh, you are better equipped to separate what is truth from what is not supported by facts. So that may be something that is useful as well about the scientific, uh, the, the scientific process. And there are some, some students that, oh, science is how we develop new technologies. And that's a quite interesting point. Uh, I think a lot of people have this image of science and say, oh, this is an iPhone, this is science, or this is a car, uh, this is science or this is a rocket and this is science. And that's a point that is very common, but I think it might be a vision that is a little bit too narrow. Well, um, as I said, there is no one answer. Science is something that is very, very um, tied to, your society, to our society right now. So I think the best way to understand, to have an idea of what is science and what it's useful, is maybe to look at the lives of some scientists and to look at some scientific discoveries. Uh, we're going to do this a little bit every uh, week. Today, I would like to talk about one of my uh, favorite uh, scientists, uh, Marie Curie, or Maria Slovoska, as she was born. Uh, Marie Curie, uh, as she's better known, 
she is a Polish scientist that lived a long part a lot a, a long part of her life in France uh, from 1867 to 1934. Uh, she is a physicist and chemist. Uh, she is better known for being one of the pioneers of radioactivity. So she was the person who actually uh, dev devised the name uh, radioactivity. She is known also to be the first woman to win the Nobel Prize and also the first person to win the Nobel Prize two times. And that's pretty impressive. She won the Nobel Prize in physics and chemistry both times related to her discoveries on radioactivity. Now, uh, as I said before, Marie Curie was born in Poland and she could not initially, when she was in Poland, she could not um, register, uh, um, enroll in a regular university because the universities in Poland, they did not allow uh, women and in many countries uh, in Europe in that, in that area, in that, uh, in that age. So she got educated at, and this is a really cool name, she was educated at the Flying University. And it's called that because it was not like a regular, it was clandestine. I'm not, I don't know exactly how it worked, if they had like, if they mailed materials to each other or what they did. And that's something that is, that we're gonna see over and over again when we study the life of Marie Curie. She had lots of difficulties. Uh, for instance, I said that she gained her Nobel Prize. Um, the first Nobel, the prize that the money prize that she got from the Nobel, she used to hire the, her first assistant, and, and that's something that I find like it's. I don't think that you could not gain a Nobel today without already having money to have lots of assistants to to work on the research. But it's very interesting about that. So in the beginning, she sustained herself by working as a tutor. So she taught other people. She taught uh, she was a private tutor for, for rich families. And she had a lot of support from her family. So in this picture that you see right now, you can see Marie and her sister. And they, so her sister went first to university, supported by Marie Curie. And Marie Curie went to the university and later and also had a lot of support from her sister. She sometimes lived at her sister's place and stuff like that. Well, she eventually moved to Paris, where she did most of the research that she is famous for. Uh, she earned her physics degree at the University of Paris, and she had a very small laboratory. Her laboratory was an old shed that she got from one of her supervisors. Uh, it was shared with Pierre Curie. And as you see by the name, it, he eventually became her husband and they met each other at this laboratory. And it's funny that both of them uh, researched uh, radioactivity. He actually, he had another topic, but he moved to this radioactivity study uh, based on uh, Marie's studies. And they were fascinated by the light of the, the light that was emitted from radioactive materials. So in one podcast that I heard about her, they were wondering if they had maybe romantic dinner lit up by radioactive, radioactive rocks. That's a kind of a scary and nice image at the same time. Anyway, both of them have a lot of difficulty acquiring funding. So, and so as I said before, her first uh, assistant was hired using the money from the Nobel Prize. And Marie found out, and one of her first breakthroughs is that she found out that the emission of radiation from uranium depended only on the size of the sample. So many people were studying radioactive materials at that time, but some of those thought that, oh, maybe the, radio the radioactivity, like the, the uranium absorbed some energy from somewhere and then emitted it, or maybe uranium absorbed, uh, maybe it was a property of how old the rock was or something like that. And one of the breakthroughs of Marie Curie is that she did an experiment that she measured the radioactivity from the uranium rocks. And she did this measure on many different parameters. So if the rock was covered, if it was not, if it was mixed of other things. And she found that the main, the only thing that depended on the amount of the radiation was the size of the sample. More uranium, more radiation, less uranium, less radiation. And this indicated that radiation was a property of the material itself. 
it was not something that the material acquired, it was an innate property of the material. So that was one of her breakthroughs, okay? Uh, one thing that was really cool about Marie Curie is that she did not patent her techniques for studying radioactive materials. Why is that? Because in her opinion, by not patenting her, her techniques, people could use her techniques and science would progress faster. So even in the 19th century, Maria Curie was there being one of the pioneers of open science. Congratulations, that's fantastic. Well, Marie Curie was not only like a theoretical scientist, she also used her uh, findings in uh, radioactivity for, uh, for practical applications. So one of her observations was that uh, radioactivity was uh, known to cause damage to living tissue. And she observed that tumor cells, cells that were extracted from human tumors, they died more quickly to radiation exposure than healthy cells. So today we had radiotherapy and one of the predecessors to the radiotherapy that we have today for cancer is the discoveries by Marie Curie. Also, she developed uh, mobile during the First World War. She thought she thought that okay, the, the, the soldiers that are wounded they need to uh, receive surgery as fast as possible. And one of the things that are necessary for surgeries is to do an X-ray of the soldier to see what's the internal situation of the soldier. So she designed a mobile X-ray unit that could be put on a car and could be taken to the soldiers quickly. So these X-ray units, they were called the little curies because of her. And they were used by France during the First World War to make sure that the soldiers could receive um, treatment as soon as possible. She also developed radio needles. So as I said before, she observed that radioactivity caused damage to tissue. So she used radiation to sterilize tissues that would be used in surgery. So those were called radio needles. And if you were thinking about this, she did a lot of things directly with radiation. So her death was as the death of many radiologists, many chemists of her age. She died of cancer. She died of cancer that was caused by all the, all the manipulation that she did with radioactive materials. Uh, one thing that is kind of amusing is that some of her research notebooks are still radioactives. So if you want to read the original manuscripts that Marie Curie wrote, well, you can go to her institute and to the museum that has her materials. They are in an isolated room and you have to wear radiation suits to read her research notebooks. And if that's not amazing, I, I don't know what is amazing. So... That's a little bit of Marie Curie. If you are interested, I really recommend that you learn more about her and that will give you an idea like, what is science? Well, look at what the biggest scientists do and that will give you an idea of what science. So what about you? So this is one thing that I like to ask the students uh, when we have presential classes. Who is a scientist that inspire you? Well, you are a scientist right now. So have you ever thought, oh, this is a scientist that I'm really inspired by her, or this is someone that I think their, their discoveries are really cool. Do you know the story of your scientist? I think it's really nice. I mean, take your time after this class, think about which scientist do you like. Write a comment on the video saying, what's the scientist that you admire and what's their story. Uh, it's important for us to know who are the other scientists. The scientists that are really famous, they usually have great stories, great things that they did. And when we know that, that motivates us to study, that motivates us to do our research and to be better ourselves. So definitely take the time to figure out who are your favorite scientists. And in following classes, we'll talk more about other great scientists. For now, I would like to talk about a few more uh, scientific discoveries. So first, I would like to talk about the Big Bang Theory and the discovery of 
cosmic background radiation. So I think many of you are familiar with the word Big Bang Theory. And I'm not talking about that horrible, horrible TV show. No, I'm talking about the physics theory that describes uh, how uh, the universe progresses in the earliest moments of its existence. There is a lot of things that we don't know about how the universe came into being. But one thing that we do know is that the universe suffered a stage of very quick uh, expansion. This is called the inflation period of space. And we know that this happened because of the cosmic background radiation. And this is a very good example of how science and experiment works together. So many people pro, uh, propose different theories about how the universe developed. And one of these theories, the, this inflation theory, uh, described how the universe uh, increased very quickly in its first million years. And then this speed reduced to its current rate of uh, expansion. One thing that, that this theory, and this is, this is true for any good scientific theory, this theory made a prediction. This theory predicted that the energy from this inflation period was still around in the universe. And it predicted how the amount of the energy that was distributed. And you can see this wave graph that you can see. So uh, in the bottom, this is the distribution of the cosmic back, uh, microwave background spectrum that was expected following this uh, Big Bang Theory. And NASA, the American Space Agency, it used um, instrument, uh, our satellites to observe this, comic, uh, this cosmic background radiation. And the story of how this cosmic background radiation was discovered is very interesting. I'm not gonna go there right now, but just know that if you have an old TV that shows white noise, that white noise is the cosmic background radiation. So you can see the, back, the cosmic background radiation if you have an old TV. Anyway, what the Kobe mission found was that the cosmic background radiation the distribution of the different frequencies of the radiation, the black, bo the back black body spectrum, followed very closely the predictions made by the Big Bang Theory. And that was confirmation that the theory uh, was describing something that really happened in the universe. Because if the theory was uh, described incorrectly, then they would see a completely different distribution of those energies. So this is, uh, this, is a very, this is a very interesting way of how we can use uh, experiments, collect experiments all over the world to learn more about uh, how the whole universe works. A second experiment that I want to highlight, a second scientific discovery is the discovery by Sir James Lind. He is a British scientist and he discovered that vitamin C prevents scurvy. Now, scurvy is a disease that is very common in sailors, in people that go over the sea. It's a disease that is caused by lack of nutrients in the body. We understand this now. And we had like some wounds in the mouth and in the face, and it led to the death of many sailors. Uh, it was called rottening. Like people believed that scurvy was caused by the body rotting. And James Lind observed, okay, that some, uh, some sailors, some boats did not suffer so much of scurvy at other boats. There was a difference. Some boats suffered a lot of scurvy. Some boats did not suffer so much scurvy. And he was suspected that maybe it was something in the food. So he wanted to do an experiment to find out what. He had an idea that because the scurvy was caused by the body hotting, then if we use something acid, the, the rot would be destroyed and the sailors would not get scurvy. So he did the following experiment. He took 12 sailors that were affected by scurvy and he divided them in six groups. And for each of these six groups, he gave identical diets from the boats, but he did a supplement. So for the first, first group, he gave cider. For the second group, vitriol. The third group, vinegar. The fourth group, 
seawater, the fifth group, orange and lemons, and the sixth group, tea. Of course, it's a British experiment, they have to drink tea. Anyway, he found out that the group one and group five, they had reduced their scurvy. Group one a little bit, and group five a lot. It's very interesting, this experiment, because the tea that you can see here is something completely neutral, and seawater is something that's even negative. Okay, any sailor can drink seawater. So if seawater was good for scurvy, uh, then it would not be, the, it will, it, it, no one would have it. But he included this group to make sure that all sailors, they had the impression that they were taking something. So he would compare all the other groups against seawater because that was the base. That's what today, when we research medicine, today we call control. This would be the control group, the group that you did not expect anything to happen. And group five, it had this great difference. It was a red lemon. And because of this, James Lind talked to the, uh, to the British government and all the British votes, now they had to have lemons and oranges in their rations to prevent scurvy among the sailors. So today, medical research, uh, like the discovery of new medicines is, is done in a very similar way. You have a new medicine that you propose that is good for some sort of disease, and you separate into two groups. One group that will take the medicine and another group that will take nothing, or they will take a fake medicine. That is your control group. And you can see by comparing the control group with the treatment group, if the medicine has an influence or not. So both of these discoveries, they illustrate what we usually know as the scientific method, okay? The idea is that you create a hypothesis, then you gather data to test this hypothesis. The data will either confirm your hypothesis or maybe it will deny your hypothesis, reject your hypothesis. After you do that, if the data confirmed your hypothesis, then you write it out and you explain what happened. If the data reject your hypothesis, you're gonna think about what happened and where your hypothesis is wrong, and you're gonna start thinking again. So many of you might have heard of this scientific method, right? Hypothesis, testing, analysis, and conclusion. And well, this is not bad. This is definitely a, a, very, um, a very good way to, do, to think about scientific experiments. If we think a little bit about this though, this description of the scientific method is a little bit um, incomplete. Today we think that science is not only hypothesis, um, experiment and analysis. Let's think a little bit about it. For instance, hypothesis. Where do the hypothesis come from? Okay, where did James Lind came with the hypothesis that vitamin, that uh, acidic substances would be good for uh, scurvy? Like we said before, some people believed that scurvy was uh, a rotting of the body. So hypothesis, they come from what we know uh, about the world, right? We have some, let's see. Just get a pencil here. Oh, okay, I don't have a pencil here, okay. So we have some knowledge about the world. We explore and we discover the world. And we talk about people. Some hypotheses, they come from popular medicines, from traditional medicine. Some hypotheses, they come from um, study. They come from mathematics. You do a very careful analysis of mathematical theories and that creates your hypothesis. Sometimes you talk to each other people and Eureka, you have a very quick idea. So this communication is extremely important. Sometimes there is a problem that a lot of people want to solve. For instance, right now, everyone wants to find a vaccine or a, uh, or a drug to cure the COVID virus. So there's a lot of people that are proposing many different hypotheses. We had the, how do you say, we had the Avigan uh, medicine that was studied by Japan and China a few years ago. 
uh, we had the, the chloroquine medicine that was being studied in Europe and in, in the there, we had Donald Trump proposing that maybe if you drink um, if you if you drink disinfectant that might cure uh, COVID. Uh, anyway, so there are different ways that we come across these um, these hypotheses, and then we have, as you can see here, we have this link between hypothesis and gathering data. This is what we're talking about: hypothesis, experiment, interpretation, hypothesis, experiment, interpretation. But you can see here that there is a connection between gathering data and interpreting data that does not go back to the hypothesis. Why is that? Well, there are many kinds of experiments. Some of experiments confirm hypothesis, but if sometimes uh, you really have no hypothesis, you have no idea, you want to do an exploratory experiment. You want to try many, many different things to see what works. So maybe that was what Marie Curie was doing when she was trying to find out uh, what would cause uranium to emit more or less radiation. Maybe in the very beginning she had no idea and she was trying maybe more materials, less materials, maybe different treatments, maybe different ways. Uh, so these are exploratory experiments. After you do a lot of exploratory experiments, you see what seems to be going on and you formulate the hypothesis and then you do confirmation experiments to test your hypothesis. So you have a cycle inside here. Okay, so you have experiments for many different ways. But not only that, as we saw when we were talking about Marie Curie, after she did all the research in radioactive and she understands where radioactive is coming from, well, she thought, how can I use it? How can I use this to benefit society? So we have benefits and outcomes. We have the results of our experiments. They can be used to benefit society. And even then, you see that scenario back here because Okay, I found out about radioactivity. I found out that it, it can destroy tumors, but I don't know how much of it is dangerous to humans and how much is safe. So now I need to go back and do more experiments and test more hypotheses to figure out what would be a good treatment using radiation. And then after I have this, treat this treatment, I go back to this. So you see, it's not just hypothesis, experiment, congratulations. Science is over. No, it's, it's a living system that goes back and forth. So that's why it's important to have, to know about older scientists, to know about others, other, other discoveries, even if they are not from your field, because you have this vision about science as a living system, okay? And there's also the community, the scientific community. When you publish papers and reviewer number two rejects your paper, and reviewer number three gives you some very good ideas, that's also part of the scientific uh, community. Uh, the papers are reviewed, old papers are rejected, uh, new discoveries are made based on the revision of the literature. That's also part of the scientific method, okay? <clears throat> there is a link at the end of the, the, the lecture that has a very good discussion about this. I highly recommend that you read it, okay? Now, um, Inside all of this, and the focus of this course is experimentation. So both in the simple definition of uh, the high school definition of science and the more interactive definition of science, experiments, they take a central role. Why is that? Experiments are how we get data about the world. How, I mean, we can do the hypothesis, we can talk to other people, but at some point we have to go out there, look out of the window and see what are the facts. And that's how we're gonna get new knowledge. So, and to get these facts, we need to do experiments. So, but what is experiments? Is experiments just going out and collecting data? That's the focus of this lecture. I am going to stop this video right now so that you can think a little bit about it, think a little bit about science, think a little bit about science as a living uh, subject, thinking a little bit about the favorite scientists, leave your comment saying who is your favorite scientist, and in the next video, we're going to talk about what is an experiment. See you in a second. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Klaus Aranha from the University of Tsukuba. And we are at the Experiment Designs for Computer Science course. 
week one, part three. And now we're going to talk about what is an experiment. Uh, in the last video, I talked a little bit about what is science. And at the end of the video, I said that experiments, they take a central role in the scientific method. Um, and we're going to talk about one of the person that brought this central role to science as we know it. So I would like to talk about um, Karl Popper. Karl Popper is a, a philosopher of science. So, and like uh, many philosophers, he was very worried about what is knowledge? How do we know things? According to Popper, the way that we know things is by observing the world. We can only know things that we see happen. Uh, but he was a little bit more strict on that. It's, it's not good enough to just observe the world. We need to observe the world in a systematic manner. We need to create a hypothesis and to observe the world in a way that these hypotheses could be rejected. So, for example, if I tell you that I think that all cats are white, and I go outside and show, there's a white cat, there's a white cat, there's a white cat. Do I know that all cats are white? According to Popper, no, because going outside and looking at white cats would never falsify my idea that cats are white. I would have a very good, uh, I, I would have a very good reason to believe that maybe all cats are white, but I could not affirm absolutely. If I just see one black cat, that would destroy my, my that would destroy my hypothesis. So, hypothesis, scientific hypothesis, they have to be made so that they can be falsified, and we can only trust hypotheses like that. So, what is the what are the characteristics of a good experiment? Okay, as I said before, a good experiment is based on a falsifiable hypothesis. For instance, I can say that um, there is. Right here, I have a pink dragon, a pink invisible dragon. You cannot see it because it's invisible, but it's right here. Look at the dragon, it's so hot. Uh, hello, dragon. Uh, well, you can never say that the dragon is not here. You cannot see it, but I'm telling you it's invisible. So the hypothesis that I have a pink dragon right here, it's not falsifiable, okay? Now, besides that, a good experiment also has useful predictions. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit, but the idea of a useful prediction is that I need to predict something a little bit more than, for instance, um, the difference between I have two programs and my second program is better than the first one by 0 0.001 nanosecond. If that doesn't make a difference, you do that experiment, that is just a waste of time. Experiments also have data collection. In other words, we have to go out and look at the world that's the, that's what it means that it's an experiment and just not a proof. And also experiments should be reproducible. In other words, if I do an experiment, it should be possible for me to tell you how to do this experiment and you can do the same experiment and you should reach the same results that I did. Okay? Here's a little bit of a, uh, a fun comic about the ideas of Popper. So here is a dialogue between Popper and Sigmund Freud. So Popper is going to Freud for therapy and Freud asks, well, tell me why you came to therapy, Popper. And oh, well, honest, I don't even know, Freud. I don't really believe in these sort of things. Well, what do you mean? Well, you seem to be able to explain anything with your theories. Well, that's why it's so powerful. No, that's why it's so suspect. If a man has anxiety, you explain he was repressed as a child, or that perhaps he has unsatisfied libido, or maybe he's signaling a fear of castration. But because you don't make any concrete, testable predictions, nothing, even in principle, can falsify your theory. Interesting. You seem to have such a resistance to examining your psyche that you develop the most advanced mechanism of all. You deny the, val the validity of an entire field. Well, this is kind of illustrates the idea of falsifiability. Uh, Popper was lived, lived at the same time as Freud. Uh, Freud is, as some of you might know, is the father of psychoanalysis. 
And according to Popper, uh, psychoanalysis was not really a science because you could say anything. So if uh, if someone was depressed, you could say that because that's because her father they have a bad relationship with their father. But then this person said, "No, I had a good relationship with my father." And then the psychoanalyst could say, "Whoa, but maybe you wish you were your father, but you're not. You admire him, but you wish you were him, but so you're not." So whatever the person said, the uh, the idea is that Freud would just add something extra and extra and extra. And you could never actually say that um, there was no fact that could say that psychoanalysis was wrong, so psychoanalysis was not falsifiable. Of course, there are some criticisms, but for our role here, we're going to go with this falsibility. Scientific, uh, scientific uh, hypotheses need to be falsifiable. Experiments need to be based on falsifiable hypotheses. So, the idea is that a scientific hypothesis is falsifiable if there is some observation that would render it false. Like I said before, if I make the hypothesis that all cats or all birds are white, it's very easy to falsify that hypothesis. If I see one cat that is black, my hypothesis is false. I can also say that all cats, they... Um, <clears throat> how can I say I could say that all cats have four legs, and if I see a cat with more or less legs, then I, then hypothesis is, false, is, is falsified. So falsified, falsifiable hypotheses, they make very specific predictions. So not the, these predictions include not only if the hypothesis is true, but also if the hypothesis were false. So if we say that algorithm A runs faster than algorithm B, we can create a hypothesis that say the mean running time of algorithm A will be always at least half of, at most half of what algorithm B does. That's a hypothesis. The running time of algorithm B, A, is always half than the running time of algorithm B. And we can do an experiment. We can run algorithm A and algorithm B with many different data, and we can measure the running time, and we can see, oh, this algorithm A always running at half the time or less than algorithm B. And if it is, then that supports our hypothesis. But if we see that the algorithm runs slower, then that rejects our hypothesis. Okay? Also, it has, like I said before, useful and strong predictions. It's not very hard to make trivial predictions about the world, especially in computer science. It's very easy to make trivial hypotheses. We're going to talk about this in the future. So the idea is that we not only want to do falsifiable hypotheses, but falsifiable and strong hypotheses. Hypotheses that we can use something about, the, uh, we can use them to predict something about the world. Okay, now let's move on and think about experiments. So the idea is that after you do the hypothesis, you are supposed to collect data. Depending on how you collect data, there are many different ways to collect data depending on the objective of your experiment, okay? Uh, I'm gonna describe three kinds of experiments. These are not all kinds of experiments, but this is a good starting point for you. So depending on how you collect data, we can describe an experiment as an observational experiment, as a retrospective experiment or as a controlled experiment. So let's see each of those. What is an observational experiment? An observational experiment, you obtain data by observing a phenomena without interacting with it directly. For instance, let's say that we want to know how many people um, use the train with and without masks every day. We want to know if now that people, if people are using the masks are as it's being required. So what we could do is that we could go to Tsukuba station, we would get a notebook, and every time we see a person, we write one person with mask, one person without mask, one person with mask, one person without mask. That's an observational experiment. You go and you observe the world. Observe, depend, observational experiments require some care. We need to observe a representative situation. For example, 
if you always go to the you know, to the scuba station in the afternoon you are not looking at people that are going to work because they already are at work so maybe the people in the afternoon because they know that the train will be not be very full they are not very worried and they don't wear masks or maybe it's the opposite maybe they are um they can maybe they are less stressed so they make sure to wear their masks but it's a different information that we, you would see in the afternoon and you would see in the morning so you need to think why are you observing this in the afternoon why are you not observing this in the morning that's a decision that you have to make about your experiment what information do you get by observing the scuba station in the morning and observing the scuba station in the afternoon okay so the observational experiments allows the researcher to choose the general connection, uh, conditions for observations. One thing about observational experiments is that some events are very rare and it might be hard to observe them in an observational experiment. For instance, let's say that you want to know if uh, people, with beards, people with beards, they wear masks more or less often. Well, if you go to scuba station, a lot of people don't have beards. Maybe 1% of people have beards. So it might be very difficult. Maybe you spend there one, two, three days and you don't see anyone with beards. What do you do? Okay, so that's one limitation of the observational experiment. Now, a second type of experiment is the retrospective experiment. The idea of the retrospective experiment is that instead of going out and observing, you obtain your data from historical records. For instance, new papers, reports, other scientific papers. Uh, sometimes this is called a retrospective study. Okay, so for example, let's say that you want to know that if when a celebrity marries, if that encourages other people to marry as well. So what you do is that you get a list of celebrities that have been married in the past two, three, four years. You get the average number of marriages on every day. And you see if the number of marriages after the celebrity announced their marriage increased or not. So you could do an experiment like that. And you would observe if the marriage of the celebrity affected the marriage of people. So that would be a retrospective experiment. Another example that I think it's really cool is one real, this is, a, this is a real example, though this is one research that was done about the climate change in Japan. There is one temple in Japan where they have a festival on the day, on the first day where a certain lake, uh, the water in a certain lake melts. So there is a lake in the mountains and there is a temple in front of this lake and the lake freezes in winter. And on the day that the lake melts, the temple holds a festival. And the temple would write down on the diary what was the day of the festival. So for many years, this is a very old temple. This temple has, has, has recorded the date for, of this festival for the last 300 years. So some, uh, some researchers, they took these records and they got the the dates of the, the 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 festival and they observed that based on the days as the uh, environment got hotter the festival became earlier and earlier and earlier so the date of the festival was getting earlier in the year because the lake was uh, melting Quicker, quicker, and that matched the observation of temperature changes from other experiments. And that was a very interesting experiment. It was especially interesting because in more recent years, uh, they don't have the festival anymore because the lake's not freezing anymore. Anyway, um, so one thing about retrospective experiments is that it's generally cheaper to do a retrospective experiment. Why is that? Because for an observational experiment, you have to pay someone to go there and click, click, click on people. For a retrospective experiment, well, sometimes you have to pay to go to very specific libraries, but often you can just go and get many papers or many books to get the information that you need. 
in some cases, you can only do retrospective experiments. For instance, how would you do this experiment with this uh, lake that I told you about? It was over 300 years of observations. It would take 300 years for you to observe this. So you can just look at the past data instead. Okay. Of course, uh, because you're doing looking at past data, if someone did not write down the data, or if there was a mistake, then your experiment will be affected and you have to take that into account. How do you deal with these mistakes? For instance, going back to the lake experiment that I told you about, during Second World War, well, they did not have the, they did not have the festival because, well, there was a war going on. So they did not have the, the, they did not have the records for those dates. And there were other dates that also did not have records because something happened in the temple, someone died and they did not have it, something like that. So uh, there are also these limitations on the retrospective experiments. Finally, we have controlled experiment. So in a controlled experiment, the researcher defines the exact condition of the experiment and performs the experiment exactly to that conditions. Well, this is very common in computer science, and I will use the very traditional example that you have algorithm A and algorithm B, and you want to see if the algorithm, what's the speed, what is the efficiency of algorithm A. So you choose, you create the algorithm, you choose the data sets, you choose the platform, you choose if the algorithm will run in your computer, or it will run in a cluster, or it will run in the cloud. You, run, you choose how many times you're gonna repeat, you choose the parameters, you choose how you're gonna analyze, you choose everything, okay? So a controlled experiment gives a lot of control for the researcher. For instance, if we think about the observational experiment, I said, oh, some people don't have birds. Well, you can do a controlled experiment where you contact people who have birds and you ask them to uh, take a picture of themselves every day before they go to the metro. So, um, that is a little bit more control. You, you controlling who you are going to uh, observe, okay? However, with great power comes great responsibility. You have a lot of power to design your experiment, but it's very easy to insert research biases into the experiment. It also can be very expensive because you have to control the variables, you can contact more people, you have to repeat experiments, etc. Although in, in computer science, because we can run programs very cheaply, uh, sometimes it's not too expensive. Unless you're trading giant neural networks that takes thousands of, thousands of dollars to run. But yeah. Um, one thing to observe is that these are not the only three kinds. And sometimes an experiment is a little bit observational, a little bit controlled. Sometimes it's a little bit retrospective, a little bit observational. The important thing that I want you to learn is not, oh, there are three types of experiments. Is my experiment type A, type B, or type C? No, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking here is that by thinking about what kind of experiment you have, you also have to think, how successful is my experiment to bias? How expensive is my experiment? What are the weak points and the strong points of my experiment? What do I have to be careful about the data that is not available in my experiment, okay? Let's talk a little bit about this. All these questions that you make about your experiment, they are called experiment design. Hey, course title, experiment design. Okay, so we're talking now about experiment design. When we perform any experiment, we have to make several technical and scientific decisions. For example, we have to decide which methods do we compare in the experiment. We have to decide which data sets we use in our experiment. We have to decide how many times we interview each participant in our experiment. We have to decide what is the order that we perform our experiments. We have a lot of data. Which data we report completely and which data do we summarize? What criteria we use to determine if our hypothesis was accepted or rejected. What parameters do we use in our programs? How many times do we repeat the experiment? And what do we do? Do we repeat the experiment and only take the last? Or do we repeat the experiment and we take the average? Or do we repeat the experiment and we report every single result? 
all of these questions, they are decisions that you have to make before you do your experiment. This is experiment design, is how you answer each of these questions. Experiment design depends on the type of the experiment, depends on the hypothesis, depends on the goal of the experiment and what, try, what kind of question you're trying to answer, okay? I'll give you some more detailed examples of what points we have to consider when we're doing experiment design. Okay, one example that is very common is that we have to use experiment design to control for variation. So let's say that we are running a computer program and we want to know how fast it runs. For example, we are developing a parallel algorithm and we want to know uh, what is the uh, parallel uh, factor, what is the parallel factor of this algorithm. How fast is algorithm run on one core? How fast is algorithm runs on two cores, on four cores, on eight cores, etc. To do that, we run the program and we measure the clock time, right? We measure the time from the start of the program until the end. However, because you are a computer scientist and you know a lot about computers, you know that the running time of a program is affected for a program that will run in the background. For instance, you're running the program, you know that it's gonna take about two minutes. So while the program is running, you fire a game really quickly and you play your game a little bit while you run the experiment. Of course, when you're running the game, the experiment will change because the game will be loaded in the computer memory and it will share the computer processor with your experiment. Or maybe you're running an experiment for two hours and because that's too long, you take that time to look at the videos of the experiment design lecture. Well, while you're loading this vi these videos, it will be causing communica uh, network communication that may affect the running time of the experiment, okay? So what do you do to control this? If you don't control for this, uh, maybe one program will look much faster than the others, but that's just because that program was lucky and there was no background activity while that program was running. So what could you do? One thing that you could do is you repeat this experiment. Instead of doing the experiment only one time, you do the experiment maybe 20 times and you take the average running time. And the average running time will eliminate a little bit the uh, influence of some lucky or unlucky situations that your program was executed. So this is one thing that we do in experiment design. We design our experiment and we design our data collection to remove these variation factors. Let's go for a second example. Controlling for independence. Let's say that you are in the interactive design laboratory and you are designing two different um, GUIs for websites. You have one that is, has a lot of figures and one that has no figures. And you want to know which apps website, website A or website B, which of them is easier for people to find information? Now, your idea for an experiment is this. You say, look, you tell the user, look, this is a website, and in this website, there is a receipt for chocolate cake. And you measure how many clicks it takes for the user to find the receipt for chocolate cake. There's a problem here. If after the user, if it's the same website, but only the GUI changes. After the user searches in the first website, when the user searches in the second website, the user already has some information. It knows what are the sections of the website. It knows what links it sh should click. So maybe the user will be much faster to find the information on, website, on the website B because he already has some information from website B, A. In experiment design, we say that experiment A and experiment B are not independent. The result of experiment B depends on the result of experiment A. So what do you do, right? Uh, one way to do that, there are many different ways. One way to do that is that instead of always testing website A first and website B second, you could randomize this. Half of the users do website A first, half of the users do website B first, and you make sure that this choice is random so that you don't have any bias in that. 
Another way to do that is to not have all the users check both websites. You have some users only test website A and some users only test website B. That would remove the independence completely. However, that would add a different problem that for instance, maybe many of the users that you chose to test website A, they are very familiar with computers and many of the users that you chose to test website B are not familiar with computers. So that would go back to the previous problem and add variation to your experiment. So that's another thing that you have to be careful when you are designing your experiment. Are your experiments independent from each other? Okay. Let's go for a third example. This is very common in uh, computer science, okay? Controlling for fairness. Let's say that you are developing a neural network architecture for a new vision problem. Uh, maybe you, have an ex you want to develop a program that will detect if the students are, um, if students are cheating on the test. That's a very specific problem. You have to see the, the, the direction of the head, the inclination of the head, what, if the head is looking at the test, etc. So you design a new neural network architecture and you fine tune it very carefully and you do many experiments to make sure what are the best parameters for this neural network architecture. And then after you do that, you have to show that it's better, this architecture is better than what already exists. So you take your architecture that you very finely tune, and then you get ResNet, and you get um, <clears throat> um, YoloNet, and a few other networks from online. You just download, you open like Keras, and you open um, TensorFlow, and you just uh, get the standard networks from the standard libraries, and you run them, and you compare with your network. Is this comparison fair? Of course it's not, because the networks that you are compared against, they are not fine-tuned for your problem, okay? So maybe they were fine-tuned to different problems, and of course they will perform bad for your problem. So maybe what you're learning from your experiment is not that your network architecture is best, but that the fine-tuning that you did is best. Maybe if you did the same fine-tuning to the other architectures, you would figure out that the architectures are the same. Or maybe not, maybe after you do the, the same fine tuning for all architectures and you compare them, you will figure out that your architecture, your architecture has, a, has advantage anyway. So this is what we call controlling for fairness. You need to do the same sort of fine tuning and improvements that you do on your, on your proposal for your competitors. You cannot, do, uh, you cannot only fine tune your proposal and leave your competitors to, uh, to do in a, in, a, in a disadvantaged way. That would, not be, that would not give you a clear image of whether your algorithm is really better or not. Okay. Okay, so um, all that we talk about are different ways that you can uh, design your experiment to make sure that you are getting useful information from it. There are many other choices that you have to make, and we're gonna talk about these choices in future lectures. But the thing to keep in mind is that you have to define your experiment design before you start your experiment. One problem that usually happens is that you, maybe you even do an experimental design, you define how you're going to do the experiment, and then you run your experiment. But when you're running your experiment, you notice, hey, the results were not our expect. So I would change the design a little bit and oh, the results are a little bit better now. Oh, maybe I change a few more variables and oh, the results are even better now. And eventually you find uh, a result that you are happy with. Now, I think, I hope you can see that this will introduce bias into the experiment. If you cannot see why this introduced bias to the experiment, Think about machine learning. You have training data and test data, right? So in the training data, you are fine tuning the parameters. But in the test data, you are not supposed to fine tune the parameters because if you fine tune, then your, your, um, your machine learning, machine learning uh, system will overfit to the test data and you don't know if your system is efficient or not. 
Well, this is very similar on experiments. If you modify your experiment after you did your experiment design, if you modify your experiment after you did your experiment design, you are overfitting to your experiment. You are introducing bias. So the idea is that you design your experiment and then you run the experiment. In that sense, we have the concept of pre-registered experiments. What are pre-registered experiments? Pre-registered experiments is when you publish your experiment design before you do your experiment. So you create your experiment design, you say, I am going to do this experiment to test this hypothesis with these parameters and this analysis. You publish that. And then you do your experiment. And after you do your experiment and you do your analysis, then you write, okay, I did this experiment that was based on this pre-designed experiment and the results are so and so. By doing this, you guarantee that no biases will be introduced after you design your experiment, okay? Also, not only that, one problem that we have in science nowadays, and maybe you've heard of it, is that people think that you can only publish positive results. And in a sense, there are many conferences and many reviewers that will reject anything that is not a, public, uh, a positive result. If you don't publish negative results, what happens? Maybe you tried algorithm A and you found out that it doesn't work, but you did not publish it. So another research goes and also tries algorithm A and find out that it doesn't work. But because it doesn't work, the other research, she also doesn't publish it. And then a third researcher also thinks that the algorithm A may be useful and will try to work it, but it doesn't work and it doesn't publish it. And then we're going to have a lot of people uh, doing this repeated work, reinventing the wheel by working on an algorithm that does not work, but because there is no publication that the algorithm does not work, they don't know. And even worse, in some cases, a coincidence, one specific set of parameters may show that the algorithm worked for that specific case, but not in general. But because that specific case was published and not the many researchers that show that it did not work were not published, people will have a wrong idea of when the algorithm worked and when it doesn't. So it's important to publish negative results and pre-registered experiments can help avoid the loss of negative results. Okay, so if you want to know more about pre-registered experiments, there's a link here on the Center for Open Science. I really recommend reading the entire description of this. Okay, the last point that I want to talk about experiments is about reproducible experiments. One of the most important points today to guarantee valid uh, experimental results is to make sure that your experiment is reproducible. A reproducible experiment means that other people can do the same experiment as yourself and they can reach the same results. In computer science, it's so easy to re have reproducible experiments. You publish the code, you publish the data, and you want to just copy the code, execute it again, there you go, experiment was reproduced. So there is no reason for a computer science developing algorithms to not do a reproducible experiment. Why do we need reproducible experiments? Well, first is that other people can confirm your results. Even if you did your result, even if you did your experiment, maybe it was luck, uh, maybe it was a very specific set of circumstances. If other people can repeat the experiment and reach the same conclusion as you, it makes your results stronger and more reliable. Another good point is that, have you ever heard of the phrase, standing on the shoulders of giants. Science is made by improving about other discoveries that were done in the past. And the best way to improve on other discoveries that were done in the past is by uh, using the experiments of other people as a starting point. So if your research is reproducible, other people can use your research and can uh, build new things on it and they will cite you, which is good for your uh, curriculum, okay? All right, uh, other people can also improve your results, and more importantly, society can use our research. There is a lot of research that is lost because no one can reproduce it. I have many students that they read papers and say, oh, this paper is useful, but there is no code, I cannot reproduce it, I cannot use it. So 
that research get lost. You're not only pub publishing your results to graduate, you're publishing your results to improve society, especially our university, because it's a public university, it's funded by taxes. It's funded by money that society has paid. So we have to give back to society. And one way to do that is to make sure that our research is reproducible, okay? All right, so now that I thought why reproducible research is important, how do you make your research reproducible? I, I, I talked a little bit about it, but let's put it on points. The first important point of a reproducible research, it's not just code, okay? You have to have a clear experiment design. So uh, you have to write detailed steps about how to perform your experiment. What are the values of relevant parameters? How the results are processed and evaluated, okay? Also, as I said before, we have open data and open source. So you have to show, if, you're, if you can publish your data, then you publish your data. If you cannot publish your data, you can publish the data acquisition protocol. In other words, how to obtain the data. Let's say that you're doing, the, uh, you're doing the, uh, an experiment using medical data. Maybe you cannot publish the data because of privacy reasons, but you can say, we obtain this data by taking 10 people that are, were in age between 30 and 40 years old. They were all males. They were all in good, condition, good physical condition. And we took their temperature every day for seven days. If you describe carefully your data acquisition protocol, other people can repeat and can get data that should be similar to yours, okay? If you are publishing your data, you publish, of course, the files of your raw data, but also the pre-processing scripts that are necessary to manipulate your data, okay? For computer science, you also have to publish your algorithm and make sure that you have good scripts that can help people reproduce your algorithm. I recommend to my students that publish not only the algorithm, but also the, the scripts that are used to execute the experiments. Nowadays, if you have a, now that we have things like Docker, you can even put a Docker container that has a run me button and you can just download the Docker container, press the run me button and you are reproducing the experiment. That's another way to do it. Finally, open documentation. Uh, when you publish your paper, publish also the scripts that you use to generate the images, the scripts that you use to generate the statistical analysis that will allow other people to see if there's any mistake in your statistical analysis or if there is any extra information that could be used or even learn from you so they can do similar things okay all right uh this is the end of the lecture so let's summarize what we studied today so we studied that experimentation is a key part of science experiments acquires data that can be used to validate or falsify scientific ideas and to answer specific scientific questions. An experiment has to be performed carefully to guarantee its ex uh, usefulness. So we have the experimental design that is the step, the first step in the experiment when we define what we are going to do in the experiment, how we are going to do it, and all the details, okay? Uh, in the experiment design, there are many decisions that you make that will affect the fairness and the meaningfulness of the experiments. And reproducibility is essential to guarantee that other people can check your experiments to make sure that they are valid. Okay, based on all of this, you are now ready to start thinking about the first report. So report one is design and execute a scientific experiment and report on your results. So we're going to do what we learned on this class and we're going to do science, okay? So the idea is that you have to choose a simple experiment to design, perform, and analyze the results. So first thing that you do is that you have to choose a scientific question. What is the scientific question that you want to answer? Why is the scientific question important for you? And it doesn't need to be important for the whole world. It's, an it's a report that you have two weeks to do. So you have to think about a report that can be done in two weeks. What kind of experiment, what kind of scientific question can you answer in two weeks? And why do you need to do an experiment, okay? This is a scientific inquiry that requires an experiment to solve. And then after you do this introduction, you have to describe the experiment design of your experiment. How the data will be collected to answer your scientific question. 
what are the cares that you need to take? What parameters do your, uh, your experiment have? What steps did you take to guarantee that the experiment is fair, robust, and controlled? Okay. Then after you design, then you collect the data. So you go and you have actually to do an experiment. Okay. So do an experiment, describe how you did the data collection. If anything happened, so oh, I was planning to go out and take a picture outside every day for one week, but on Tuesday there was a rain and I could not take the picture, so I had to change something in my experiment. Okay. So you have to describe your data collection. And finally, you have to do the analysis. So you have to describe the results in detail and what answers these results do to, to, your, to your scientific question. Now about this last step, data analysis, next week we're gonna talk about um, point indicators and um, uh, interval indicators. So you might want to use uh, information from the last next class uh, for this last point. So I recommend that this week you use this class to do points one, two, and three, and next week you take the information from the next class to do point four. Okay? Remember to follow the practice of reproducible science. So include any code that is necessary to run your experiment and make sure you, that you include enough information for other people to be able to reproduce your experiment. Now, a lot of students have a problem on this report. They say, okay, I don't know what experiment to do. Well, you have many options. If possible, choose something from your own research. If you choose something from your own research, like, oh, I, wanna rep I want to try to reproduce some uh, data that I saw, or I want to do some preliminary experiment about what I want to do, or I want to do some data analysis, that's best because you are not only doing the report for this lecture, you're also practicing to do experiments for your research. If you cannot do, maybe you have not decided your research topic yet, maybe you have no idea, you can also do experiments from day-to-day -day life. Students from past years, they did experiments regarding cooking techniques. Oh, is it better to cook with a frying pan or with a big pan or is it better to keep fruits on the fridge or, or outside of the fridge many different ways so cooking is a good i, I think that cook uh, cooking is a great uh, a kitchen is a great laboratory so it's a good way to do experiments okay uh when you're if you do if you go this route be very careful of measuring errors okay uh, that can introduce errors in your experiment um, when in doubt, if you have really no idea, it's always easy to do an experiment comparing two algorithms. So you can take, if you're a process, if you're working with machine learning, you can take two different neural networks for one specific task and compare them. That's an experiment that you can do. Make sure that you choose a fair way to compare in this case, okay? One thing is very important, make sure that you choose an experiment that you can perform. A few years ago, I had one student that proposed to compare different clothes from very expensive uh, brands. And of course, that student could not buy the clothes, so she, he could not uh, do the experiments. So do, choose an experiment that you can perform. Uh, as I said in the last slide, next lecture, we'll talk a little bit about to analyze and report experimental data, but you can already start thinking about the experimental design, what experiment you want to do, and maybe start collecting some data, okay? Uh, for this, I have some recommended reading. So the first leading, the first uh, link, Understanding Science, talks a little bit about what I said in the previous video about science as a living organism, as an interactive process. The comic that I showed in this lecture, it comes from Existential Comics. It's a very good uh, web comic series that talks about different philosophers. Um, so I really recommend that you go and read and learn a little bit more about philosophy. Uh, there are two series of videos, uh, Crash Course Sociology and the Scientific Method and Crash Course Sociology Research Methods. They talk about a lot of things that I talked today about how to do an experiment, how to design an experiment, it's focused on social sciences, but I think it's even better because you can see that the same principles that I talk here, they apply for computer science, they apply for medicine, they apply for social sciences. So make sure to take 
a look at those two videos. The link for these videos will be on GitHub, on Manaba, and maybe on the description of this video as well. All right, and this is the end of the lecture. I hope you enjoy it. And if you have any questions, please leave a comment or leave a message in Manaba. See you uh, next week. Hello everyone. And this is the second video for Experiment Designs for Computer Science. I'm Klaus Aranha from the University of Tsukuba. And today we are going to talk about point and interval indicators. So uh, let's give an outline. So last class, uh, we talked about what is an experiment and how do we use experiments in science to get data about one system that we want to understand. In this lecture, we're gonna focus on that a little bit more. We got, exper we got data from experiments. How do we use this data to learn about a system that we are studying? So well, that's what we talk about, like the importance of characterizing data. And for this characterization, we're gonna use two main statistical concepts population and sample. We're gonna explain what is a population, what is a sample, what is the difference. And then we're gonna talk about how we use a sample to characterize a population with two examples, point estimators and interval estimators. And we're gonna talk a little bit about visualizing estimators. Uh, that will be on a separate video where we're gonna use code to uh, do some of the examples of the video that we talk here. Before we start, let's talk about one scientist that was all about gathering and understanding data. So I'm talking about uh, Charles Darwin. I guess many of you know of him. Uh, Charles Darwin is very known for his theory on the origin of the species, which is a theory that describes how, through the process of evolution, we got the many different uh, species of animals in nature. His, uh, his theory was very interesting the, the way when he published it because it correctly predict the hereditary nature of evolution. In other words, how the characteristics of parents are uh, passed to offspring before uh, we knew about genes. So the discovery of genes and genetic inheritance was after uh, Charles Darwin, which was quite new. So basically only observing the relationship between uh, parents and offsprings, he, no, uh, he made uh, a, a framework that described how parents passes um, their characteristics to offsprings and how these characteristics slowly lead for species differentiation. Well, of course, uh, as we're gonna see uh, in future examples of science, Many of the great discoveries, although we usually say, oh, this person found out about this discovery, in the majority of cases, the entire uh, scientific community was interested in that question. So this was the same uh, regarding Darwin. During Darwin's time, there were many people that were proposing and discussing many different ways to model uh, the, uh, the generation of species, the speci speci uh, speciation. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to talk about a little bit about that too. But who was Charles Darwin? So next, last class we talked about uh, Marie Curie, and it was interesting to notice that she had um, some very humble beginnings, that she had lots of difficulties uh, by being a woman and, and trying to get into a university. Uh, Charles was a little bit uh, different. So Charles Darwin was, a, was the son of a wealthy doctor and in a very large family. He had many brothers and sisters. And by, by based on the, what his father was wanted for him, he went to study as a doctor. So he was pressed as a doctor. It is said that he really did not like all the blood of operations, and he found the classes to be really dull. So when he was done with his, um, his, stud his, stud his study as a doctor, he actually, while he, instead of taking classes, he would prefer to go and study taxidermy, which if you don't know, is the techniques to get animals 
and uh, dead animals and make them look like if they were like real models. Like when you go to a restaurant and you have those models of food, taxidermy, taxidermy is the same thing, but for animals. So right now we can see that he was very interested in studying different animals and observing how the animals are different and what characterizes them. <coughs> so, so he decided to, after he finished his study, he decided he wanted to go on a trip to study animals in many different places. So one of the, um, <clears throat> one of the main activities that Charles Darwin is known for is what it's called the Beagle Strip. The Beagle, it's uh, HMS Beagle, it's the name of a ship, is a trip that Charles Darwin was assigned to he was the cataloger, and in its time, it was in the height of the British Empire. So the British were sending many ships to different parts of the world to catalog the different animals on the different continents, the different fauna, the different flora, the different geo, um, geological characteristics. So they wanted to know more about how the world was different uh, in, many, in many parts. And Charles Darwin was in one of these trips right? He spent a five years voyage on the sea. And as you can see in this image, he visited, uh, let's mark here, oops. So let's put the spotlight. So in this trip, so he started here in England, and he visited South America, Brazil, Peru, Colombia, uh, the Galapagos Islands. So his visit to the Galapagos Islands is very famous. That's when he observed different types of birds in different islands. And depending on the island, the shape of the, the birds, the beak of the birds was different. Uh, he visited um, Oceania, so um, Australia, and this uh, south of Africa before going back to, uh, to England. So during this trip, he kept extensive notes of his observations and theories. Um, he is, the journal of his Beagle's trip was Charles Darwin's first uh, famous scientific publication that was launched him in his, uh, in his career as a geologist and as a uh, biologist. Okay, so he observed the, the, the diversity of mockingbirds, tortoises, foxes, and by observing all these different animals and how they were similar to each other and how they were different, and more specifically, how their differences seem to be related to their environment, he started to think about what, make, what makes all these animals different. So, in 1837, uh, his notes from the Beagle Strip gave him his first insights. Uh, here you see one page of his diary when you, he can see he's trying to branch out the species. Um, okay, so what he's thinking about. And based on these ideas, he did not only thought about it, he said, okay, if this is true, maybe I can see this happening in other situations. So he started a very long study, a very long time studying and gathering data. He took a lot of data from breeders, both of animals and from, broad, from farmers. So uh, we, of course, there is the natural evolution, but we also use artificial evolution when, for instance, breeders take the biggest uh, corn, for instance, the biggest plants and replant them. So they become bigger and then replant them. And the same thing happens with dogs. So breeders take dogs that have, if they want to breed dogs for hunting, they take dogs that have good hunting qualities and breed them together. And these qualities become more accented. And they have also <clears throat> are quality, um, how do you say? They also have qualities for, um, if you want a dog that is small, a dog that is cute, you can breed them similarly. So he was based, all this information he was cataloging over 15 years. And eventually, after all of that in 1859, so that's more than 20 years from the end of his Beagle trip, he published his famous book, The Origins of the Species. 
Uh, if you have the chance, I really recommend that you can get this item, this book. Uh, it's available in Project Gutenberg. Project Gutenberg is a website where you can download very old public, or very old books that are already in the public domain. And the origin of this species is very interesting because it's a book that is very focused on describing over and over and over again how Darwin saw evolution in many different uh, in many different contexts. So he shows how evolution works with breeding dogs, how evolution works with birds, how evolution works with plants, and over and over again he observes the same thing. So his um, science was basically saying, look, here is my theory, and here is how I saw it here, he is how I saw it here, he is how I saw it here. And even we last time we talked about falsifiable theories, towards the end of his book, he describes, he was very careful about that, he describes what kind of things we could expect to see if his theory was not correct. So if the theory is not correct, you can expect to see these kind of things, or these are other information, that, these are other things he wa that you could expect to see, like the intermediate uh, creatures uh, in the fossil record. So it's a, it's a very interesting book. And one of the things that I find very interesting about the origin of the species is that Charles Darwin knew that his theory was he was afraid that his theory would be controversial at the time. So he was very careful. He took over 20 years to gather information to publish his book. And actually, he kind of only published his book because his friends that he communicated, the other scientists that he communicated, gave him the uh, incentive that he needed. So there are many letters cataloged between Darwin and especially uh, Huxley, who was another scientist that Darwin talked about him, uh, uh, talking to a lot of time, but also other scientists that were contemporary to Darwin. And they were like, no, no, this, you need to publish this. This is important. I said, oh, okay. So he published almost when he was like very, his health was very bad. He was an active scientist in other fields, even though during his 20 years, he kept cataloging other uh, discoveries. He kept cataloging other types of animals and publishing about these catalogs. So he was extremely active in that area, but his origin of the species book, although he had the initial idea in the beginning of the career, it was only published towards the end of his career um, because of all these, um, <clears throat> how do you say, this carefulness. So it's a very interesting, uh, a very interesting take about how sometimes uh, to find something new and important, you need to carefully catalog different kinds of data, carefully consider how we're going to publish, how we're going to present it to other people. And we're going to do that a little bit here when we talk about how we use data from samples to describe a population that we have to learn more about. All right, uh, a quick note before we start the lecture. Uh, starting from this lecture, we are going to give many examples in code about how to calculate some of the uh, concepts that we are going to talk about. So in the next video, I will show some coding examples and all these coding examples use the R programming language. Now, the R programming language is not something that you normally learn in computer science courses, but it's not a very difficult language to learn. It's a language that is very specific towards statistical analysis. Uh, it has a very large number of libraries for different statistical tests, uh, different ways to present data, different ways to pre-process data, to process data. So I highly recommend that students that are taking this course to get acquainted to R. Uh, there's a link that you can see here. So R for beginners. It has described the, the main characteristics of the R programming language. And there is a software, R Studio, that can help you get using to programming in R. <coughs> so let's talk about statistical indicators. Last lecture, we talked about how we use experiments to obtain data. And how can we use this data to gain knowledge about a system? Imagine that you want to learn more about the students of a university. You could take one student, let's say you, and you measure your height. 
So you are maybe 175 centimeters high. From, so that's an experiment, right? You're looking at the world and you take some information. You measure your height. You did some experiment, you got some data. What can you use? What can you learn about the, student, the height of all the students in a university from your height? Not much, right? I mean, it's not nothing. For instance, if your height is 175, then at least you know that 175 centimeters is a possible height for students in your university. But you cannot re really learn much more about that. You cannot say that all students have 175 centimeters, right? So from one student height, it is hard to learn anything about the height of the students of the university in general. What would be better is that if we took the height of several students, we can take, for instance, the height of 10 students or maybe 20 students, and we can take the average height of all these 10 students. And okay, so we got the, the average height of 10 students. What's the relationship between the average height of 10 students and the average height of students of that university in general? Is it the same? Is it close? Is it far away? Can we say anything about that? Okay, so we're now talking about a concept of statistics. It's different from probability that we learn in high school. In probability, we have information about a system and we calculate probabilities. Like if a, if a drawer has three black socks and three white socks, what is the probability that we got two black socks if we take socks without looking? Statistics is the, is the opposite. We have a drawer with lots of socks and we take three socks and we got three black socks. So, what are the colors of the socks in the drawer? That's the statistics, okay? Of course, there are many calculations that are similar in statistics and probability, but uh, let's focus on the statistics for this course. And we're gonna go right away and talking about two concepts that we're gonna use the entire lecture and the entire course. These are the concepts of population and sample. So population is a large set of objects that are inter of interest. So the population is the system that we want to learn. It can be a real set, like I said in the last example, all students of a university is a population, okay? But it can also be a theoretical set. For example, all the possible ex results of an experiment. Let's say that I want to understand the system of rolling two dices. So what is the all possible results of the two dices? Well, one dice can be a one and the other dice can be a one. One dice can be a one, the second dice can be a two. One dice can be a one, the second dice can be a three, and so on. So of course, these results don't exist yet. They are theoretical, but the population is the set of all the possible results that I could get if I rolled the two dice. Okay, now what is an observation? One observation is one element of this population. When I execute the experiment, I get one observation out of it. So for instance, for the students, I get one student from the university. Or for the experiments, I execute the experiment once. I roll the dice once. That's one observation. What is a sample? A sample is a subset is a set of observations. So for instance, for the case of the university, if I take 10 students, that's 10 observations. That's one sample with 10 observations. For the dice, if I roll the dice three times, I have a sample with three observations, okay? So a sample is good because if we examine the sample, if we take the average height of 10 students, for example, we can make an inference about the population, okay? What does it mean to make an inference about the population? Let's give another example. Imagine that we have a pool with many colorful balls like you have here. So we have a plastic pool 
And you really want to jump on this pool right now. It has blue balls and yellow balls and red balls. Okay. Now, if this was a high school uh, probability course, I would say this pool has 50, color, 50 blue balls, 50 yellow balls, and 50 red balls. If I take 10 balls, what is the probability that I get all three? What's the probability that I get one of each color? And you could calculate that. However, you don't know. Imagine that you don't know how many balls. It's a very big, a very big pool, and you don't really want to count all of them. You just see balls of all colors from the distance. If you want to estimate the proportion, are all the same amount? Do I have more blue balls than, than yellow balls? Then what you can do is that you take some of the balls and you calculate the proportion. If you take, say, 50 balls, and in the 50 balls that you take, you have about the same amount of each. Then you can estimate or you can infer that the proportion in the pool is also roughly the same of the three balls, of the three balls. Let's think about computer science. Let's say that you are downloading a file. You are downloading a new game from Steam. And in the download it says, oh, this download will take two hours. How does it know? Well, one way to calculate that is to calculate, that is, of course, when you are downloading the file, the server is sending you many packets. Each packet has a size. The server calculates how long it takes for one package, one packet to take to reach your computer. Of course, because there is an error, there is a variance, it actually sends maybe 10 packets or 100 packets and calculates the average time. By calculating this average time, it can multiply that by the total number of packets that it needs to send you and make an estimate, an inference about how long the total download would take. Think about this as an experiment and think of from the point of, view of this point of view of experimental design. What could go wrong with this estimate? How could you improve the estimate? Okay, think about it a little bit and then we're gonna go for the next concept. All right, so we're talking about inference of the population. What are we trying to infer? Well, the population is the world, the thing that we want to know about, but we don't know. So for instance, let's say that you are Darwin and you want to learn more. You saw some, uh, you saw some, some fossils of a large dinosaur and you want to know more about this large dinosaur. So what do you want to know? Well, you want to know the parameters that describe this dinosaur. So in statistics, parameters are characteristics of the system that we want to learn. For example, in this dinosaur, we want to know the length. So maybe we estimate from many samples that the length is something between 7.5 and 8.5 meters. So we got many fossils, and by calculating the size of the fossils, we estimate that the parameter length of this dinosaur is between 7.5 and 8.5 meters. And we can estimate that the height is between 2 and 2.9 meters. We also estimate that the maximum size from the fossils that we found is 9 meters for the length and 3 meters for the height. We also had other mass, other parameters. We have the mass, the size of the school, the size of the horns, and the size of the nose horn. So all of these are parameters. A parameter, and usually we call a parameter theta. So a parameter theta of the population is an unknown value that we want to learn by using experiments. Remember that we cannot observe the population directly. So we never know what is the value of the parameter, okay? So for instance, the average height, the dinosaur has an average height. If we take all possible dinosaurs of this species that were ever born and will ever be born again, so this is a theoretical population, but this theoretical population has an average height. We cannot know this average height, but we can estimate this average height from the samples that we take, okay? So that's the role of statistics, to estimate parameters of a population. 
Okay, so like I said, by observing data obtained from a sample, we can characterize, in other words, estimate parameters from a population. For example, we can calculate the average of the running time of multiple executions of a program, and from this average, we estimate the mean running time of the program. We can ask the age of several students in a school and estimate the maximum and minimum age of a student. We can estimate the efficacy of a remedy by counting what percentage of patients get better after drinking. So every time that you take some data from a sample and use this data to estimate uh, the, va the, the, the value of the parameter in the population, we're do we are, we are doing uh, uh, we're doing statistics. Now, we usually say a statistic, okay, a noun. So what is a statistic? A statistic is a function, okay? So if we look at these examples, in all of these examples, we're taking data from the sample and thinking a little bit like a computer scientist, we're getting this data and putting this data in a function and this function will give us the estimate. So for instance, if we look at this third example, we're gonna get our sample, which is patients take a remedy, and we take 100 patients, and for each patient we take, did the patient get better, yes or no? So we have one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. We get all of this data, and we calculate a percentage, which is an average of ones and zeros, right? So this is a function. We're getting this sample and we're putting this in a function and this function will give us an estimate. So this function we're gonna call a statistic. Why is this important? Okay, uh, there are many different statistics that we can calculate in many different situations. Part of your experimental design is to define what statistics you need to learn what you need to learn in your experiment to learn what you need to learn in your uh, scientific question. So to learn about the efficacy of this uh, remedy, I need a statistic that is the percentage of patients that got, uh, got cured by this disease. Let's say that you have an experiment that you want to know what is the maximum weight that this bridge can hold. So your statistic is some function that from your experiments, we'll calculate this maximum weight. Okay, in this lecture, we're gonna talk about two types of statistics. There are many, we're gonna talk about two here. The point indicator or the point estimate and the interval indicator or the interval estimate, okay? So the idea of estimating parameters using information is statistical inference. So inferring information from the population. And we're gonna talk about point estimator and interval estimator. Point estimator are statistics, functions on the sample that estimate the value of a population parameter from information on the sample. Now, interval estimators, they estimate a range of values. So if you remember the dinosaur, we had an estimate of the length of the dinosaur that had a minimum value and the maximum value. So that's an interval estimator. On the other hand, when you download a file and it says it's gonna take two hours for their file to download, that is a point estimator. So let's talk a little bit about some point estimators and some interval estimators. Now, suppose that you want to obtain a point estimate for an arbitrary parameter, let's say mean size. Remember that the point estimate is a function from the sample, but the sample is a random variable. Remember that a sample is a subset of the population that is chosen randomly. So if you take one sample and you take another sample, so your first sample and your first, second sample, they will be different. And because your first sample and your second sample are different, the value of the statistic that you calculate from the first sample and the value of the statistic that you calculate from the second sample, they are different. Okay, if you take 10 students from one class and calculate the, the mean height of those students, and if you take 10 students from another class and you calculate the mean height of those students, the mean height of the two samples will be slightly different, okay? So, as a random variable, any statistic 
has a probability distribution, which is depending on the probability distribution of the population. Okay, we're gonna call this the sample distribution. Okay, so when we do statistical tests, we use uh, properties of these sample distributions, which we are going to study a little bit in the end of this lecture and more in the other lectures in this course. Okay. For now, uh, let's think about the most the, the most simple properties. So a point estimator is a statistic which provides the value of the maximum plausibility for an unknown population parameter theta. Okay. Let's think about a random variable x that is distributed according to a certain function. So this function x given theta is a function that describes what are the possible values of the random variable x that we obtain is a statistic from the population given the real value of the parameter. Remember that we don't know theta, okay? So, Consider now that we sample this variable x. We take, so we take 10 n observations, x1, x2, x3, xn. So we have a sample and the sample is a random variable. Now we're gonna define a function theta hat. This is a point estimator of the parameter theta. So a function theta hat is a function on the sample x that give us an estimate for theta. Now the value of this estimate will be theta hat. So what are the properties of this theta hat? Okay, so a point estimator, we can use them frequently in all areas of science. Some examples of point estimators. The mean is a point estimator. You take the value of several value, uh, uh, variables uh, several observations and you average them and that will give you an estimate for the true mean of the population. The standard, the population variant is, the population variance is another point estimator. The population proportion is another point estimator. The difference between the mean of two populations is also a point estimator, okay? In each of these cases, there are many ways to perform the estimation task. And which estimator do you use, as I said before, is based on the mathematical properties of each statistic and also the characteristics of the experiment that you want to do. Okay, <clears throat> notice one thing that is important. We are, I will, we are always using the word estimate. We don't know the parameter of the population, so we estimate it using any statistic. Why is that? Remember that the statistic is a random variable. If we are unlucky, okay, or if our um, experiment design is careless, or if we are malicious, it's possible to obtain an estimate that is very different from the true value of the population. Let's give an example, okay? For instance, we want to estimate the height of the students of a school. We pick 10 students, that's our sample, and we say that the, the average height is equal to the height of the youngest student in that sample. Now, this is a bad example. Of course, this is not a reasonable uh, statistic, but it is a statistic. Remember, a statistic is a function of the sample. So if I take 10 observations and I choose the observation of the youngest student, that's a statistic. But this statistic in general will give us um, a height, uh, an estimate for the height that is smaller than the true height of the mean because I always take the youngest student. So this is a biased estimator, okay? It's biased towards low values. So we have the concept of error and bias. The error, is the difference between an estimate and the true value of the population parameter. Okay, so if I take, if the, re, the, if the true average of my, of the height of the students in the university is one, is 176 centimeters, 
And I calculate my statistic. And my statistic says that the average height is 175, then I have an error of one centimeter in my estimate. The bias on the other hand, so the error refers to one estimate, one sample. I, cal I took the sample, I calculate my statistic, and I have an error. I don't know the value of the error, but that can be estimated as well. We're gonna talk about this. The bias is a systematic error. A systematic, uh, so when I calculate this statistic, systematically, I have estimates that are below the, below the true value of the parameter, or systematically, I have uh, estimates that are above the, the true value of the statistic. So one of the roles of experiment design is to make sure that the statistics that we choose to represent our experiment are not biased. So what is an unbiased estimator? A good estimator should consistently generate estimates that are close to the real value of the parameter theta. There will always be some error because it's a random variable word, but this error, if this error is consistent, either below or above, so it's, it's not like always below or not always above, but it's consistent, it's well distributed, it's, uh, be, it behaves well around the true value of the, of the parameter, we say that the, the estimator is unbiased. Putting it in a mathematical language, we can say that we have an estimator, theta hat, and it's unbiased for the parameter theta if the expected value of this estimator is theta. So the estimator can have an error, but the expected value is theta. Or in other words, the expected value of the estimator minus theta is equal to zero. Now this difference, the, estimate, the expected value of the estimator minus theta is referred as the bias of the estimator. To give an example, let's think about the mean. The mean, uh, the average, is the usual estimator for the uh, mean parameter of a population. So if we have <clears throat> uh, x1, x2, xn to be a random sample from the population x, and this population x is characterized by a parameter mean of mu and a variance of sigma squared in a normal distribution. So we can show that the expected value of the average of the sample is equal okay, to the expected value of, so what's the average? We are summing all the values of xi and dividing it by the total size of the sample. And it's possible to show that the expected value of this is equivalent to mu. It's equal to mu, okay? So the expected value of taking the average of a sample is the average of the population. That's kind of the definition of average, but it's interesting to know that the average is an unbiased estimator, okay? Remember that the expected value of the, why this happened? Remember that our population is characterized by this, okay? We are assuming that the population has a mean mu and it has a variance sigma squared. So the expected value of any one xi will be <clears throat> mu. So we can replace this, um, let's go over here. We know that the expected value of x, y is mu. That's the definition of the, the mean parameter. So if we do the calculation here, we're gonna see, we're gonna take out this sum and we're gonna take out this division and we're gonna see that the expected value of the estimator is also mu. So that tells us that the, uh, the average is a unbiased estimator for the mean parameter. Okay. So, oops. So, uh, of course, for one parameter, it's usually possible to define more than one unbiased estimator. 
okay? Uh, we could take, for example, uh, in the, instead of taking us, uh, we can take the, the minimum mi minus the maximum value of the sample, we take the average, and that also would probably be an unbiased estimator. However, these, the variances of these estimators may be different. In general, if we have two unbiased estimators, mu1, uh, sorry, theta1 and theta, uh, theta hat1 and theta hat2, we want the estimator that has the minimal variance. Okay, this is because if we have two estimators that are unbiased and one of them has a smaller variance than another one, then the estimator with the smallest variance will probably will uh, will likely give us um, est uh, estimations of the parameters that are closer to the true value of the parameter. So what this says is that since the estimator uh, have, have variance, we can try to calculate the variance of an estimator. So because the estimator is a random, the point estimator is a random variable, we have an associated distribution and an error. So for example, the standard error of the estimator theta hat is the variance of the, uh, the expected var the variance of theta hat square root, and that would be sigma theta hat. Know, however, that we can't know this error directly, okay? Because we don't really know what are the true values of the population. So we estimate the standard error of the estimator from the data in the sample. So in this case, we call it the estimated standard error, sigma hat theta hat, okay? There are some other notations. So we have to estimate the error of the estimator in order to know if it's a good or a bad estimator, even if it's unbiased. So we have two unbiased estimators. We calculate the, um, <clears throat> we calculate the, the estimated error for both and we take the estimator that has the lower, um, the lower uh, standard error. In the case of the mean, for instance, we're gonna see in the next slides, this error is proportional to the size of the sample. So let's give an example. Assume a random variable x from a Gaussian distribution and a sample error s. We can calculate the standard error of s several common point indicators. So the estimate of the error for the mean is s divided by square root of n. So we can see that the larger, the larger our sample, the smallest is the estimated error for the estimator. For the error of the variance, we have a similar formula. And for the error of the standard deviation, we have also a similar formula. In all these cases, we see that as the sample size increases, the estimated error of the estimator becomes smaller. So this is one way to justify why we need to have larger sample sizes. Because the more sample, the more observations that we have in our sample, the more likely that a statistic calculated from that sample will be close to the true value of the population. Of course, in the extreme case, if it's possible to get all the individuals from the population, then we can just calculate the value of the statistic. But in the realistic case, we want the largest sample that we can use in our experiment. Remember that it also counts cost, and we're gonna talk about this in the future. Okay, let's give a concrete example of all, how this works. Imagine that we have a operation to produce cab cables, okay? So in this factory, we, we, we have a cable factory and in the cable factory, the mean uh, resistance of the population, the, the mean re resistance of the cables that are produced is 50 with a standard deviation of two, okay? So these values, 50 and two, they are the population mean and the population deviation. We produce the factory with these values in mind, okay? Now, we are going to take a sample uh, of, oh, sorry. Also, another thing about our production is let's assume that, of course, there is an error when we produce this cable, but let's assume that this error is uh, this error is normally distributed. So in general, when we produce a cable, 
the resistance of the cable will have a value that follows a normal distribution with mean 50 and variance 4, okay? So squared of the population distribution. Now, let's take a sample. Let's say that we're going to inspect, we're going to inspect this factory and do an experiment to know if this factory is really following the specifications. So how do we do experiment, this experiment? We take a sample of 25 cables. So we produce 25 cables of this factory, okay? And then <clears throat> uh, we measure the resistance of these cables. Now the sample mean, so the estimate for the variance of this population will be given by the average of X, so it's 25 cables. So it's the sum of the resistance of these 25 cables divided by 25. Now this value will not be exactly 50, okay? But it will follow a normal distribution. The expected value of the sample is 50, okay? Because the sample is an unbiased estimator. So we expect that if we take several samples of size 55, the expected value of these averages will be 50. And the error of this sample will be the square root will be the square root of the standard error of the factory, sorry, the square root of the variance of the factory divided by the size of the sample. So it's 0 0.4 omega. Note that the 0 0.4 is not the standard error of one observation. The standard error of one observation is two, like we saw last slide. The 0 0.4 is the standard error of the estimate. So when we take an average of 25 cables, we expect a value for this average of 50 with a, st with a standard error of 0 0.4. So much closer, you see, the value of the sample mean is much closer to the true value of the parameter than the value of a single observation. And if this uh, sample was increased, then we would have values for the estimated mean that are closer and closer to the true value of the population. Okay? This is what we call uh, the central limit theory theorem. Okay, so in the previous example, the, oh, sorry, this leads us, sorry, this leads us to the central limit theorem. So in the previous example, we assumed that the production followed a normal distribution. However, many things, many things in nature do not follow the normal distribution. For instance, lines follow <clears throat> a different uh, normal distribution, and we have uh, many effects that follow a polar law. However, even for a population with an arbitrary distribution, we can make this arbitrary distribution behave as normal by observing the sampling distribution. So even for many, not all, but many arbitrary distributions, these sampling distributions will tend to be normal. To, uh, gener in general, let's say that we have a sample, x1 to xn observations, and these observations are independent and identically distributed. So what does it mean? It means, independent means that the value of x1 does not depend on xn or vice versa. And identically distributed, it means that x1 to xn, they all come from the same distribution, like the cables that we saw in the last example. In that case, if we take uh, if we and assume that they have a mean and a variance, even though they are not normally distribution, distributed. If we calculate the z value as the sum of the observations minus the mean times the number of the observations, and we divide it by the number of the observations times the the, um, <clears throat> the variance. We're going to have this value z, and this value z can be shown to be normally distributed asymptotically. Okay, so the z of n, when n is big enough, will follow roughly a normal distribution. We can use this property to do uh, to apply statistics that require normal distributions 
even in even in effects, even in populations that not necessarily follow this normal distribution. Okay, so this result is what is called the central limit theorem. It's one of the most useful properties for statistical inference, like I said, because it allows us to use some techniques based on normal distribution, even when the population under study is not normal. Okay. For well-behaved distributions, we just need small sample sizes, but large, uh, even not so well-behaved distributions still follow the central limited limit theorem at large enough sample sizes. There is some uh, related link for you to see uh, some more information about this. Uh, we have, we're gonna have a um, an example of the central limit theorem in the coding video that I will uh, post next. So. You can also click on this link to download the R code and test it yourself. Okay, now let's talk about, quickly let's talk about statistical intervals. So until now we talked about point statistics, uh, point uh, estimators. In statistical est intervals on the other hand, they're used to qualify the uncertainty related to a given estimate. Let's think about the, the, the cable production before. We have a, a cable manufacturing operation that has a target resistance of 50 and a standard deviation of two. Let's assume that the resistant values follow a normal distribution, okay? Now, let's say that we have a sample, again, a sample of 25 observations, and the mean of the sample was 48. Now, given the, variab now, given the variability associated with this sample, it's likely that this mean is not exactly the same as the mean parameter of the population. But we want to know, is it possible to know how far this value is? Okay, so the statistical interval, they are functions on samples that define regions that are likely to contain the true value of an estimated parameter, okay? So it's possible to quantify the level of uncertainty associated with an estimation and put this in relation to the value of the estimator. So this gives us stronger conclusions about what can we know about the population. There are three very common types of interval, confidence intervals, tolerance intervals, and prediction intervals. Today we're gonna to talk only about confidence intervals but I will give you a related link for you to study about tolerance intervals and prediction intervals as well. So a confidence interval, what is a confidence interval? A confidence interval quantifies the degree of uncertainty associated with the estimation of population parameters. Usually you see this in experiment as, okay, the value of mean, of the mean is uh, 48 plus minus four. What is this plus minus four? This is the confidence interval, okay? So usually it's like stated something like the interval that contains the true value of a given population parameter with a confidence level of one minus alpha. Alpha is a parameter for the confidence interval. Usually say 95% confidence interval, 90% confidence interval, okay? But how do we think of it? This 95% is not that this interval is the interval that with a 95% chance, the true value is here. It's this 95% refers to the function, to the estimate, not to the value. So the idea of a 95% interval is that this is a function that has a 95% chance of capturing the true value of the population. This image gives you a better idea. Let's go in the cable example. We have the true value of the populations is 50. So we calculate a 95% confidence interval uh, 100 times. And for each time, we plot the confidence interval as a green bar. So you can see here that uh, this confidence interval, it often includes the, uh, it often includes the 50 times, the, 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 the value 50. Sometimes right in the middle, sometimes in the corner, sometimes the bar is bigger, sometimes it's smaller. But a few times, okay, the confidence interval is completely wrong. 
So a 95% confidence, confidence interval is a function that has a 95% chance of actually including that value here. Okay? We're going to see an example based on the next video. So how do we calculate the confidence interval? Well, the idea here of the confidence interval is that we are using that Z statistic that we described a few slides ago, okay? So the Z statistic describes the distribution of the sample as a normal distribution in the centered on the mean one and vari uh, mean zero and vari uh, and various one. Okay, so this one minus alpha is the confidence level and Zx is the x quantile of the uh, standard normal distribution. So we use the sample of the mean, okay? And the known, if we know the, very, the, the standard error of the population and the, sample of, and, the, and the sample size. So the bigger the sample size, this confidence interval will be smaller and smaller. So again, we see the benefits of having a bigger sample size to get a more precise estimate of the maximum and minimum values of the, um, the confidence interval. Of course, in many cases, we don't know what is, uh, the, what is the, uh, the standard deviation of the population. In that case, we use a T distribution with n minus one degrees of freedom. And this T distribution will be used as the limits to calculate the limits for our, um, for our confidence interval. So the two-sided confidence interval on the variance, so that was the standard confidence interval for the mean, we can also calculate a confidence interval for the variance of a normal variable. So here we have the error of the sample and we have the variance that we want to estimate. And this variance can be estimated using the key square distribution. Okay. Okay, so the idea of statistical intervals is that they quantify the uh, associated uncertainty with the different aspects of estimation. And in general, if you can report statistical intervals for variable, it's better than informing, uh, reporting just point estimates because this gives more information. Not only what is the value that you are estimating for a certain parameter, but also what is the uncertainty associated with that value, okay? So in this lecture, we talked about how we use experimental data from samples to learn the characteristics of a system that we want to understand better. In particular, we talked about the use of statistics that are functions that calculate estimates of population parameters from sample data. We talked about point estimators and interval estimators, and these are important descriptive statistics that describe the parameters of a population. Uh, there will be another video that we're gonna show some examples in code. So even if you did not get all of the, um, uh, um, this uh, definitions here, follow also the video to get some concrete examples of how we use this point estimates and these interval estimates. Now, next week, you have to submit a report on the report number one, right? Which was make a simple experiment, uh, uh, the, uh, make a simple experiment to answer some scientific question and analyze it. So you have to do the experiment design that we talked about last class, and you also have to do the data analysis that includes the statistics that we described in this lecture, such as the means, errors, and confidence interval, okay? Also think about from this lecture, how the sample size influence the variance of your estimator. So how does that affect your experimental design? Of course, a larger sample size means a more precise estimator. On the other hand, a large sample size means more time running experience on your computer, or if your experiment costs you time or costs you some money or costs you some effort, there's a limit on how big an experimental design you can make. 
So I look forward to see how you think about this and how you write about these questions in your report. Um, there are lots of recommended reads, reads for this lecture. So the first two will give you more detail about sampling distribution. So I'm, uh, I would encourage you to read these first two. They are not very long reads. They'll give you more information about sampling distribution and statistic intervals. The second link, Crash Course Statistics, uh, it's, a very good, um, it's a very good video series about these topics, different statistics, how you use them, how you calculate them. In particular, for this lecture, the videos three to seven in Crash Course Statistics cover roughly the same topics that we talked about today. So I highly encourage you to watch. Each of these videos is only about 10 to 15 minutes. Finally, uh, for R, there are two links. The first link is R for Beginner that explains how you work with R and R Studio that shows, uh, that is the tool that you can use to easily use R for your uh, data analysis. Thank you very much for listening to this talk and see you in the next video. Bye-bye. Hello, everyone. And my name is Klaus from the University of Tsukuba. This is Experiment Design for Computer Science, Lecture 2. And this is my first uh, code lecture. So in this lecture, I talk to you a lot about uh, point estimators and interval estimators. And here in this video, I will go briefly over the um, markdown example, the markdown, the, the R example that is attached to this lecture. So as you can see here, this, what I have open in front of you right now is called R Studio. So R Studio is a environment for you to program in R. R is a script language that is focused on statistical analysis and visualization of data. It's very useful for the activities that we are going to develop in this course. And <clears throat> it's also not a very hard language. If you are familiar with Python, uh, if you are familiar with MATLAB, uh, you're going to see a lot of things that are also familiar with R. It's definitely useful uh, to learn R. So what we have here, so in our studio, here what is in the interface, you see these four quadrants. And I will briefly explain the interface so you know what I'm doing. And then I will explain the code. I will explain a little bit about how R works when it comes up, but this will not be very focused on working with R. So this is our studio. And when you open our studio, you have these four quadrants. In the top left quadrant, you have the editor. So here I have several files that I have opened. Uh, we are going to focus on this rmd file that is the example file, but you also have available to you uh, old code. Uh, this is just some code from previous classes and maybe you can look at some of it and get it as information to learn other ways to work with Python, with R. Um, studentdata.csv is a data file that we are going to use in today's uh, exercise. Uh, Compilo04.r is a data from Felipe's Campello course that we are using as a basis for this course. So this is also useful to see some other ways, especially to plot using ggplot. We are not going to use ggplot today, but it's very useful. It's much powerful than our native plotting abilities. So if you have some time, it's, it's really worth it your time to learn how to use ggplot. Uh, on, the top on the top right corner quadrant, we have the environment history and connections. So history lists all the comments that you have used in this uh, session. So if you want to redo an old comment, you can see it here. Environment lists all the variables that are currently open. So every time you open a variable and uh, it's stored in the environment. Here you can modify the values of these values, this, uh, of these variables, you can delete them, etc. <clears throat> On the bottom right, uh, on the bottom left quadrant, you have console where you can type individual commands that you want to try. So you can do, for instance, oops, okay. One plus one, just like in Python, you can uh, type the comments directly here. And on the 
bottom right quadrant, you have what I call like the, the system uh, um, quadrant. So you have files that lists the files in your file system. So here we are at the lecture notes. Inside of lecture notes, we are in topic number two. Inside of topic number two, we are in code. This is the same uh, file tree that you have in the uh, GitHub <coughs> repository. Okay. You have plots. Every time you do a plot, the plot will be stored here. Several plots will be stored here, so you can see old plots that you have generated. Uh, you have what packages are loaded. You can load new packages as necessary. Uh, when you type help, so for instance, if I go do help mean, the help for the mean function will show here. And here in viewer, you can view several files that are not supported directly. So the main R script file is the R files, but today we are going to be using the RMD, R markdown. R markdown is a notebook style of file. It's kind of similar to a Jupyter notebook in which you mix content and code. So you can write the content here, as you can see, and in the middle of the content, you can also write the code and see the results. So you can program, write a little bit, program, write a little bit. And when you open an RMD file, uh, our studio will give several options of how to produce a notebook. So we can get this RMD file and by choosing knit, uh, now I knit to a uh, HTML file. So, oh, it's downstairs. Uh, where is my, where is my, oh, here. Okay, so when I knit, you can see that it generated this HTML file, which has the code, the text, and the results. So this is very useful for generating uh, reports, where you keep the code necessary to generate the report and the content in the same file. Uh, you can, as you, if you notice, we have options not only for HTML, we can meet to Word, if you want to use Word, and more usefully, we can need to PDF. So here now I'm generating a PDF. And you see that I generated a PDF with the exact same contents. So you can right away uh, generate a, a PDF with colors and everything, a very beautiful PDF with your report. Okay, so it can be very useful to generate uh, class reports using R Markdown. Now let's look at the code for uh, this lecture, okay? So first we have an introduction to R Markdown here. Uh, let me switch knit back to uh, HTML when I use it from time to time, okay? So we can see here the text. As you can see, the text is in Markdown format. So you can have, you can have uh, titles here. You can have links. Uh, you can also have like um, italics and uh, heavy. And here we have a code chunk. Here's just an example. In the code chunk, R Markdown supports other languages. I could put some other programming language here that is supported by the kernel. Here I'm saying that this is R code. I could put, for instance, LaTeX, LaTeX code if I want to describe an equation. Um, and this here is just the name. The name is used for references if you want to refer to certain specific chunk codes. It's like the label in LaTeX. So here is just a code to plot. And instead of compiling the entire R Markdown notebook, I can press Control Shift Enter and just rerun this code. And then I have the code here. Okay. Now I can do so here I'm plotting the cars. I'm having a scatter plot of the cars uh, data set. You can also add, uh, here are some help comments. You can add a new chunk, Control i You can preview the notebook with Control shift k <clears throat> And let's now go straight to the code for our lecture. So in this lecture, we talked about how we can use point indicators to represent data. So let's go back to the example that we used, a hypo hypothetical factory that produces coaxial cables. So we said that the, the resistance of the cables produced follow a Gaussian distribution with mean 50 and standard deviation two. So that's our population. It's a factory that produces cables with mean 50 and standard deviation two. But we don't know that. So we want to take a sample of 25 cables. 
So what we're doing here is that, well, it's good when you use code to generate statistics and uh, models, always set the seed to a fixed value so you can reproduce the results and see how different analysis get different uh, obtain different results from the same uh, data. So here we are generating random data from a normal distribution with 25 samples, we're taking 25 samples. The mean of the distribution is uh, 50 and the standard deviation is two. So let's execute this. And oops, why did you generate this menu? What happened here? Oh, okay. I pressed the wrong button. All right, so here I press Control Shift Enter and I generate here my 25 samples. As, as, you, as you can see, each of these numbers is one of the cables. So the first cable has resistance 52.7, the second cable has resistance 48.87 the third cable has resistance 50.7. So this is what you would expect to see in the real world, right? Uh, not uh, The nature is not perfect. So not every cable will have exactly the same resistance. There will be small variations depending on the precision of the process, okay? Now, if we get the sample when we look at it, can we tell whether uh, from the sample, can we estimate the mean of the production. So as we saw in the class, the sample mean is an unbiased estimation. So let's calculate the sample mean for this sample that we just, uh, we just collected. So when we calculate the sample mean, we see here that the result uh, is 50.37. So this result, let me increase here since we're focusing on this window. Okay, a little bit bigger, fantastic. Okay, so this 50.3 is the mean of the production that we estimate based on the sample that we collect. And that's how we're gonna do in your experiments. Uh, for instance, let's say that you want to estimate what is the mean size of a dinosaur. We, you will collect several fossils, you measure the heights, that will be your sample. And from the sizes, you take the mean and you can estimate the mean size for the population of dinosaurs. Uh, one thing that is pretty cool in our studio is that you can write code in line. So if you wanted that mean inside the text, you could put our mean here. So let's just go back to the text. And as you can see here, so here I'm calculating the sample as you saw before. Here I calculate the mean. And here you can see that we have the same value in line. Okay, so if you want to write a report and have the values in line, you can do it here, like this. Okay, now, <clears throat> because this sample, the, the, the estimated mean is not exactly equal to the population mean, to the parameter mean of the population, we want to know what is the estimated error of, what is the error of this estimate? How, how, uh, how, what's, how, low, how far away can we exp as, uh, expect this estimate to be from the true parameter? Uh, so we use the formula for the uh, mean, sample mean error that we saw in the class. So the sample mean error for that uh, sample is the standard deviation of the sample. So it's basically the mean of the sample minus the value of this. And we take the, the, the mean of that and take the square root of that. And then the standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of samples. You remember the number of observations in the samples. You remember that in the lecture, I told that the error of the estimator is inversely proportional to the number of observations in the sample. And we can see here in this formula, the more samples that we have, the smaller will be our standard error or sample error. So we calculate here and for this sample, the error is 0 0.52. So we can expect that the true value will be away from the mean value by about this much, okay? Now let's see what I said regarding the sample size uh, influencing the error. So here we're going to take three samples. One sample from the factory of size 10, so 10 observations, we take 10 cables. One sample, one sample with size 25 and one sample with size 50. 
And then for each of these samples, we're going to calculate the mean and the uh, standard uh, the, the the standard the error of the mean <coughs> of the mean estimator. So let's calculate this. Well, the values are the same because we are using a fixed random seed, so we're going to always get the same values, right? So here, for the sample with 10 elements, with 10 cables, our calculated mean was 49.8, which is quite close to the value. And the calculated error was 0 0.53, okay? For uh, the sample with, 20, with 25 observations, this time, because this is a different sample, we're going to have a different estimate. Remember, every time you get a new sample, you're going to get a different estimate. That's why it's important to know what's the error of that estimate, because it will be different for each sample. So for the second sample of size 25, our estimated mean is 49.54. And the error, the estimated error for this mean is 0 0.43. Okay? And when we get a sample of size 50, so we get 50 cables, all our estimated sample, our estimated mean is 50.2, and <clears throat> the estimated error is 0 0.24. Okay, notice a few interesting things. The first thing is that for all these samples, the estimated mean is relatively close to the mean, to the true mean. They are all relatively close to 50, which is a good thing. It means that our estimator is not a bad estimator. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, we can see that although uh, this, when we increase the size of the sample, uh, we would have a more precise estimation. This is not always, this not always happens. It's true, but it does not always happens. So for instance, here in this example, the sample with 10 observations is much closer to the true value than the estimated based on the sample with 50, uh, 50 um fifth observations. In this case, this is just luck. Okay, so sometimes we do have bad luck in experiment. That's why we need statistical methods to tell us how luck, how lucky we are expect we can expect ourselves to be. <clears throat> you can see that although the although the first estimate of the mean is closer, we don't really know the true val value of the parameter. So we don't know if this is closer. And we can look at the error and we can see that the error ranges we are uh, become smaller when we increase the number of observations. Okay. All right. Now, this is based on uh, theoretical data. How would we do if we have real data, you go out to do your experiment, you put your data in a CSV file, and then you uh, want to use in R. So let's see a second example. The second example uh, I took from Campelo's course, it's a survey that he did with the students asking uh, the student height and the student weight for two different courses. So when you use data, the easiest way to use the data is to use format in CSV format. As you can see here, CSV stands for comma separated values. So simply on the first line, you put the name of each data that you're collecting the ID, the course, the gender, the height, and the weight. And on each line after that, you put the data separated by comma. So student number one is from course PPGE. It's a female student. Uh, it's, her height is 1.57 and her, her weight is 45.5 kilos and so on and so forth. So if you have the data shaped like this, you can go to R, and you can load it into a variable called uh, using the method read.scsv. So this automatically reads for you a comma separated value and stores it in an R data frame. Okay, the R data frames is one, is, are one, is one of the main uh, R data structures. I will not cover in this video how to use R data frames, but it's worth your time to study it. And here we can see, we can calculate the mean of, um, okay, there was an error here. So here we calculate the mean. So the mean height of the students in the, in the data set is 1.74 uh, meters, and the mean weight is 72 kilos. 
And here we can see the entire data set. So we can see that the, all the data table was loaded and our studio makes it very easy for us to browse, browse the data. Okay, so let's hide this. So let's say that we are interested in calculating the body mass index of the students. So the formula for the body mass index is weight divided by height squared. So we calculated the BMS index, and here you can see something interesting in R. By default, in R, if you have two, um, if you have array data, the um, <clears throat> operations are automatically, um, how do you say, applied to the entire array. Okay. So here we generate a vector called BMI, and then we calculate the BMI of the students, and we add the BMI to the data frame. So let's see here, oops, the BMI. So now we have the same table as before and we have a new column calculating the BMI for each student. Okay, very well. So uh, the mean, we can calculate the mean BMI of the students. So let's look at it in with mean BMI with the estimated error with the function that we created for calculating the estimated error. So here, <clears throat> so for these students, the mean BMI is 23, and the estimated error for this is 0 0.59. So we can expect we can expect that this value of the, this mean BMI is uh, it has an error of this much. So, okay, uh, in the lecture we talked about how uh, instead of using point indicators we want as often as possible to use interval indicators. So how far away from 23 we can reasonably expect the true mean of the BMI to be, okay? So for that, we are going to calculate the, um, <clears throat> the um, confidence interval, okay? So the confidence interval is a calculation that requires a confidence value. Uh, normally, we use 95, uh, so alpha equals to 0, 0. 0. 0. 0.05. This value uh, can be different depending on your application. For example, if you expect a lot of error in your, uh, in your data, for instance, if you are taking interviews with people and each person is very different, uh, you may be interested in a lower confidence interval so that you can get a more... Um, a larger, uh, a bigger, <clears throat> sorry, a smaller range of feasible values. However, if your experiment is very precise, let's say a simulation that you can repeat many, many, many times, you can use a larger confidence value. And then you're gonna still have a reasonably small uh, re uh, interval. In this case, we're gonna use the default of 95%. So here we have the values. So we are creating a new variable just to avoid repeating students at BMI, students at BMI all the time. And we're going to use our confidence uh, value of 0 0.05 to get a 95% confidence interval. Okay. So the formula, as we saw in the lecture, is that we have the means of the values. We use, because we don't know what is the true variance of the population, we're gonna estimate the true, we're gonna use the t-distribution. So we use the quantile of the tree distribution with the confidence interval and the number of values um, minus one. Here's a bug. Number of values minus one as our uh, degrees of freedom, okay? So we calculate here, and here are our uh, BMI. So we can see that here is the BMI of all the students from this plot, and we calculated here the, esti the estimated mean. So this is the estimated mean for the population, around 23, as you can see. And here we have the 95 confidence interval. So the 95% confidence interval is from this dot dash line to this dash line. It's very narrow, so we can have, we can have, we, we can trust, uh, if we can trust on this confidence interval, uh, the value of the mean, the true mean should be very close to these values. Okay, 
Now, uh, let's do a little bit more complicated. Let's break down and see if the BMI is different between male students and female students. <clears throat> so let's calculate this here. Add the minus one that I forgot on the calculation of the confidence interval. So we break down the students. Uh, in R, you can use this switch to break down your uh, data according to some, uh, um, to some category, okay? And then we can calculate the plot again using the same formula that we used before. Uh, feel free to take a look at the code to see how this plot is made. So now we have in red, we have the male students. In blue, we have the female students. And we can see that the confidence interval barely uh, covers each other. So there's a, there's, a, there's a chance that the BMIs uh, might be similar, and, uh, but and there is a chance that it's not. Remember that this confidence interval is, it's not like inside this confidence interval, we cannot say that it's more likely that the value will be closer to the center than not. That's not how we interpret confidence intervals. So you can just say, okay, uh, there's a chance that uh, the means of males and females are different, there is a chance that they are not. If the confidence intervals were completely separate, then you could say with more, co with more confidence haha, that the means are different. Here you cannot. Okay, so just to give a different way to observe this, uh, it's also useful to use the histogram. The histogram can tell you the distribution of the values. So you can calculate the histogram in R just by using the hist function. And box plots also gives you a notion of the spread of the values, uh, except that the box plots are focused on medians and percentiles. So here <clears throat> we have the box plots of the BMI of the students depending on the course. And from this image, we can see that for both courses, the, BM, the spread of the BMI is uh, roughly the same, okay? Finally, the central limit theorem. So in the course, we said that the central limit theorem allows you to use the means of samples as a proxy for the values. So what we're saying is that even for distributions that are not normal, the means of the samples, they tend to follow a normal distribution. So let's see this. Here we have, we take 100 samples and each sample has a sample size of 50. So if we look at this uh, plot, First, let's use the beta distribution. In the beta distribution, this is the, how the beta distribution looks like. But if we take 100 means, 100 samples of 15 observations, and we take the mean of each of these samples, you can see that the mean of the samples follows a roughly normal distribution. And that's interesting for a many um, evaluation, many uh, statistical analysis that we are going to do in the future. Just to show a different, uh, a different distribution. So let's look at the key square distribution. So if I rerun the code with the key square distribution, 100 samples, each sample has 50 uh, elements. You can see here that also the, the key distribution is not normal but the means of the, the, the distribution of sample means, it's roughly follows normal. So that's also like we said in the class. Okay, uh, this is all for this video. And I hope that you take a look at the code so you can learn how to plot different kinds of plots in R. You can see how you can use R to produce your reports. And you can see how you cal can calculate the estimators, the mean estimator, the standard deviation estimator, the confidence interval using R. So I hope this was useful for you. And the link for the code is in the GitHub and also in the, uh, in the Manaba. So be sure to take a look. See you later. Bye bye. Hello everyone. Uh, this is Klaus from the University of Tsukuba. And today we are beginning our third lecture on the experiment designs for computer science course. The topic for today is statistical inference, and the lecture today will be actually one of the most important lectures of this course. So I would like everyone to really pay attention and 
If you think you did not understand some part of this lecture, feel free to ask questions on the comments or on the Manaba or just see the lecture again and talk. Uh, if you have difficulties with this lecture, the following lectures will build on this one. So make sure you get, uh, you get a good idea of what we're talking about here before you continue on the course. So let's go. So uh, in the last lecture, we talked about descriptive statistics. So we talked about using the mean as the mean of the sample as an estimate for the mean of the population, the variance of the sample as an estimate for the variance of the population, etc. And we also talked about the uh, confidence interval, which is an interval estimator. And the point and the interval estimator they are very useful to define the value of parameters in the population. However, in some cases, this is not enough. Some in some cases, we need decision-making tools to, make, uh, to deal with information that we get from random samples. In these cases, one of the tools that we can use is called statistical inference. And statistical inference is a technique that can help us make a decision based on a random sample. So let's give an example of what we're talking about when we say we're making a decision. Imagine that you are on the owner of a factory that produces chocolate. So the factory should produce uh, packages of chocolate with 300 grams of chocolate powder. Okay, now you want to know if the operation of your factory is okay or if there is any problem. So what do you do? You take a sample of 30 packages. You produce 30 packages of your chocolate and you measure, so that's your sample. Uh, and then using the, the lecture, the tools from lecture two, you calculate the mean, the mean weight of the sample. Uh, and with a 95% confidence interval, uh, the, the confidence interval for the mean of the, 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 mean, the mean estimator is from 283 to 377 grams. Okay, now here's the question. Is everything normal? Like when you look at this confidence interval, 283 to 307, okay? We know from the last class that this interval has a 95% chance to include the real value of the population mean. So does this mean that your factory is actually producing 300 grams on average? Remember that this is a very important point. 300 grams is one of the values of this confidence interval. However, the confidence interval itself does not tell us which value is more likely. The only thing that the confidence interval says is that the calculation of the confidence interval say that the, the, the mean should be somewhere between 283 grams to 307. So what do you do? Do you send an auditor to see if there is anything wrong and to fix, or do you keep producing chocolate as everything is normal? So in this case, uh, the confidence interval will not help you make a decision. You will need a different sort of tool. And that's, these are the infer statistical inference tools that we're going to talk about in this lecture. Now, uh, before we begin that, let's go to what we did in the first and second lecture and talk a little bit about science in general. Today, I would like to introduce uh, Florence Nightingale, also known uh, for nicknamed the Lady with the Lamp for her actions uh, with the British uh, Army. So, <clears throat> Florence Nightingale, well, one thing about her is that her birthday is now said the International Day of Nursing and of the nursing profession, and it was 12 of May, just two days ago. So it's kind of like an on topic, uh, on topic team. Okay, and but she did great contributions. Last week we're talking about how to represent data, how to collect data to learn more about uh, the world, and she is a great example of that. So Florence Nightingale, she is a British nurse and mathematician. Uh, one thing that is interesting is that when she was young, her parents were against uh, her will of becoming a nurse because at her time, 
nursing was not seen exactly as a profession. It was something that people helped with the real doctors, but the nurses themselves, they were not seen at, uh, as, um, as real professionals. And Florence Nightingale was one of the persons that had a very great influence uh, uh, to uh, transform nursing into a profession. Uh, she did that by developing several techniques for nursing, writing textbooks about how nursing be, should be done, and generally like formalizing the profession of a nurse. So she gave great contributions for the professionalization of nursing and for data visualization in general. And this is one of the cool things about her in the next slide. She was the mother of infographics. So if you look at a, a news and it gathers lots of data and showing in a very cool way that you can easily understand what's going on. Well, this is, was something that uh, you probably have a lot to thank uh, Florence Nightingale. So what she did is that she used to collect data when she was working during the war or when she was working in the hospital. She would collect data about how many people got sick and how many people died and describe it. So what we're seeing here in this slide is one of her uh, one of her infographics. So as you can read here, it's kind of hard in this font, but it's the di diagram of causes of mortality in the army in the East. So you have, I cannot really read this, but um, you have several different causes of death. And by putting then all the data in the same, uh, in the same graph, you could think, okay, because of this, maybe I should pay attention more to this part, or maybe I should pay attention to more, maybe we should put more effort on that sort of um, activities that reduce the cause of death. So uh, very interesting. Also, uh, she was um, very, uh, she, uh, she implemented the use of hand washing in the hospital for nurses. So in her time, uh, it was not obvious that nurses should be washing their hands before dealing with patients. And she, did, she used that to, um, to, re, to reduce the mortality ratios. So she did her, uh, her uh, contributions to how nurses should, should act based on the information she did by rigorous data collection. Her nickname of the lady with the lamp was that she used to go around the hospital at night to collect data, holding her lamp and talking to people around. Uh, she was said, from what I heard, her, read, read about her, she was said to be very strict, very strict about that. So she was a person that was very about, okay, very no nonsense. So that was <clears throat> that was very, uh, a, a very interesting figure. So yes, um, it's interesting to know where these um, customs that we have now about data collection and data presentation have came from. A second point I would like to raise today before we get to the class. Uh, I read a very interesting paper uh, this week. It's a preprint by Musgrave et al. Um, and the basic idea is that he and his colleagues, uh, they did an analysis of several machine learning methods uh, used on metric learning. So learning of metrics for other, for other problems. And it was very interesting because he observed uh, these on the left, this data that you see is the cumulative literature. So here we have several papers as time goes on. And there is like the, the implementation, the, the proposal of several different algorithms. And we can see here in the literature uh, review that the, uh, the, the methods become better and better over time. Uh, on different uh, on different test sets. However, what they did is that they re-implemented all of these methods, but before testing them again, they um, did a fine tuning of the parameters using the same techniques for fine tuning for all the parameters, all the fiber parameters of the methods. And what they found out is that when you fine tune the different the hyperparameters for the different metrics, the results were very similar among of them. They could not see such a large difference as we see in the left graph. And this is something I mentioned last, uh, I think I mentioned two weeks ago about um, the reprodu um, reproducibility crisis 
that was in psychology and medicine a few years ago. And this is a evidence that this could also happen in computer science. Um, because of unfair comparisons, you get, we get uh, false results. So the real result is that the different methods used for metric learning, they had about the same performance. But because we did not perform um, proper hyperparameter tuning of the methods that we were comparing against, what we saw was a slow improvement of the state of the art. So this is why uh, these fair comparisons are very important. Without these fair comparisons, you can reach, even without noticing, on false results about your research. What are fair comparisons in computer science? Of course, uh, the definition of fair comparison depends on exactly what you are studying. But here are some points to think about when you are performing a comparison between computer science method to decide if the comparison is fair or not. So for instance, like in the paper of Musgrave et al., uh, fine tuning of hyperparameters is very important. So you should, if you're fine tuning the, the parameters of your method, you should fine tune the parameters of all the other methods using the same method. Okay. Also, uh, what happens very often is you're really trying to find a new algorithm to solve a certain problem. So you start with an idea and you implement that idea. And you notice that some of the, some of the operators in your method, they're not working so well. So you remove them and then you try again. And then you modify your method and then you try again. And then you modify your method and then you try again. So these failed variations, what you're not noticing, especially if you're doing training data and testing data, and you are comparing these variations on the testing data, what you are actually doing, the variations of your method are also a kind of hyperparameter. So by trying different variations on the same testing data, your test data now has become the training data. So, you are, by, by modifying your algorithm and trying again on the same data over and over and over, you are overfeeding to that data. And when you compare against the literature, that comparison will be unfair. So you need to have a separate set of data that you have not used yet with any of your variations. And that will be the data that you have to actually test against. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So that's the next point. So fine tuning of the algorithm itself on the training data. Also only comparing on data favorable to one of the algorithms. So you figure out that, you, of course, when you're developing a new algorithm, you want it to deal with certain special cases. No algorithm is good at everything. So, but however, when you're presenting your paper, when you're presenting your results, you need to be very clear what kind of properties of the data your algorithm is exploiting. And in what cases this exploitation does not work. So that's the fair comparison, showing the good points, but also showing the negative points. So it can be a clear uh, view of the, the positives and negatives of the new proposed methods. One thing that's often not uh, really noted is also that software engineering evolves with time. And with new li modern libraries, modern libraries, they, are, they have better performance, they have fewer bugs, and they, have more general, they are more general than older libraries. So when you get a method that is very old, even if you go and execute the method again, the older libraries, they may have bugs or they may have um, inefficiencies that new algorithms uh, may exploit. So you program a new algorithm using the newest library and you compare with an old, older version of an old algorithm with an older library. And is the performance of your algorithm because of your proposal or is the performance of your algorithm because of your new library? So you need to check that out. Also, uh, this is something that mostly everyone takes care, but it's worth mentioning, different computational environments. So if you just take results from old papers without re-implementing the methods, maybe these old results are because of computational limitations. Like if you have a paper that was 20 years ago, that was published 20 years ago, well, 10, we, 20 years ago, we did not have GPUs for, uh, ex, for computational experiments as we have today. So the, the results of 20 years ago, they may be limited 
on computational power, and you need to make sure that this comparison is still relevant. So these are so just some of the recommendations, but really think, of, think carefully about your experiment design to see if you're not giving an unfair advantage to the algorithms that you are proposing. Remember of these results. Uh, unfair comparisons may result in false results, and you don't want your results to be false, right? All right, now that we talk a little bit about science in general, let's go into this lecture. So uh, the topics of this lecture, uh, we're gonna have these four topics. What is a statistical inference? Statistical hypothesis and errors. Z-testing on a single, in single sample and statistical testing assumptions. Um, I'm gonna take a quick break now, um, and then we're gonna start with statistical inference. See you on the next video. Hello everyone, and this is Klaus Aranha from Scuba University. Uh, this is Experiments Design, uh, lecture three, part two, um, <clears throat> statistical inference. So we're, go, uh, we're going to talk today first about what is statistical inference. So the idea of statistical inference is to use data analysis so that we can deduce properties of a statistical distribution. So the idea, like we said last, last uh, week, uh, you have an experiment, you want to, you have some scientific question and the scientific question is in the form of trying to learn some properties or parameters from some system in the world. For example, we were talking in the last video about the chocolate factory, and you want to know if the production of the chocolate factory is really the same number that it was supposed to be. There's no errors or no differences or no imprecisions in the model. And to do that, you do an experiment, which means taking a sample, a series of observations from the, from the process you are observing and estimating the population parameter from the sample parameter. <clears throat> now, one thing that is important to remember is that the sample from the distribution is a random variable. Every time you take a sample, so we can see here in this figure, every sample that you take will be different. All the samples, they come from the same population, so they are similar. Uh, but each sample may be slightly different from each other. It's like when you roll a dice, right? The dice has six, uh, this dice has six faces, unless you play Dungeons and Dragons. And every time you roll, you get a different number. But you know that this number comes from the same system, from the same dice. Okay? Now, this system is called the sampling distribution. So when I say sampling distribution, I say the same characteristics that are common to all of the samples. The sample distribution is characterized by the parameters, by some parameters. So when we deduce properties of the sample distribution, we can use these properties to characterize the population, okay? So the idea is that the experiment gives us data. This data, the sample data comes from a sample distribution. And by understanding the sample distribution, we can estimate, we can infer population parameters. So the idea is that we're going to, to do statistical inference. Today, we're going to learn of a tool that you probably have heard about, which is called statistical hypothesis. So hypothesis is a word that has different meanings in different contexts. contexts. In general, we can say that the hypothesis is an explanation for something that we observe. So for instance, uh, you're going out to a party, but the house is dark and the door is locked. So you, you make a hypothesis that maybe your friend did not arrive yet. Either maybe you are early. This is like a everyday use of the word hypothesis. When we're talking about a scientific hypothesis, this is a hypothesis that must be testable and falsifiable. And we talked about this uh, last week. We're going to talk a little bit later. And when we're talking of more specifically a statistical hypothesis, it's a scientific hypothesis that focus on statistical elements, on properties, on parameters of the population that we are studying. So going back to the cocoa factory example, we can say that 
our cocoa we have a hypothesis that the cocoa factor is working normally. So the mean of the production is no less than 300 grams. So that's our hypothesis. The cocoa factor is working without a problem and the mean of every time I take a sample is 300 grams. Now, is this hypothesis testable? Yes, it's testable. I can take a sample of a number of cocoa packages and I can measure that. Is it falsifiable? Yes, uh, if I take a sample and I estimate the mean and the mean is much below 300 grams, then my hypothesis will turn out to become false. Now here is the question, how do we decide from the data if the hypothesis is false or true? Okay, so in general, uh, the idea is that when we are analyzing a system using statistical inference, we propose many different hypotheses and we gather the data from the experiment and we compare this hypothesis against the data. So the idea is that we're going to decide which of the hypotheses that were proposed is most likely to be true. For example, let's say that we took 10 cans of cocoa from our factory and we measure. And we have the first one has 293 grams, the second one is 325, the third one is 271, then 313, 309, 298, 284, 304, 248, 296. Also, we take the mean of the sample, which as we said last week is a good estimator of the mean of the population, and the mean of the sample is 294. Now, this mean of the sample 294 is less than the parameter that the, the parameter that we are assuming that we are hypothesizing to be the mean of the, popula the population. We hypothesized that the mean of the population was 300 grams. We took an experiment and we found that the mean of this sample is 294. Does this mean that our fact or our hypothesis is false? Well, this is a question that is not so easy to answer. First, let's think about several hypotheses that we could make from this data, okay? The first hypothesis is very simple. The factory mean is correct, it's 300 grams. We were just unlucky in this sample. So as we can see here in the sample, we have some numbers that are much higher than 300, than 300 like this one and this one and this one are all higher than 300. And then we have some that are lower than 300. But on average, if we take the sample again, again, and again, sometimes the hypothesis, the, the mean will be a little bit higher than 300. Sometimes the mean will be a little bit lower than 300. That's the nature of random samples. So the first hypothesis is that this particular sample was just bad luck. Okay. However, our second hypothesis is that the factory mean is in fact lower than 300. The factory has a problem, okay? So this mean of 229, 200, uh, 294 indicates that our, the mean of our factory is not 300. So that's our second hypothesis. Now we can make more, for instance, we can make a third hypothesis that says that there is a saboteur in our factory. There is one employee that replaced two of the samples with very low value. We see these values that are very, very low. So our third hypothesis is that these values are not common and this sample was actually sabotaged. That's a hypothesis, okay? Anyway, the fourth hypothesis is that the balance that we use, the, 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 the measure that we use to calculate the weight is broken. So all of these weights, they might be wrong because our balance is wrong, is broken. That's a hypothesis, okay? Can we test it? Can, does this hypothesis reflect this data? That's the question that we need to answer. Also, we can make a hypothesis that the factory production depends on the hour of the day. So maybe in the morning, for some reason, like because the machines are still like not very heat, not very warm, not very warm, 
In the morning, the production is low, but in the afternoon, the production is high. Can we support this last hypothesis from the data? Well, one thing about this data is that we have no information about the time, so it's absolutely possible to talk about the last time hypothesis. The fourth and the, the third and the fourth hypothesis, they also need some data that is kind of external, some information that is external to this sample data that we have right now. So it will be kind of difficult to evaluate those hypotheses. So when we compare hypotheses, we want to keep several criteria in mind. The first high criteria of the hypothesis is predictive power. Predictive power means that the hypothesis allows you to predict the future behavior of the system. So if we look at the hypothesis number three, the ADO employee saboteur, the problem with hypothesis number three is that even if it's true, it doesn't say anything. It, it doesn't say anything about future packages. We don't know if future packages will be sabotaged or not. So we cannot use the third hypothesis to predict anything about the future. So it's not very useful. The, the, third, the, the, second, hypo, the second principle is principle of parsimony, also known as Ockham Hazers, Ockham Razor. This means that when two hypotheses are equal, the simplest one is usually better. So this means uh, hypothesis number five. The hypothesis number five depends on the hour of the day. This is including extra information. If we can get the same predictive power with a simpler hypothesis, in general, we want to favor the simpler hypothesis that does not include the extra information. Now, the third is what we're going to study in this, in this, in this course, is that fitting the data. The data supports the hypothesis and has a high probability of being produced under it. So the idea is that we're gonna have between so we have, look at the first two hypotheses. The first one is the sample mean is under 300 is bad luck. And the second hypothesis is the factory mean is under 300. So which of these two hypotheses is more likely to fit this data? Well, there's a calculation for that and that's what we're gonna see in this lecture, okay? Finally, external consistency. This hypothesis fit with existing well-accepted knowledge about the system. This usually means that you want to know what the system, like you don't want to make a hypothesis that does not match at all with reality. So maybe you can say that in your production, you can raise a, a hypothesis that your production of chocolate follow prime numbers. But there's no reason at all to believe why would a system produce uh, packages that follow prime numbers? What kind of system is that? So that's kind of like external consistent. You, you want your hypothesis to be kind of uh, fit what you, are, what you believe about the world in general, okay? okay so, so let's think of, let's talk about how comparing, we can compare how well the hypothesis fit the data, okay? So one way, the third way that we can compare multiple hypotheses is to calculate the probability of the sample that we observed under each hypothesis. So this is the conditional probability that we studied in high school, okay? So we think, what is the probability of seeing this sample when we have hypothesis one? What is the probability of seeing this sample when we have hypothesis two? What is the probability of seeing this sample when we have hypothesis three? We get the, pro the highest probability of all these probabilities de depending on hypothesis, indicates that that hypothesis is more likely than the others, okay? So let's think about two hypotheses. Hypothesis one, the mean of the production is equal or more than 300. So this implies on the following question. What is the probability that we see this sample, X293, 325, 271, 313, when the mean production of the factory is at least 300 grams. Now think about hypothesis two. The mean of the population is less than 300. And let's add this minus delta. We said before in a few slides ago that we are interested in, uh, in probabilities that in hypotheses that are in samples that are much less than 300. Uh, I'm gonna explain more about this uh, in the following slide, but just imagine that 
detecting the, dif the difference between 299.99 and 300 is almost impossible. So we're gonna use this sort of interval. We're gonna talk about this in the next slide. So what is the probability that we see the sample, the same sample when the mean production of the factor is much lower than 300 grams? So this is usually called the new hypothesis significance testing, okay? So the idea is that the, the new hypothesis testing involves the contrast between two hypotheses. One we're gonna call the new hypothesis or H0, and the other we're gonna call the alternate hypothesis or H1. So the idea is that the new hypothesis is the hypothesis that nothing strange is going on. Everything is fine. Everything is as expected. The factor is producing as much as we expected it to produce. The two algorithms are equal. The new algorithm is not better than the existing ones. The new medicine has no special effects. Nothing is going on. Everything is as we already knew. Okay? So that's the new hypothesis, the absence of effect, the conservative model. So in this case, the new hypothesis is the mean production of the chocolate factory is at least 300 grams. Now, the alternate hypothesis is that there is something different going on, something new is happening. So for some reason, and notice that because this is a statistical hypothesis, we do not say what reason it is. We first, we just want to say if statistically, this parameter, this hypothesis is only about the parameter mean of the population. The, the, new, hypo, the new hypothesis testing does not say anything about the reason. So for some reason, the mean production is below 300 grams. So the alternate hypothesis is that mean is under 300. So how do we choose the new hypothesis? Well, the idea is that to choose the new hypothesis, we use existing knowledge about the process that we are being investigated. investigated. For example, uh, the manual said that the factory should produce 300 grams, so that's our new hypothesis. Things are as expected. Or for example, if you are doing an experiment to validate a model, you can use values from the model that you are trying to validate as your new value. Or if you're doing an experiment to investigate a system, the system compliance, then you use the compliance values as your new hypothesis, okay? So in going back to the chocolate, we suspect that may be a problem in your chocolate production. So we propose sampling 20 packages and we estimate the mean of the population from the sample. Our new hypothesis is the estimated mean is over 300, sorry, the population mean is over 300 and the alternate hypothesis is the, the population mean is under 300. Note that when we're doing the new hypothesis testing, we make several assumptions about the system. Some of these assumptions are technical and some are statistical. So the first assumption that we do is that the mean is a good measure for the question of interest. When we say that the mean is a good measure, it says that individual variations of packages are not so important. What is important as is that we establish the mean of the system. Also, another thing that we estimate, we are assuming is that the packages that we took from the sample are representative for no population of interest. For example, if we only have one factory, then it's okay to sample only from this factory. But let's say that you are the king of the chocolate empire. You have 30 factories all over Japan. In that case, if you only sample from one factory, then that sample is not representative of your entire empire anymore. Maybe that, that factor is not very good, but your entire empire in general is performing okay. So you need to know if your sample is representative of the question that you are asking. Are you interested in the performance of your entire chocolate empire, or are you interested in the performance of this one factory? Okay. Also, uh, there are other hypotheses. We are assuming that in the package there is actually chocolate. This means that when I'm measuring 300 grams, it's all chocolate. It's not like the package measure 200 grams and the chocolate measure only 100. Because if the package me measures 200, maybe the package is always the same weight. It's a more and more, much more stable uh, process. Or maybe the opposite is true. 
So we, if, if two different processes work together to do that 300 gram, then that will affect your calculations. So you need to think about all the hypotheses, all the assumptions that you are making when you construct your hypothesis testing. So after you define your hypothesis and after you thought about the assumptions you, and you collected the data, we are going to do the data analysis. So the testing procedure is one, you obtain a sample, you run the experiment. Two, you calculate the test statistics. Remember that the word statistics here means a function based on the sample data. So the test statistics is the data that you process from the sample that will tell you what's the result of the test. So we calculate the test statistics from the sample data. Three, we make a decision based on the computed value. So the sample mean is a good estimator for the population mean. So we can decide if the new hypothesis is true or if the alternate hypothesis is true based on the value of the sample mean, okay? Now the question is, what is the value that should be done? Remember that, as I said, because this is a random sample, sometimes by pure luck, the value might be a little bit below 300. So we want to have some sort of safety. We don't have this delta that if the estimated, if the estimated mean is a little below 300, then we still say that no, we, we, must, we must consider that this is bad luck. But if the estimated mean is much lower than 300, then we will say, no, this is not luck. This is not a coincidence. Uh, the mean of the population is not 300. Even if we had the worst possible luck, we could never have this value. So this defines two regions. The rejection region is when we reject the new hypothesis and we say that the alternate hypothesis must be true. And the expected region is when we do not reject the new hypothesis and we say that the alternate hypothesis must not be true. And how do we choose this delta? How do we choose this difference? Remember that when we est the parameter estimator is a random variable and there is an estimator error. Because of this, there is the chance that the hypothesis test reaches a wrong conclusion. If the estimator error is too large, so if we choose, sorry, if the estimator error is too large, the sample mean could be the rejected region, if, rejection region, even if the new hypothesis is true. So if, if this delta is too big, then for instance, we, it could be that the true, if let's say that we choose the delta to be 50 grams, it could be that the true population mean is 270 grams, which is below the number that we are interested, but it's above the threshold. So we would lose that. On the other hand, if delta is too big, okay, the sample mean could be in the expected region, even if the hypothesis is not true. Okay, so we want to estimate and control the probability of these errors. So there are two types of errors that we want to control. We want to control the type one error and the type two error. The type one error is the false positive. The type one error happens when we reject the new hypothesis when the new hypothesis is true. So the probability to occur a false positive is, we usually call this as the significance level of the test. So when we say, oh, we did a test with 95% significance, this, sorry, a, a test with 95% significance, this means that this test has a 5% chance of having a type one error, a false positive. Usually we call the false positive rate alpha. So alpha is the probability of a type one error, a probability of a false positive, which is the probability of rejecting the new hypothesis when the new hypothesis is true. Another term is also called the confidence level of the test. So the confidence level of the test is 100, one minus alpha percent. So 95% confidence means uh, that the test has a 0.05% alpha. Now, just like in the confidence interval, oh sorry, for example, uh, for a certain sample, uh, the value selected for alpha defines the threshold. So we can select alpha. If we select alpha, it defines the threshold of H0. So for if H0 is true, 
we can expect that the distribution of mean estimates is approximately normal with average 300 and standard error sigma divided by square root of n. So if we define a 0 0.05 to the alpha, the idea is that this is this curve here is the distribution of sample means when the null hypothesis is true. So if the null hypothesis is true, our mean is 300 and there is a, there is a, <clears throat> there is a sigma. So we want, uh, if we say that, okay, we accept a 0 0.05 chance of um, type one error, this means that the rejection region should be the region that covers only 5% of this normal curve. So we can calculate this by using the, uh, qu the, quanta the percentile. So let's say that this is the 5% percentile of our normal curve for the new hypothesis. So our rejection region is anywhere from this 5% percentile below. This is our rejection region. If our estimated mean happens here, we reject the new hypothesis. Okay. Notice that maybe, even if the new hypothesis is true, the mean could happen here, and that would be a, a bad result. That would be a type 1 error. But we decided that we accept this probability of error. Now, to control the probability of type 1 error, this means that we can control the probability of type 1 error. We can select this region. For instance, we could select the region here, and we could have almost 0% of our rate of type 1 error. The problem is that if the rejection region is too small, we can have type 2 errors that we're going to talk about in a second. Okay? So when we select the, the alpha, we can select the, uh, the, size, uh, the size of the rejection region. Now, the type 2 error is the false negative. The idea of the type 2 error is that we fail to reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. So the probability of occurrence of a false negative in any hypothesis test is generally represented by the letter beta. So when we say the beta of a test, we're saying the probability of a false negative, which is to not probability of not rejecting the uh, null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. This quantity, 1 minus beta, is also known as power. So when I say this test is very powerful or this test is not very powerful, what I mean is that this test has, if it's very powerful, it has a low probability of a false negative. It has, if it has low power, it has a high probability of a false negative. Now, the type 1 error is very easy to control by controlling the size of the sampling distribution. We can control the size of the sampling distribution by controlling the alpha, that's the our critical region, and controlling the size of the sample. The bigger the sample, the narrower the sampling distribution. However, the type 2 error is harder to control because the type 2 error has one information that we don't know. If, we, if, the, type, if the null hypothesis is false, which hypothesis is true? We don't know. We just know that the null hypothesis is false. So the type 2 error depends on the real value of the mean that we don't know. Okay. So for the null hypothesis, we define which value we know. But for the alternate hypothesis, we don't know what is the true value. We just know that it's not a null hypothesis. So if the true hypothesis, if the true value is close to the null hypothesis, the probability of a type 2 error is very large. But if the true value is far from the null hypothesis, the probability of a type 2 error is very low. Okay? Uh, so the power of a test is, has several factors. Of course, just like alpha, beta is also, also changes depending on the sample size and the significance level. But unlike alpha, beta is also depends on the real value of the parameter and the variance of the sampling distribution of the, popula of the, of the population parameter. So if the new hypothesis is false, a smaller magnitude of the difference will lead to a great probability of type 2 error. On the other hand, if the new hypothesis is false, if you have a type 2 error 
with a true value that is very close to the true hypothesis, then, well, this error is not so big, is it? I mean, if we have a type 2 error because the mean of our factory is really 299 grams and not 300, who cares, right? We are interested in big errors. We are interested in detecting a difference of 10 grams or 15 grams or 20 grams. We don't care about a difference of one gram. So to a certain level, type two errors are not so important as type one errors, okay? And because of this, because we can say, oh, we don't care about the difference of one gram, but we care about the difference of 10 grams, then we can determine the power of a test by saying, what is this desired difference? We're going to talk about this in a future course, but what we, can, what we want to say right now it's is that it's important to think about what is the desired difference? What is the difference in the hypothesis that we actually care about? Okay, so let's summarize type one error and type two error. Type one error alpha depends on the distribution of the new hypothesis. So it's easier to control. The type two error beta depends on the real value of the parameter. It's more difficult to specify and control. Because of these characteristics, we can say that to reject the new hypothesis is a strong conclusion. On the other hand, to fail to reject the new hypothesis is a weak conclusion, but we can strengthen it. So it's important to remember that failing to reject the new hypothesis does not mean that the new hypothesis is true. It only suggests that the new hypothesis is better than any other alternative model that we know so far, okay? All right, so I'm gonna take, I'm gonna break here the video. And this is the general concepts be behind the hypothesis testing. In the next video, we're gonna talk about how to actually perform the test on data. See you there. Hello everyone, uh, this is Klaus from the University of Tsukuba. This is Experiment Designs for Computer Science, Lecture 3, Video 3, Statistical Inference. So in, this, in the last video, we talked about what was statistical testing and what was hypothesis testing and many things that we have to keep in mind when we're doing a hypothesis test. In this video, we will actually go through a few examples of, stati of new hypothesis testing. So first, let's start with the general procedure of a hypothesis test. The idea is that first we identify which parameter we are interested in. Oh. Huh. We identify which parameter we are interested in analyzing. And based on this parameter, we define uh, the new hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis. And we also define when we're defining the alternate hypothesis, if it's one-sided, in other words, if the alternate hypothesis is the value of the parameter is different from x or one or two-sided, sorry, one-sided is uh, the value of the parameter is below or above x or two-sided, the value of the parameter is different than x. The difference between one-sided and two-sided is a very small difference in calculation. So we're not going to focus this on this, uh, on this course you can easily see uh, the difference by looking at the help, the help file of functions that calculate the tests that we're going to describe here. Now, uh, <clears throat> we determine the desired alpha and beta, and we define the minimal interesting effect size delta. After all of this, we calculate the sample size. Uh, we're not going to calculate the sample size on this lecture. This will be in a future lecture. And we determine the test statistic and critical region. Remember that test statistic here is a function calculated on the sample data. And critical region is the area of the, the value of the test statistic that we use to define whether we reject the new hypothesis or if we do not reject the new hypothesis. Now, finally, we use, we calculate the statistic from the data and we use this information to decide whether or not to reject a new hypothesis. So let's imagine a second example. This time we're gonna use the following example. For a certain brand of peas, 
we want to ex determine if there is any significant deviation from the mean weight of the sacks from, from an advertised amount. So there is a brand that is selling peas and they are advertised that the mean value is 50 kilos. You want to take those peas and you want to calculate if this advertisement is true or false. So in this case, your new hypothesis is, yes, the advertisement is true, and the mean weight of the sacks is 50 kilos. Your alternate hypothesis is that, no, the advertisement is not true, and the value of the sacks is different from 50 kilos. Let's say that for this test, you decided that the significance level that you will accept is 0 0.05, so your alpha is 0 0.05. With these characteristics, we expect that the sampling distribution of the, of the mean sample follows a normal distribution with variance x hat, that's equal to sigma square divided by n. And if the new hypothesis is true, the mean of this distribution is 50, which is the mean of the new hypothesis. Why is this normal? because following the, the, the central limit theorem that we talked about in the last class, the sampling distribution follows, in general, follows a normal distribution. We're gonna talk about this uh, a little bit later in this, in this lecture. And this, vari and this variance is the variance, the sigma, the, the sigma is the true, uh, is the uh, variance, the sigma square is the variance of the population, and this n is the size of your sample. So given all these characteristics, let's define this random variable. This random variable C0 is taking the estimated mean of the sample and resizing it to a normal distribution. So because we're estimating that the mean is mu0, the new hypothesis mean, we can subtract x from the mu0, and we divide this by the variance, which is sigma divided by square root of n. Now, if we get this, uh, <clears throat> this sample mean that is normally distribution with this variance and this mean, if we subtract this from this mean and we divide it by this value, then Z0 will be a random variable that will be distributed following a normal distribution with mean zero and variance one, and standard deviation one, sorry. Uh, notice that this is under the new hypothesis, okay? If the new hypothesis is not actually true, then this value of z will follow will, will fall somewhere else. But if the new hypothesis is true, this equation will generate a random variable that follows n01. Okay? So because of this, uh, we have that the probability of the value of z to be between alpha divided by 2 and 1 minus alpha divided by 2 quantiles is as follows. So the probability that z will be smaller than the alpha divided by two quantile or bigger than the one minus alpha, uh, sorry, uh, the probability that z will fall, will fall between this alpha divided by two quantile and the one minus alpha divided by two quantile, if the null hypothesis is true, is one minus alpha. So basically the quantiles we get, for instance, let's say that we have 0 0.05. So we take the 0 0.25 quantile, and the 97 point, point, sorry, the 97.5 quantile. And if the probability that Z will follow between these two limits is 0 0.95. So that's our uh, extreme region, okay? So this result allows us to calculate a critical zone for H0 and 1. So if Z, uh, it, if the quantile alpha divided by two of Z is bigger than Z0, or the quantile of one minus alpha divided by two is smaller than the zero, then we can reject the new hypothesis with confidence one minus alpha. If not, then we don't have enough information to reject the new hypothesis. So we must not reject the new hypothesis. Let's calculate this. So assume that we took 10 observations, so our n is 10, and we calculate our point estimator. So our sample mean is 49.65. Also, let's assume that we know that the population, the population error is, the population sigma is one kilo. 
So let's plug those values in the equation. So we have 49.65 minus 50 divided by one the square root of 10. And our value will be minus 1.113. Now, remember that we wanted our significance to be 0 0.05. So we take the quantiles of Z, so the 0, 0, 0.025 quantile and the 0, 0.975 quantile. And these values are minus 1.96 and 1.96. So these are our critical values. If this Z0 falls between these critical values, we cannot reject the new hypotenuse. But if it falls outside of these uh, extreme values, then we must reject the new hypotenuse. Now in this case, minus 1.1 is between 1. minus 1.9 and 1.9. So we conclude that the data does not support the rejection of the new hypothesis. Let's think of a different example now. Let's say that we don't know the real variance. In general, like we don't know the values of the population. So let's imagine we don't know sigma. We don't know the real variance. So how do we do this calculation? Okay. Also, let's just change a little bit and say that we're going to use alpha 0 0.01. So we want a test with more confidence. Now, the test hypotheses are the same. Uh, new hypothesis is 50 kilos, alternate hypothesis is different than 50 kilos. However, because we don't know the variance, we cannot use the normal distribution. We have to estimate the variance. So to estimate the variance, the, the estimation of the variance from the sample will change depending on the size of the sample. So we want to use the T distribution because the shape of the T distribution also changes with the numbers of degrees of freedom, which is the numbers of observations in our sample. So in our case, our formula is T0, our test statistic is X minus mu of zero divided by S divided by square root of N this should come from this is similar to a t distribution with n minus one degrees of freedom okay so this t distribution n minus one degrees of freedom indicates how much information do we have available to calculate this t distribution so if we plug again so we use the same data as before we have the mean of the the estimated mean is 49.6 n is 10 and let's say that the sample error the error of the sample is 0 0.697 so now we calculate our test statistic 49 minus 50 0 0.6 square root of 10 and the result is minus 1.597 so that's our statistic okay now we need to calculate the critical values so we have the same way we have the quantile for the t distribution with n minus one degrees of freedom so it's the quantile of 0 0.005 with nine degrees of freedom is minus 33.24. And because the T distribution, like the, like the normal distribution is symmetrical, we know that the extreme, the extreme values is minus 3.24 and 3.24. So under the new hypothesis, there's a 99% chance that the test statistic will fall between minus 3.2 and 3.2. Now, if we look at this value, minus 1.5 is inside the critical region, so is inside the non-rejecting region. So the result of this test is that we cannot reject the new hypothesis at the 99% confidence level, okay? Uh, we can use this test in R, so you can test this easily in R, so we can generate a sample and we can read the uh, For instance, here we have a data set. I will upload this data set to the code later so you can test yourself or you can generate your own data. So this could be the data from your experiment. And the t-test function will calculate that. So my sample is your sample. It automatically calculates sample size. Uh, alternative means if we are testing uh, if our, alter, uh, our alternative hypothesis is different from a value, less than a value, or more than a value. So for this example, we're using a one-sided test. So we're testing whether 
these values is less than this new hypothesis mean. So this is mu zero. So this is the new hypothesis mean. And our confidence level here is 0 0.99. So our R sa one sample to test, uh, the data, uh, it says that the data comes from this variable, my sample. It calculates the t-value, minus 15969, with nine degrees of freedom. And it so it says here that uh, <clears throat> the 99% confidence interval is minus 250 and says that the calculated mean is 49. So it's inside the confidence interval. Okay. So when we describe the results of the hypothesis test, what we usually say is that we have insuffic insufficient evidence to reject the new hypothesis or sufficient evidence to reject the new hypothesis at the significance level alpha, okay? This, is, this description is like the minimal description. Of course, there is some mini missing information here. For example, when we say, oh, we don't have enough evidence for to reject uh, the new hypothesis, it does not say that if this lack of evidence is strong or weak, or if there is evidence to reject the new hypothesis. We don't know if we rejected the new hypothesis by a little bit or, or by a lot. And this is usually useful to know, right? Also, uh, when we say, we're just saying we uh, have sufficient evidence, we're saying that this alpha level is appropriate, but maybe the person who is reading wants to know, okay, but what if we do a more strict test or what if we do a less strict test? Does this conclusion changes? So maybe the reader wants to know that. Also, there is no information about the magnitude of the effect observed. So we can add more information here to, uh, to, the, to our report of the hypothesis test. So let's talk about the p-value. So what is the p-value? The definition of the p-value is that p-value is the lowest significant level that would lead to the rejection of the new hypothesis, given the data that we use. So one way to interpret this is that the p-value is the probability under the new hypothesis that the test statistic would be at least as extreme as the value that we observed. For example, we can calculate the p-value on, on the previous example as p-value is the probability that the test statistic is smaller than 1.597, which is the value we observed, when the new hypothesis is true. So this would be the integral from minus infinite to minus 197, and this is for the one-sided test, of the, uh, of the, the, the t9 from zero from minus infinite to uh, 1.59 being equal to, and this probability is 0 0.7237, okay? So one way to interpret this value is how surprised we see. So the probability, if the new hypothesis is true, the probability that we would see this value or an even smaller value is 0 0.07. So this p-value 0 0.07 is how surprised we are to see this result. In this case, we are very surprised, but not enough to reject the new hypothesis. So it quantifies the strength of the rejection or the strength of non-rejection. Note though that even though we have the new, the, the, even though the p-value is related to alpha, it's still important to define alpha during the experiment design. You cannot calculate the p-value first and then decide if it's significant or not. Before you calculate the p-value, you have to decide, oh, uh, this is the value that I will say it's significant. If you define the significant level after you calculate the p-value, you are doing what people normally say as moving the goalposts. So you calculate the p-value and you see that your p-value is 0 0.1 and you say, oh, my significance value is uh, 0 0.05. Or you see that your p-value is 0 0.001 and you say, no, 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 my significance value for this test is 0 0.001. No, first you define the significance level and after that you calculate the p-value. Because of this, it's also, sometimes you see in paper, people create tables of p-values. Tables of p-values don't give you any information if you don't determine what's the desired significance level a priori, okay? So 
Remember that we can adjust the rejection area for alpha by changing the number of observations. So this means that you can create a p-value as small as you want if you can increase the number of observations in your sample. For example, let's say that our new hypothesis is 500 and the alternate hypothesis is mean divided with 500. Let's say that our n is 5,000, so we have 5,000 observations in our sample. The mean of our sample is 499, so this is our estimated mean, and the error of our sample is 5. Notice that the error here is much bigger than the difference between the sample mean and the new hypothesis. So if we think of it as common sense, this difference is not so important. However, when we calculate the p-value, we see that our p-value will be 1.2 times 10 to the minus 23. So this would be 0 0.0000023 zeros by one, okay? It's almost like one mole of p-value. So this p-value is very significant, but the difference is not meaningful, okay? This is especially important for computer science. In computer science, many times you can increase the N very easily by just repeating your experiment. You leave your computer running for one month and you have 5,000 experiments, 10,000 experiments. In those cases, it's very easy to have an arbitrarily small p-value. So it's important before you begin your experiments to determine what is your N, why your N is that size, what is your desired p-value and what are the expected values of p that you can ex can you, you you can you are hoping to see with that sample size okay so be very careful to not artificially inflate your p-value this is also called p-hacking uh in the literature okay so to tell the whole story of the experiment is necessary to use effect size estimators so effect size estimators, uh, it, there's, there are people who write whole books on the subject, but the idea is quite simple. The idea of an effect size estimator is what is the difference between the alternate hypothesis and the new hypothesis that we are kind of expecting with this experiment. For instance, one way to estimate the effect size is to simply set differ, uh, calculate the difference between the sample mean and the new hypothesis mean. In the example for the previous page, the difference is one gram. And this difference is smaller than the error of the mean. So this looks like a very small effect size. Another way is to do the dimensionless de-estimator. So the de-estimator is the difference between the sample mean and the new hypothesis mean divided by the sample error, okay? So this quantifies the difference in terms of standard deviations. So the idea is that the point estimator and the confidence interval will tell you the magnitude of the facts. So when you're reporting your results, of course, you have to report your p-value, you have to report the significance of your test, but you also have to report the estimated sample effect to say how important is the significant effect that you found. Okay, so let's suppose that we are testing the new hypothesis, the mu, uh, mu 50 against an alternate hypothesis, mu different from 50 with 10 samples and alpha 0 0.01. And then we calculate it from the my sample, we have the same values. And we can see here that when you're calculating the t-test in R, and I think that it's probably the same thing for other statistical uh, programs, uh, you get not only the p-value, so here you have the p-value, 0.01. So if your alpha is 0.01, you already know that you cannot reject this new hypothesis. However, this is not the whole story. We can also calculate the, um, <clears throat> we can also calculate the confidence interval. So the confidence interval says that with 99% of confidence, the true value of the mean is between 48.9 and 50.3, okay? We cannot reject the hypothesis that it might be exactly 50, but if it's not 50, it should be probably be between these values, okay? All right, 
Remember though, that as we mentioned uh, in the previous video, this statistical test has many assumptions, technical assumptions and statistical assumptions. For instance, we have the assumption of normality. Uh, there's a typo here. We have assumption of independence, assumption on the value of variance, assumptions about the process, etc. So we need, after we do the analysis, we need to validate the assumptions to avoid bad surprises. Uh, for instance, you are assuming that your data is normal, but when you analyze it, it's actually not normal, or actually the variance is much bigger than you were expecting. So if these assumptions are not validated, uh, your conclusions might be wrong. Okay, so it's very important to validate your assumptions when they can be validated through the analysis of your sample data. We're going to look at some of the validation of the assumptions. Uh, we're going to talk about more assumptions in future lectures when we talk about other tests. In the case of the Z test and the T test that we studied in this lecture, uh, we have first the assumption of normality. So the assumption of normality, okay, it, it's not about the observations. It's not that the, the observations follow a normal distribution. The assumptions of normality is that the estimation of the mean, in other words, the statistic that you calculate from your sample that calculates the estimated mean of the population from the mean of sample is follows a normal distribution. Now, this thing that we might we have to remember is that in general, we can expect the, uh, the, uh, the estimation of normal, uh, the the assumption of normalcy to be followed because the CLT is actually quite strong. However, there are other cases that uh, we are not, we don't, we don't care only about the normality of the um, sample mean, but we also worry about the normalcy of the observations. In that case, there are many ways to, to, to test if the observations follow a normal distribution or not. First, there's one way to estimate, to, to check if the, uh, if the observations follow a normal distribution or not, is to do a QQ plot. A QQ plot, which means quantile quantile plot, is this plot that we are looking right here in this slide. It plots one set of data against another set of data. And when one of the set of data is the theoretical normal quantiles, and the other set of data is the data from your experiment, the QQ plot will show if the data from your experiment roughly follows a normal distribution or not. Okay, so if the, plot, if the data follows a normal distribution, it will generally stay close to this line. It will be a straight line. In this case, we see some minor deviations from normal. So here we can see that this data, it might slightly different from normal at the extremes. Okay, uh, of course, because the CLT is very robust, small definitions of small deviations of normal are still okay for the Z and the T test. However, other tests might require stronger assumptions of normality. You have to check that uh, depending on the test that you are actually using. If you want to test normality, like the visual inspection is of course not very strong, uh, you need to do a decision like how much deviation from here should you uh, should you accept? So you can do st a statistical test to test if a date if a set of data followed the normal distribution or not. Now there are several tests of normalcy, such as the Shapiro-Wilk test, the Anderson-Darling test, the Komogorov test, etc. In this course, we're going to recommend the Shapiro-Wilk. We're going to use the Shapiro-Wilk. But depending on the situation, you might want to use the other tests. So it's worth taking a look at them and seeing what are the assumptions, what are the conditions. The procedures of these tests is the same uh, new hypothesis testing procedure that we had before. Here, the new hypothesis is that the population from which the observations were taken follows a normal distribution. And the alternate hypothesis is that the, the population from which the, no, the observations were taken does not follow a normal distribution. And in this case, a rejection of the new hypothesis is evidence that the sample came from a normal distribution. However, as I said before, if the sample is big enough, the CLT might guarantee a normally distributed sample mean estimate, okay? 
Now, a more important and more stronger assumption is the assumption of independence used in the t-test and the z-test. So the idea of the assumption of independence is that each observation is not dependent, the value of each observation does not depend on the values of the other observations. The value of the, each observation depends only on the parameters of the population. When does this happen? For instance, let's say that we, are, we have a robot and we are measuring the value of the robot. However, this robot has a battery and because you did not charge the battery before the, ex the, before the experiment, the battery of the robot is weak. Because the battery of the robot is weak, the first, the, first, the, the first time the robot runs, it runs at full speed. The second time, it runs a little bit slower. The third time, it runs a little bit slower. The fourth time, it runs a little bit slower. Now, every time it's run slower, it's running slower because the previous observation used the battery. So there is a relationship between the observations. So the observations are not independent, okay? Now, a second example. Let's say that we, are, we develop an algorithm to do time series prediction. Okay, so our algorithm does time series prediction. However, so to test this algorithm, we get 20 different time series and we try to predict all these 20 time series and we see how well the algorithm predicts them. However, five of these time series comes from the same model. Let's say that we have five time series from solar data of different, of different years and the other 50 time series are from completely different cases. Each time series, each of the 15 different, each of the 15 other time series is from a completely different domain. What happens is that this five time series that comes from the sun data, they are very correlated. So the value, their values is much closer than the values of the rest. So these five time series, they come from one distribution and the other 15, they come from another distribution. So this invalidates the independence uh, assumption of the t-test. So in general, we want to guarantee the independence assumption. However, it's very hard to do an st analytical test for independence. The best way to guarantee independence is to make sure that in your experiment design level, you guarantee the independence. You make sure that you charge the battery of the robot, or even better, you charge the battery before every experiment. And you make sure that all your time series, they are either all from the same class category or they're all from different class category. You don't have some from different class categories and some from the same class categories because then you're gonna have different distributions. If you have, uh, there is a, the derby watson test is a test that can calculate autocorrelation. So it can test if the first uh, observation is related to the second observation that is related to the third observation. So the DW test would, would detect correctly the first violation of, the first example of violation of independence, but the DW test would not detect the second example of violation of independence, okay? So it's kind of hard to rely only on the statistical tests to detect violation of independence. You need really to really be careful when you design your experiment. Okay, so to conclude this lecture, in this lecture, we described a framework for statistical testing. We introduced the concept of hypothesis testing, which is a way to use data obtained from an experiment to make a conclusion about a population. This puts two hypotheses against each other. A new hypothesis, there is no any special uh, effect, and an alternate hypothesis, there is a special effect that we have observed, okay? To do the, the new hypothesis testing, we follow the following steps. First, we formulate the question of interest. We create the new hypothesis that we are studying. Second, we define the minimally interesting effect. So we define what is the minimal value that we are interested in observing. Based on the new hypothesis and the minimal interesting effect, we define what is the confidence, what is the alpha that we desire for this test, and what is the power, what is the beta that we desire for this test. So we calculate, based on alpha, beta, and beta, we calculate the sample size, how many observations we need for a sample, 
Now notice that we did not talk today about calculation of sample size. There will be a future lecture that will focus on this topic, okay? Then we collect the data. So after we calculate the sample size, now we can do the experiment. We know that we need 20 samples or 15 samples or 17 samples, okay? After we collect the data, we do the statistical analysis. We calculate the statistic, the Z statistic or the T statistic. And we also calculate the assumptions. We calculate if the data is normal, we calculate the variance that we assumed, et cetera. Finally, based on the statistic, on the T statistic or the Z statistic, we can calculate our p-value and we can calculate our effect size. And based on the p-value and the effect size, we can say, oh, we reject the new hypothesis and we estimate that the difference between the new mean and the actual mean is about this much. Or we can say, no, we could, did not reject the new hypothesis and we calculate a confidence interval for the mean of this much, okay? So this is the procedure of new hypothesis testing. Now, in future lectures, we will study variations and special cases of this testing procedure. In this lecture, we talk about the new hypothesis of one sample. In the next lecture, we're gonna talk about new hypothesis testing for two samples. When you compare algorithm A and algorithm B, how do you do new hypothesis for that case? Also, in the lecture after that, we're gonna talk about calculation of sample size. Now, there's two very recommended reads for this lecture. The first recommended read is this statistical significance versus practical significance. And this is a very nice summary of the topics that we talk about this lecture. What is new hypothesis? What is alternate hypothesis? What is p-value? What is confidence? What is power? So this is a quick read. I think it's like three pages. So make sure to read this first. The second is assumptions of normality. It says why uh, the normal normality is important for the new hypothesis testing, uh, its relationship with the central limit theorem, and when we can expect the, no, the, 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 the normal the assumption to be uh, validated and when we can expect it to be, uh, um, to be invalidated. So I really recommend these two readings for this, uh, for this lecture. Thank you very much and see you next week. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Klaus Aranha from the University of Tsukuba and today we continue with the Experiment Design for Computer Sciences course, uh, Topic 4, Paired Comparison. So before we begin, I would like to talk a little bit about um, the last classes. Oh, sorry. The outline for this lecture. So in the last lecture, we studied how to use hypothesis testing to perform induction uh, on the value of a population parameter. So we saw that, oh, we have, a pro we have a process that is generating some product and we want to see if the, the value of, let's say the average of the result of this process is below a certain number of interest. So we can say like, okay, we have a target time and we must run our algorithm under that target time. And we can use sample to compare the running time of our algorithm against that type target time. So that was the one sample testing. Now, very commonly in research, we also have the cases of two sample testings, testing between two different quantities. For example, if we're talking about drug development, it's very common when you are developing the drug and you're trying to test its uh, efficiency to compare it against a placebo. Why a placebo? Because if you get two groups and to one group you give the, gr the drug, the testing drug, and to the other group you give nothing, there is a very no well-known effect that is the placebo effect that if you, the, 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 the group that you give the medicine will get better even if the medicine does nothing. If, it, if it's just like a small candy that you say it's medicine, they will get better because they believe they're taking medicine. So what happens is that we separate into groups and we give one of the groups the real medicine and the other group we give the candy saying that it's medicine. 
So by doing this, we eliminate the placebo effect. So we're comparing the two groups. Another thing, another, another experiment that we see often in computer science is comparing a new algorithm against the old one. So you have, let's say, a new neural network or a new evolutionary algorithm or a new network protocol. And you don't want to compare against a target value. You want to compare against a different algorithm. So it's two populations, right? And your question is, is the performance of these two algorithms the same? Or if we think about statistics, as we discussed in the last two classes, do, does the performance of both algorithms come from the same population or not? Okay. Uh, sometimes you also see something like called A-B testing, where you have, for instance, two website designs. You have the design for two interfaces, and you test one interface and the other different interface with different people, and you want to compare uh, which interface people are like more, most, okay? So this comparison between two quantities is the topic for today's lecture. So today we're going to describe how to do the hypothesis testing that we did last class when we have two quantities. Before we begin, uh, I want to comment on reporter number one. So thank you very much. I received 22 uh, reports. I think we have a few more students than that, if you did not submit a report, send me an email as soon as possible. Uh, but anyway, uh, grading these reports will take a little bit of time. Maybe I'll have time to grade this weekend, maybe next week. But I really gave a quick look over most of the reports. In general, the topics were very interesting. A lot of people did reports about their own research. Uh, there were some people doing reports on other topics. Uh, there were a few mistakes that were common, even on this quick look. The first one is that quite a few people did not include code for reproducibility. And I think I made it very clear when I described the report that it's very important that you start to learn that when you publish code, when you publish a, a paper, uh, you need to publish reproducibility data. So for your second report and for your third report, don't forget to add the data that you use for the analysis, for generating tables, for generating figures, okay? Uh, second, a few students did not submit the report in PDF. One student only submitted the markdown, and markdown is really nice, but uh, I need the PDF because in case I cannot run your markdown, the PDF will be your official report. So in case I cannot replicate your code, I need the PDF to know what you wanted to write. Okay, so don't forget to submit the PDF in your report. There was one student that submitted data from his experiment and said, look, uh, I submitted data from the experiment, but this data is secret and I don't want it to be released. And he's okay, okay, of course I will not release, but if you are worried about your experimental data being secret, maybe it's not a good idea to submit it in a report, okay? Um, I mean, using, uh, you can of course do this for yourself, you can use, you can make yourself, but if you submit to Manaba, um, I don't know, maybe there is a problem with Manaba, or I don't know. So uh, let's try to use only open data in the reports, okay? Um, also, one thing that I noticed is that when I do this course, you notice that this, these lectures are actually quite short. This is why, that, that's what, uh, the reason for this is that when I give it presential, uh, the students ask lots of questions. Oh, I did not understand this calculation. Oh, I did not understand what uh, hypothesis mean. I don't understand what population means. Now, of course, it's very difficult to, for you to make questions when I'm talking to a video and you are only listening, but we have some avenues for questions. Uh, we have Manaba, there is a forum in Manaba. Uh, you can ask questions to me by email, okay? Uh, there is a TA that's going to answer questions in Manaba also. So make sure that if you don't understand something, uh, you ask questions, uh, you ask questions, okay? Because if you don't understand, uh, the course will start to get more complicated because for instance, this, this lecture is all based on the last lecture. And the next lecture will be based on this lecture. So if you, don't under if you did not understand lecture number three, 
you will not understand lecture number four and you will not understand lecture, lecture number five. So make sure that you understand things completely um, and ask questions if you don't, okay? All right, uh, let's, start with the, let's start with the class. So the, we, this class is divided in two parts. The first one is two sample testing and the second one is pair testing. Now, pair testing is a specific type of two sample testing. Uh, so let's study both of them together. So uh, sometimes, like I said before, we are interested in the comparison between two different populations. And we get samples from these two populations and we want to estimate the values of the two populations. This is normal, is, this is very frequent when we compare effects of two different, two, two different techniques. And if you're reading a statistic book, uh, you will usually heard the word treatment. The word treatment here, you should understand is as different techniques. It comes from medicine. So you have maybe treatment A and treatment B, uh, um, drug A and drug B. Uh, but for us here, we're thinking about techniques, okay? So we are comparing two te one technique against a control group, a placebo, or maybe a new technique against an old technique. For if you're using algorithms that do search, evolutionary computation or um, uh, Markov uh, types of algorithms, um, if you're doing neural networks, it's usually very useful to compare your algorithm against the Reynolds search, okay? Uh, because sometimes uh, comparing against, if you compare against old, older techniques, uh, maybe the difference is very small and you don't know actually how good is the algorithm. If you compare against a random search or like, what, what would happen if this algorithm did not exist? That would be something very interesting to know, okay? Now, you will notice that the statistics, which means the calculations that we are going to do, they are very similar to the statistics that we used for the analysis of the civil population. The key difference is about how we describe our population and how we describe our uh, variable of interest. In other words, the difference is on the is experimental design. So by changing the experimental design in the right way, we can use the same statistics to get us many different kinds of information. The opposite side of that coin is that errors in your experimental design will tell you completely different things from what you expected. So you need to be very careful when you choose your, uh, your, stati your statistical test, okay? Now, what usually we want to know is we want to compare the means of some variable or we want to compare the variables, let's, uh, the, the variances. So we have two methods that they, uh, they perform about the same level of performance, but we want to say that method A is more robust than method B. To represent this robustness, we can say that method A maybe has a lower variance than method B. So they have the same performance, but method A changes less. And for some applications, that's very important. It's more important to have always a very stable value than to have a value that changes a lot. Okay, so that's why sometimes we don't want to compare the mean performance, we want to compare the variance of the performance. Uh, also, we all can also have sometimes the proportions. So a comparison with proportions happens when your algorithm is not tr trying to find some performance, but it's trying to solve some problem. Let's say, for example, you have an algorithm that wants to detect if a graph is connected or non-connected. So that's a yes, no answer. So maybe you run your algorithm on 400 graphs and you manage to get the correct answer in 350 of them. So you got about 80% uh, of uh, correctness. And a different algorithm got maybe 90% of correctness. Now, you don't want to compare the means of these, okay? Because you have a maximum value, you have a minimum value, you have limits. So the means, the, the normal will be affected by these means. So you're more interested in comparing the proportions in this case. Okay, so we have to think about this. Uh, today we're gonna only to talk about the comparison of means, but if you search for comparison uh, tests of variances or tests of, of, of proportions, you're gonna find the calculations very easily. 
And the important thing that is the experiment design will be very similar. So let's talk about an example comparing means. So the example we're gonna go here is the length of steel rods, okay? And this is very interesting because we're going to compare the means not of the steel rod, but the means of the difference. So let's see this example. So here are pro our cases that we have a manufacturer of steel rods. So we need to manufacture these rods for either construction, okay? And the idea is that we have to cut the bar with a precise length. So you have to cut the bar with exactly desired, desired size. So the desired size is defined. We want a rod with exactly one meter. Of course, cutting the rod is imprecise. So maybe it's a few millimeters more or a few millimeters less, okay? So this project is prone to errors. We result in additional costs. If the, if the, if the size is different, we have to adjust the pieces. So that will be costly, okay? So it has to reprocess the rods with this. If the size is too big, we have to throw it away and melt it down. So we want to minimize this error. So what we want to minimize here is how much the process differs from the target value. So we have an engineer here that wants to compare the current method, and here we are, the current method for cutting the rods, with a new method that would reduce this error, okay? So, the first thing that we have to do is to define a statistical model. So what is a statistical model? A statistical model is how we describe the population in terms of statistics, okay? So remember, we have a population that is all possible uh, rods that could be produced on this project and the probability that each size of rod is, comes out, okay? And then we observe some sample. Observing the sample is like, okay, so let's produce 50 rods and see how many, uh, what's the size of each of them. Now the statistical model will describe what are the possible values that this sample could have given the population and what, how they are distributed. Okay, so it's a model about how the samples are generated. Usually this model describes the value, some value of interest. So we're gonna call this Y. Y is the value of interest. And we have two methods, right? We have I equal to one and I equal to two. Method one and method two. Now, we know that for each method, the values of Y, the length of the rods, they come from a distribution with a mean, okay? And this mean will be mu I. So we have mu U and mu two. So Y one comes from mu one and Y two comes from mu two, all right? Um, also, because every sample, every observation, every time we take an observation, the value will be a little bit different. It will be sometimes a little bit bigger than you, sometimes a little bit smaller than you, okay? So we call this the error, epsilon. So now that we have the Y, the I1 and I2, the mu and the epsilon, we can describe uh, our, our statistical model. So y i j so the variable y the variable that we are measuring for the method i for the observation j the value of i is mu plus epsilon so mu is the mean so this is the mean of method i if there was no error the value of y would always be mu okay because there is no error it's always the same value but there is an error and this error is this epsilon epsilon i j so now epsilon i because we are thinking that maybe the error depends on the process so i is the process but also epsilon j because there is an independent error okay so this independent error depends only on the observation okay so each row the each the the value of interest y is based on the mean plus the error Okay, now we have this model. What can we do with this? So if we think about that this model will describe our uh, observed variable, we will assume, okay, that the error, we are interested in knowing this error, how big it is. We're interested in measuring this error. So we're gonna assume that the error is IID, and IID means independent and identically distributed. So independent, means that 
from one if you take if you produce two rods the arrows are independent the size of this rod does not is not related to the size of this rod so let's lecture we talked a little bit about independence so here in this model we are assuming that the arrows are independent if they are dependent then we cannot use this technique at all this technique is based on dependence also id identically distributed this means that the arrows come all from the same distribution so in case we comes the arrows for method i comes from this distribution here and the other method the the, the methods for uh, for method two comes from this distribution and we are also assuming that the errors follow a normal distribution with mean zero and variance sigma i squared so this is our model the measure of the variable that we are interested in, it has a mean and it has an error and this error follows a normal distribution okay now if we assume these things we can say that the two models they look like this we have population one for method one and we have population two so we have population one for method one and we have population two for method two okay and i think maybe you can see here how we want to compare if the two populations are the same these two distributions they will be together they will be very close together if the two populations are different these two distributions will be apart as they are here so what we want to know is that we want to look at the samples and we want to estimate where these distributions are let's see how we do this so okay so we have this model but what is why okay so remember that the goal for this experiment is to see if the new method produces steel rods that are closer to the correct value because of this we cannot use the length as the value if we use the length as the value uh, both methods they produce they aim to produce this method the difference is not is not the target value the target value should be the same i mean we are we're not testing if one method is completely wrong we're just testing if one method is better than the other so if both of the methods are not completely wrong they should be producing the bars with the same size. So what we want to know is how far from this perfect size we expect to be. So the idea is that now or Y will be the absolute error. So the idea of the absolute error is the average of the difference, the absolute difference between the length of the rod that we produced with one of the methods and the nominal length the target length so this is the y this is our variable of interest for this experiment for this experiment we want to know which method has a small error has the smallest error okay so if we think about this statistical model that we described we can use y as the error and we can build the hypothesis around the mean of this absolute error so we have this u uh, y i okay so in that case we have new and alternate hypothesis okay so the new hypothesis is that the, the the mean of the error of the old method minus the mean of the method of the new method or mu one minus mu two is equal to zero or in other words the mean of the error of the old method is equal to the mean of the method of the new method or uh, sorry, mu one is the new method. Sorry, so the mean of the, the 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 mean of the new method is equal to the mean of the old method. The alternate hypothesis, the hypothesis that is not conservative, the hypothesis that says, oh, there's something new going on here, is that the new method, the mean of the error of the new method, is smaller than the mean of the error of the old method. So here is we are again with uh, new hypothesis and alternate hypothesis. No hypothesis, the new method and the old method, they have no difference. Alternate hypothesis, the new method has a smaller error than the old method. Now, let's assume for now that we don't know 
the variance of the process, but we know that the variance is similar for both systems, okay? Since the, variable, since the variance is unknown, you remember from the last class that we estimate the variance from the sample data. Now, last class, we've, we estimated the variance from a single, uh, from a single sample. But for two samples with the same variance, we have the pooled variance estimator. So the pool variance estimator will get the error from one sample weighted by the size of that sample and the error from another sample weighted for the size of the sample. So if we have two samples with the same size, it's simply all, both of them together with the same weight. But if we have samples with different, let's say, let's say that N1 and N2 are the same. If N1 and N2 are the same, we're gonna have Let's say, let's say that we have 10 from each. We're going to have 10 times S1, not 9 times S1, plus 9 times S2, divided by 18. So it basically is S1 plus S2 divided by 2. Okay? If the variances are different, sorry, if the sample sizes are different, then we're going to give more priority to one error or the other. Now, we're not going to discuss how to decide the sample sizes today. There will be one lecture in the future all about sample sizes. So for now, just let's say that we have enough samples and we're gonna use the same sample size for both populations, okay? Now, <clears throat> based on this estimator, now that we have the estimate of the error, we use the T statistic, the same T statistic as we used before, okay? Now the T statistic here will be the T statistic of difference of the means, so we have mean one minus mean two, so mean of the new minus, the difference of the mean of the new and the mean, the, the mean of the old. And you remember that under the new hypothesis, these two are the same, okay? And under the alternate hypothesis, mu one is smaller than mu two. And we also have this estimated mean for the sample. So this is the mean of sample one, and this is the mean of sample two, okay? And this is divided by the estimated error, square root the size of the samples. Now, this T statistic, like in the previous lecture, it will come from a T distribution with N1 plus N2 minus two degrees of freedom. So let's put some numbers. Remember that for the experiment design, we have to choose the alpha. So we have alpha equals 0.05. 95% confidence on the test, that's the standard value. Also remember that we want to know what is this, the minimal effect of interest. We are not interested if we reject a new hypothesis for one millimeter of difference, that's too little. So we're gonna say that we want to detect any difference larger than 15 centimeters in the error of the steel bar, okay? And we also want a power of 0.8. So this is the chance that we will detect, uh, we will reject the new hypothesis if the new hypothesis must be rejected, okay? Now, if we go back to our hypothesis, our new hypothesis is mu one minus mu two is equal to zero. Now, remember that the T statistic is compared against the new hypothesis. So since we are assuming the new hypothesis to be true and we are testing to see if it's false given the data, we can cut this. So this mu one minus mu two here can be cut to zero, okay? Because we are assuming that the new hypothesis is true. So our T statistic becomes simply the mean of sample number one minus the mean of sample number two divided by the error, multiplied by a proportion of the, of the samples. And this is distributed under a T distribution with N1 plus N2 degrees of freedom. Now, because we want a confidence level of 0 0.05, then our rejection threshold is the alpha divided by two, um, is the alpha divided by two um, percentile of the T distribution, okay? Actually, I think it's just the alpha percentile here because this is a one-sided comparison. So I'll check this later. So um, let's see here. 
So we can to the test uh, when we are running this on R, it is the same t test, and that's the interesting thing. Okay. So first we're gonna read the tables. Read tables. So here is the table that we are using. So as you can see, we have a CSV but without the commas. Uh, so we have the old process and we have the length of the error. So you can see 17 centimeters, 17 centimeters, 17 centimeters, etc. And we have the new process and we have 06 centimeters, 07, 10. We have this difference. So we can see that the new process seems, the error seems to be smaller than the old process. So we want to see this, okay? So we do the test and here is the big difference, right? Instead of just giving the data, we give Y, length error explained by y process so this explained by and when i say explained by i say this style here in r it means explained r by so here i'm telling t test that to do a t test on this data but know that the variable process explain the variable error so the function will know that in process i have two factors old and new and I will separate the errors based on these two factors, okay? My alternative is less, so I'm interested to see if the new process is smaller than the old process, and my mean is zero. So my, uh, my, uh, my um, new hypothesis is that the difference between the means is zero, okay, as we said before. Uh, the variance is the same, so we are assuming that the variance is the same for both, and the confidence level is 0 0.95. And then we can see the calculation here. So we can see that our t-value was minus 14, okay? Degrees of freedom is 32, and if you remember, the degrees of freedom is size of the sample 1 plus size of the sample 2 minus 2. So this means that we have 17 samples for each, and we can see here we have... 70 samples for the old and 70 samples for the new okay and by using this from this data we see that our p-value is 9 to the e to the minus 16. so our p-value is much lower than 0 0.05 so this indicates that we can reject the new hypothesis okay so we reject the new hypothesis in favor of the alternate hypothesis that the difference of the means is smaller than zero and now the confidence interval for the difference is somewhere between minus infinite and minus seven. So we don't know uh, how big is this, conf is this difference, but we know that the difference is at least seven centimeters. And now here's something. The difference is at least seven centimeters, but we were interested in a difference of 15 centimeters. So this difference is not as much as we are. There is a difference, but maybe this difference is not so important, okay? Now, after we did the test, we need to validate the assumptions that we are doing, okay? So we have three assumptions that we did in this experiment. The first assumption is that the residuals, the errors, they follow a normal distribution. The second assumption is that the variances of the two samples is the same. And the third assumption is that the observations are independent. So the normality assumption, we talked about the normality assumption last lecture. Uh, when you remember that we can uh, do a QQ plot to check if the two, uh, if the, the data follows a normal distribution. And we have here the normal quantiles and we can have the length of the error, and we see that it's about the same. We have one uh, outlier in uh, item number 12, so observation 12 seems to be a little bit of an outlier, but is still within uh, bounds, okay? And we can also compare of the new process, and the new process, we see that it's a little less normal. Of course, uh, the t-test, it has, it is um, robust, to a little bit of variation, to some variation. So this is not very worrying for us, okay? But it's worth investigating this, uh, these outliers to see if it's not something special, if it's not some error that happened in our sampling method. Of course, we can also do the Shapiro test, and we do the Shapiro test for the new and the old. 
And we can see that for both cases, we cannot reject the new hypothesis that the sample comes from a normal distribution. Okay, so, okay, we ver verified the assumption of normality. Now, the assumption of equality of variances, we can uh, do a visual analysis of this by plotting the residuals. And what is the residual? Residual is the mean of the sample minus the value of each. So we here for the mu, we have that the largest residual is three and the smallest residual is minus three. And if we remember that the mean of the new sample was seven, we can see that the largest difference is 11, like about a little bit more than seven, seven. And the smallest one is about five. So about minus three to plus three. And the old it's from minus two to minus two plus two. So there's a little bit of change in the variance, but they seem to be about the same. So we cannot really reject that maybe the variance is about the same. Uh, to test that the variances, uh, the quality of variance, we have the Fligner test. So the Fligner test, uh, also in R, we do the error uh, explained by the process, and we got a p-value of 0 0.19. So we cannot quite reject the new hypothesis that the both of the variances are the same. Okay. All right. So finally, the assumptions of independence. And for the assumptions of independence, we talked about it last class. There is no general test for the independence assumption. It has to be guaranteed in the design phase. Okay. So what we do for that is that we try to make sure that uh, the, the size of the rods is not influenced by if the machines are hidden up. If it is, we can generate a very large number of rods. Like here we have 17 samples. We could generate 50 and throw away the samples in the beginning of the process and in the end of the process to just get the ones in the middle that are more stable. Or we can maybe just produce one rod per day and uh, to make sure that it's always the same state, okay? Um, in the case that the variances are not the same, okay? So, or, sorry, in the case that we cannot assume that the variances are the same. Note that here we tested and we verified the assumptions that they are the same. So this is not necessary for this example, but in a more general case, you cannot know if the variances are the same or not, right? So in that case, we can estimate the, the variances uh, using a variation of the, the, the t-test called the Welch t-test. In the case of the Welch t-test, the statistic is calculated like this. So you see that instead of having a pooled variance, we have the, the variance of the first sample divided by the sample size and the variance of the second sample divided by the, sa the sample size. Okay, and in this case, it will be a TV distribution. Uh, so the distribution is slightly different, but the, look at, the lucky thing is that, at least from the computational point of view, it's largely the same, okay? So here we can just set, at, in R, we can use the t-test var equation equal false, and it will use the Welch test. It's, as you can see here, it's saying that it's using the Welch test. In the previous slide, uh, not this one. You can see here that we are just using the t-test and we are not using the Welch test. Okay, and we can see here that if we use the same data and we say that we don't know if the variances are the same or not, well, the p-value is still quite low and we still can reject the, uh, the new hypothesis. It's a little bit higher, so um, it assumes a little bit more of error. So there is, sorry. It's a little bit lower. It's a little bit. It's a little bit closer to the new hypothesis, but it's still far enough that we can uh, strongly reject the new hypothesis here. Okay. So summary: uh, to compare an estimator from samples of two populations that we assume that follow a normal distribution. Uh, we will we set our statistic and the corresponding hypothesis to the difference of the two target variables. This technique for comparison is equally is very simple. So you just put the two data there. Okay. Now uh, there are cases in where this approach does not apply. So now we're gonna see 
a relatively common case where using the difference of the target variables would lead to a wrong result, okay? So I'll take a quick break and we go to the next video that should be a little bit shorter. See you then. Hello everyone, this is Klaus Aranha from the University of Tsukuba. And now we are going to the Experiment Design for Computer Science Lecture, Class 4, Part 2, and we are going to talk about pair testing. Uh, there is an example that I like to illustrate pair testing, and it's this. Imagine that you are trying to sell um, a new pair of shoes for a team of, uh, a new pair of shoes for playing soccer, okay? So the idea is that you want to test your new pair of shoes that think that it, um, let's say, it gets used much, it takes much more time to get used, to, 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 low, to, to, uh, to get old. So you buy a team that there is a local school, so you, you, you produce your new pair of shoes for the local school team. Of course, you want to compare the new pair of shoes with the old one. So in one day, you, get, you have the team plays two games on two different weeks. On the first week, you give all the kids the pair of shoes. And on the second week, you give all the kids the old pair of shoes and you see how much the shoes get used. And the ones that get used less, uh, it means that the, sh the shoes is more resilient, right? So what's the problem of this? The problem is, what's your experience? So you want to know how much of the soul remains after the game. So you measure the soul before the game and you measure the soul after the game. So you have a difference. And you could get the average, uh, the average of this difference for all the kids. The problem of the average is that the average is kind of sensitive for changes that are very high. And if you think about soccer, and I hope you know a little bit of soccer to follow this, uh, this but in soccer, we have different types of players, right? We have the goalkeeper, and the goalkeeper will stay the entire game near the goal. So we can expect that for the goalkeeper, the, so the, the sole of the shoes will, be, will not change. They will almost not use anything. So even for the new shoes or for the old shoes, the goalkeeper will not use a lot. We also have this kid that runs a lot, runs the entire game. And we expect that this kid will use this, this, the, the sole a lot, okay? So the sole of the shoes, they start, they, they wear out much faster, okay? So what's going on this is that if you take the average of the goalkeeper and the, average, and the, the kid that runs a lot, this will kind of, re, this difference will be bigger than the difference of, using the new shoe or the old shoe. So instead of testing whether the new shoe or the old shoe wears out faster, you end up testing whether the goalkeeper or the kid that runs a lot wears out faster. So what's going on here is that there is an external factor that affects your testing. Your testing is affected not only by the quality of the shoe, but by how much the kids run. So the idea is that you want to pair the values of the, wear, the wearage of the shoe to the activities to the kids. So you want to pair together the values of the, the goalkeeper and you want to pair together the values of the, the kid that runs a lot. And this will give you more information, okay? Well, let's see a computer science example, okay? So this happens a lot in when you're testing algorithms on different data sets. So let's say that you're testing a, a search, a meta heuristic search algorithm. Uh, it's an optimization algorithm and you have different problems of uh, optimization. There are many different problems of optimization, right? And this researcher, this researcher, uh, she's only interested in developing an algorithm that is best for one family. So there is one kind, so she develops a new algorithm that is very good for family of problems A. Okay, and she wants to compare her algorithm, algorithm A, against a standard algorithm B that is the, st the state of the art. So her proposal is that A is better than B for this family of problems. For other problems, 
she doesn't know, but for this specific family of problems, A is better than B, okay? So she's interested in testing the average performance. So she gets a benchmark of several uh, optimization problems in several different families, and she takes the problems that are only in the family A, okay? So she will compare uh, algorithm A and algorithm B in different problems of the same family. Now, because these are different problems from the same family, they probably have similar characteristics. But still, we can expect that some of the problems in this family will be easier and some of the problem instances will be harder. Okay? For instance, let's say that this is an optimization to find a path in a graph, a planar graph. So the family is finding optimizations in planar graph. Maybe some graphs are bigger and some graphs are smaller. They have the same characteristics, they just have different number of nodes. So the bigger graphs will be harder and the performance will be worse, even though they are the same family. So if you compare A and B on a very big graph, it will be very slow. But if you compare A and B on a very small graph, it will be very fast, okay? But the, besides the difference in the problems in the instance, the research guarantees that the, the measurements are made under the same condition. So it's the same computer for both methods, the same system for both methods, same load for both methods, etc. okay? Also, the time is measured in a way that is not sensitive of other projects. One way that you can do this, let's say that you have, uh, you are going to run algorithm A 300 times and algorithm B 300 times. One way to guarantee that the background process will not affect is instead of running A, 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 and then running B, 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 you can randomize that. So when you get your script that run the script, that, that run the algorithms, you mix it. So you run A, B, B, A, A, B, 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 A, B, B, A, 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 B, B, B. So if you mix both of them together, it will be less likely that only one process will be affected by other things running in the system, okay? Now, because we have, you know that it's a standard, because of the errors, you know that you want to run um, the algorithm many times. So let's say that you have seven problems. So for each problem, you run the algorithm 10 times. So for algorithm A, you have 70 runs, seven instances, 10 times each. For algorithm B, you also have 70 runs, seven instances, 10 times each. Now the question is, what is the variable? Okay, so what, what are you going to do your analysis? What is your sample? Now, this is not a trivial question. And there, this is something that people that are studying algorithms, they usually do it wrong. What we have to ask here is, what is our population? Okay, in the first lecture, we talked, for instance, the population can be all the possible results that an algorithm runs. However, here, we are doing an experiment that is a little bit more complicated, right? We have several problem instances, and for each problem instances, we have several repetitions. Is our population all the runs in any instance? Okay. Are all the, 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 to answer this question, we have to think of what are the independent observations? Which observations are independent? For instance, Let's say that we run 10 times in instance one and 10 times in instance two. Are these observations independent? Well, if we think about it, they are not because the, the, the 10 times that the 10 observations that we run in, uh, in problem instance one will be different from the 10 observations that we run in instance two. Remember, if we run with a very big graph, it will be very slow. If we run with a very small graph, it will be very fast. So the observations here, they are different from the observations here. So the observations, they are not independent. So where can you remember that one of the requirements that we have for this test is that the variables are IID, independent and from the same distribution. So, what is independent here? So the observations, if we only look at one instance, if you only look at one instance, the observations in that distance are independent. 
But if we look at multiple instances, the observations are, in the, are dependent on the instances. So how do we make this independent? One way to make it independent is to look at only one instance. What is the problem of that? If we only look at one instance, we are saying that this algorithm is better in that instance and not in the class of problems. So let me draw this here, just so you know. So imagine that we have here, um, okay, here we are. So we have here, all the optimization problems and inside the optimization problems we have families so we have family one two three four inside each family we have instances okay we have instances And inside each instance, we have observations, execution. So each of these points is one time that we execute the algorithm. So we have to think about what is, your, what is our question. If our question is we want an algorithm that can run in any optimization problem, we are thinking about this big group. If our question is we want to run, we want an algorithm that is best for one family, we are thinking about this group. And if our question is we want an algorithm that is good in one specific instance, in one type, in one graph, then we are thinking about this group. Now, in the previous slide, we mentioned that the goal of this researcher is that she wants to develop an algorithm that is good for a given family. So she is running her experiment in this family level. Okay? So for this case, we are not interested in the individual observations. What we are really, we were not interested in the individual executions. What we are really interested in is the average performance of the algorithm in each instance. So for each instance, so what we're going to have is that for each instance, we're going to have several executions. But our real observation will be the mean value for each instance. So this is our observation, the mean value for each instance. Okay? Why, so what happens if we don't do this? If we don't uh, separate, if you don't do this difference correctly, what I often see in papers in, optimiz in optimization is that the researcher will execute many uh, observations in many instances, and we put we'll do a statistical analysis on all the observations, but we'll try to do uh, the apply the conclusions to the family. But the problem of that is that we by by including all the observations we are going to reduce the error too much we're going to have a lot of replication like we're going to have it's like we had the same sample many times to give an idea it's like if we're measuring the height of a student of the students in a university but we get the same uni student and we measure the height of that student many times that student will be overrepresented in the sample so here what we are interested in is the average performance in each instance and we want to see this average across all of the across all the family okay all right so however going back to the pairing the variability of the results 
give to the different test problems is a source of variation. So big graphs, there will be a lateness and smaller graphs will be uh, not so much lateness, but we're interested not in this variance, but we're interested for like, for, for the small graph, is algorithm A or algorithm B faster? For the big graph, is algorithm A or algorithm B faster? For the giant graph, is algorithm A or algorithm B faster? So what to solve this problem, to solve this difference, to remove the influence of these big graphs, we want to pair the, the, we want to pair the observations, okay? So how do we do this? The idea is that for each observation, we create a pair, A and B, for each problem. So for each problem, we have a pair, one observation from uh, algorithm A, one observation from algorithm B. The hypothesis testing is, doing, is done on the sample of problem differences. So it's not, in the previous, in the previous video, we saw the difference of means but here we are looking at the difference of problems. So let's look at the statistical uh, model. So the statistical model is similar to the last one, but there are some key differences here, okay? So let's say that YAJ and YBJ are the paired observations for the problem J, okay? So the pair difference will be BJ, distance J, which is YAJ minus YBJ. Now, the model for yij is grand mean. So this is the mean. Uh, this is the mean of the algorithm. And this is the influence of the problem on the mean. So tau i is the influence of problem, sorry, tau i, tau I is the influence of the algorithm on the mean. So this is the grand mean of everything. And this is the influence of the algorithm. So the grand mean plus the influence of the algorithm will be mu i. Okay, so this is the mean of the algorithm. Now, beta j is the influence of the problem. And this is what we want to eliminate. Remember that in the previous model, we only had mu i and we had epsilon. Now we have this beta here that we want to eliminate. So how can we eliminate this? Well, if we think that the difference dj is yij minus ybj, we can replace yij with this. So yij is mu plus tau a, which is the influence of the algorithm, plus bj, which is the difference for the problem, plus epsilon aj. And we subtract from the difference of the, uh, of the algorithm. So it's minus mu tau b, bj plus eb. Now, we see here that the influence of the problem is the same. So here we are assuming that the problem influences both of the algorithms equally, okay? So if we move the equal parts together, we have mu plus bj minus mu plus minus bj. So we, all this becomes zero, okay? So our statistical model means becomes the mean of the difference plus epsilon j. So by replacing, by uh, subtracting the means of each problem, remember that in the previous one, we took the mean of everyone and we subtract that. Here, we subtract the means of each problem. And by subtracting the means of each problem, we remove the effect of the problem in the analysis. Okay, now, the new hypo now that we have our statistical model, we can do our new hypothesis and alternate hypothesis. The new hypothesis is mu d, okay? So equal to zero. So the difference of the two methods, the difference of the two methods is zero. And the alternate hypothesis is mu g is different than zero, okay? And this will be a, t a test of hypothesis on a single sample, the sample of difference. Now, so now our population is the difference in averages until convergence for the problems under investigation. Now, because this is a one test hypothesis on one sample, we have our test statistic is what we already know is T0, which is the average of the differences divided by the error of the, the, the sample, but divided by the uh, square root of the sample size. And like in the first lecture, this is distributed on a student t variable with n minus one degrees of freedom. 
And here, our sample size is the number of problems, not the pro number of executions, the number of problems. Okay, some things that to be to, to notice again, in this import, in this example, it's very important to determine the minimal interesting size as the average time gains. So, for instance, we cannot say just five five seconds because maybe for the small problem, five seconds is a huge difference, and for the big problem, five seconds is a very small difference. So, our interesting effect size here must be something relative. For instance, we want to gain on average, I don't know, 2%. So our algorithm needs to be 2% better than the old algorithm for this effect to be actually interesting, okay? Uh, so as we said before, the most important sample size here is the number of problem instances. So it doesn't really matter how many times you uh, execute each problem instance. It just needs to be small, big enough to trigger the CLT so that we know that our estimate for the problem, for the performance in one problem is uh, representative. But if the number of repetitions is big enough, like maybe a 10 or maybe seven or something like that, then uh, we have good values and we can test a, a big number of samples, okay? So, of course, like I said, the number of repetitions has an impact or related to the observation, the uncertainty related to each observation. And this will influence our residual, but the number of, this, the, the number of uh, uh, problems is more important here. So, a few more things that we have to consider when we do repair testing. Uh, so when we do the sparing, what we're doing is that we're removing the effects of controllable noise ash factors. So here we are pairing on the problems. If we go back to the soccer example, we can pair on the kids so that we remove the influence of the different kids on the waste of the, the, on the, waste of the, the soccer. Another difference, let's say that we are going to test gasoline. We produce a new gasoline and we want to say, so see if it's better for cars. Of course, the efficiency of the gasoline depends a lot on the car because some cars are more efficient, some cars are less efficient. So we want to make a pairing on the car to remove the effect of the differences of the car in your testing, okay? So the pairing is important when we have a strong correlation between the samples, which is also, uh, we can also say that it's our heterogeneous experimental conditions, different cars, different kids, different problem instances, et cetera. So let's plug some numbers. So we're going to use this test data and these test data, they are available on the GitHub. So you can check the GitHub to try if you want to use this test data for your, for your study. So here we have three columns. Column one is the problem. So this is problem instance one. Problem two is the algorithm and problem three is the convergence time. So we have problem one, uh, algorithm A, problem one, algorithm A, and you can see that there is a variation here. Sometimes it runs in 30 seconds, sometimes it runs in 48 seconds, sometimes in 20 seconds, okay? And then we have problem one for algorithm B, and then we have problem two for algorithm A, problem two for algorithm B, problem three for algorithm A, and you can see now it takes 100 seconds, so it's a much more difficult problem. If we go to problem seven, we can see that problem six is already 300 seconds. Problem seven is like 400 seconds. So it takes a lot of time here, okay? So it's very different. Problem A is runs in 30 seconds. Problem seven runs in 300 seconds. So it's a big difference. Anyway, our sample size, our sample size of problems is seven, okay? We are interested to see differences in mean time greater than 10 seconds. It probably would be better here to use a percentage, okay? With a power of at least 0 0.8, with a significance level of 0 0.05. So the researcher performs 30 repeated runs of each algorithm from random initial conditions. So because the algorithm is, has influence from random factors, 
uh, it, he, the researcher repeats the, per, the, per, the, the analysis 30 times with different renal seeds. On C, we, uh, on, on R, we can see how we do this. So here we read this data file here, benchmark CSV. And now, because we have every single execution, we want to summarize, okay? So we're gonna choose the aggregate function in R, and aggregate function will say that time, the time is explained by the problem and the algorithm. So it will create a pair problem algorithm. So we are gonna have A1, A2, A3, A4. And we summarize that by taking the mean. So we are estimating the, con the, the convergence value for each problem algorithm pair based on the mean of the observations. And when we do that, we have a new data, AG data, which has two values for each problem, A and B. So it has two values for problem one, two values for problem two, two values for problem three. And it has seven values for each problem. So we have seven values for algorithm A, seven problems, and seven values for algorithm B, seven problems. Now, now that we have this, actually the analysis is the same as before. The pairing is not on the test, the pairing is on the experiment design. So pairing here is how we pre-process the data to remove the noise. So now that we have aggregated the data, we do the t-test exactly the same way that we did on the previous video, okay? So we do a t-test of time explained by algorithm, uh, paired, true, so it's pairing on the other, uh, and the data is ag data, okay? So it's a pair t-test, it's time by algorithm, and our t is uh, minus nine, uh, so our, our um, our statistic is minus nine, which gives us a p-value of 0 0.5. So because our uh, alpha was 0 0.05, we can reject the new hypothesis here. And we can see that the confidence interval of the mean of the differences is between minus 10 and minus 20 seconds. So we have, we have definitely more than 10 seconds of difference between the two algorithms, okay? Now, uh, just to see our experiment design, we can, instead of using aggregate, okay, we can simply use the difference of the times. So we have an, an array that is difference of times, aggregate time one to seven, aggregate time. So we can do, it's the same thing, we do the difference. So we don't need to do a pair t-test on the t-test, we can simply make the difference of the means and do a t-test on a single uh, on a single sample that is the sample of differences, and you can see that the result is exactly the same. So, why is the paired test on two samples equivalent to one sample test on the difference vector of the samples? Think a little bit about that. If you can answer this question, then you understood what is the mathematical model for the paired t-test. Now, of course, uh, after we do the test, we have to verify our assumptions. And our assumptions is normality, variances, and independence. So we do the, here the Shapiro test for to see the normality. And we can see that it's mostly normal, except that the last problem has a much higher uh, value than the others, which is kind of acceptable. It's a minor, um, it's a minor variation. We can see that the p-value here, it rejects the new hypothesis that is normal, but when we remove this outlier, we can see that it's well within the, the confidence interval, uh, the p-value, <coughs> sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, if we repeat the test, with the, if we repeat it, so this outlier is outside of normal. So we think, oh, maybe this outlier is making the data not normal. So let's repeat the test without the outlier. Even if we remove that outlier, our test still rejects the new hypothesis. And if anything else, we got an even bigger difference. So our outlier does not influence our results, okay? 
So this is something, if you see a big outlier, you might want to repeat your test without the outlier, just to make sure that your results do not change. So you can see that um, even if you have a problem with your testing, uh, with your assumptions, you can test, see if the assumptions invalidate your results or not. Now, why do we pair? What happened if we did not pair? What happened if we did this test, but without doing the pairing, okay? So here we have the test on the basic data without pairing, okay? Just a t-test of time versus algorithm. So this is a two sample t-test. And we see here that our, um, our statistic is minus 0 0.3. Now our p-value is 0 0.7. So here we do, cannot at all reject the new hypothesis. So without pairing, our test does not reject the new hypothesis. And you can see that our mean difference is much larger. Our confidence interval for the difference of the, of the difference of the algorithms is minus 100 seconds to plus 80 seconds. This is a huge confidence interval, okay? So what is happening here? Well, this image kind of explains. So if you look at the right image, these are the values for algorithm A for each of the problems. And these are the values for algorithm B for each of the problems. So these are the values for algorithm A for each of the problems. And these are the values for algorithm B for each of the problems. And if you look at this, like the difference between the problems is huge. If we just take a test to compare these two samples, of course, the test will say that these two samples are the same because these two samples, they, they cover a whole, a huge amount of, of space. But when we pair them, when we look at problem by problem, we can see that problem by problem, A is always better than B. We can see that this difference is consistent. So the difference between problems is consistent. Although, the difference in the sample without considering the problems is not consistent. So when, the, when there's a huge difference between the problems, we should do pairing, okay? So what we're doing here is that we're using information about our problem to guide our analysis. Now, there's one thing very important, okay? When you have a relationship between the problems, you should do pairing. However, when you do not have a relationship between problems, you should not do pairing. Just as if you do pairing when you need to do, you can detect if you should reject the new hypothesis or not. And if you do not do pairing, you, the, the test become much weaker. If you wrongly do pairing on an experiment where you should not do pairing, then you're going to have an artificially high uh, p-value, okay? Because when you, see, when you do a paired test, the, the statistic will pair this, the observations. And if there is no relationship between the observations, the pairing will find uh, information that it does not really exist. So you're going to get a fake result. So when the observations are highly correlated are highly related when there is a high difference between one observation and the next pairing is very important but when the observations are not highly related you should not do pairing okay very important this point all right so this leads us i think this is the end yeah this is the end of uh, the explanation of pairing, uh, pairing statistics. So in the last class, in this class, in the last class, we described the new hypothesis testing to do statistical inferences for a single sample. In this class, we generalize this procedure to a common situation where we have two samples. In two samples hypothesis testing, we do the inference based on the difference between the sample estimators. And when there is a high correlation between observations of each sample, it's important to perform the pairing of the observations. Okay. 
Now, uh, one very important point. Let's talk about report number two. Okay, report number two is due three weeks from now. So report number two is very similar to report number one. So in report number two, you must choose an experiment, perform and analyze the results. Like in the report number two, your report should have four, four parts. Introduction, where you explain the experiment and the scientific question that you're trying to answer. Experiment design, where you plan the data collection and the analysis that you're gonna do. Data collection, that you report on the data and the results. And the analysis, and the analysis must be a conclusion based on the hypothesis that you created and the value of the statistics and if you can reject the new hypothesis or not, okay? So important that the difference between report number two and report number one is that in report number two, you must use statistical inference to analyze the results, okay? So in the experiment design, you need to describe the hypothesis used. What is the new hypothesis? What is the alternate hypothesis? What is the variable of interest? What is the statistical model that you are using, okay? In the analysis section, you must remember to do to test the, to check the assumptions. So you must check if your you must check if your data is is uh, your sample follows normality. You if you are testing on unknown variance or known variance, you need to test your variance. If you're testing on pair, you must show where the pairing happens, and you must show how you guarantee independence on your experiment. So basically, the difference between report number two and report number one is that you need to do hypothesis testing on, on report number two, okay? And please do not forget to do reproducible science. So include what function to use to do the hypothesis testing, include what functions you use to do data processing. So include the code together with your uh, report. Now, one question that is very natural is, okay, because this report is very similar from report one, can I just get the data from report one and do a hypothesis test? And the answer is no, okay? And there's a very good reason for that. The idea of when you do experimental design is that the setup of the experiment must be done following the idea of what you're going to produce later. So for instance, before you do the experiment, you need to choose the variable, you need to choose the statistic, you need to choose alpha, you need to choose beta, you need to choose your hypothesis, okay? So by choosing all of this, you can do the data collection and you can select the experiment. If you collect the data and after that you do the hypothesis, it's very easy to select alpha, beta, the statistics, everything to do exactly the result that you want. That's called harking. Hypothesis, hypothesizes after the results are known. And that's a very easy way to, do, to add bias. So if you change your hypothesis after you get the results, you can just choose the hypothesis that gives you exactly the result that you want. So you need to define your hypothesis before you collect the data, okay? However, this does not mean that your data from experiment one is useless. Of course, you can use the data from experiment one. Just like in machine learning, where you have training data and test data, you can think of your data experiment one as a uh, in initial experiment. So using the, for instance, using the data for experiment one, you can estimate the value of the variance, and then you can do a, a hypothesis test based on known variance. That's stronger than if you do the hypothesis test based on unknown variance. Also, you can use the, uh, the values from experiment one to decide what should be your new hypothesis and your alternate hypothesis. But you need new values. You need new, new experiments to actually test the, those hypotheses. You can also use uh, experiment one to estimate how many uh, samples do you need. Now, we have not discussed yet sample calculation. That will be for experiment three, but you, you can use this information, okay? All right, so this is the end of the lecture. And if you have any questions, ask, you can ask on the forum in Manaba, you can ask on the comments, or you can send me an email. See you uh, next week. And next week, we're gonna talk about what we do when the data is not neural. All right, bye-bye.
Hello everyone, uh, this is Klaus Aranya from the University of Tsukuba and today we are continuing with the Experiment Design for Computer Science course, Lecture 5. Uh, this is the third part of the introduction to statistical inference and today will be a slightly shorter lecture. We're going to cover two topics briefly, uh, equality and uh, non-normal testing. So the idea of this lecture uh, is to round out the talk, what we talked about the last two lectures about um, infer uh, inference. In the last two lectures, we focused on the general case where we have a sample composed of observations from an experiment that are uh, numeric estimations from uh, some, some parameter in the population. So to give a more concrete example, we used the idea, the example, for example, that the, the example, for example, that um, we are measuring the time that a program takes to solve some problem um, or the weight of some product generated by a factory. And both of these are continuous values. And we wanted to measure if they are were different from some target standard value. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, exceptions for both of these cases. So the first exception is the quality, the quality testing. So the quality testing is the idea that, well, we talked about new hypothesis and alternate hypothesis, right? And the idea was that the new hypothesis is that the value that we are observing is not different from some control value. And the alternate hypothesis is that the value is different from a control value. But what about the case where we want to do the opposite? We want to show by experiment that um, our the, the, the system that we are studying, the one para, the parameter of the system that we are studying is in fact equivalent to a certain value. So in that case, we might want to use uh, equality testing. The other thing that we're going to talk about is about non-normal data. So the idea is that we're going to briefly cover uh, some things that we can do when we are dealing with data that does not follow uh, the assumption of normality uh, that is required by the tests that we described in the previous lectures. So let's go to the first topic first, the quality testing. So uh, in the previous lectures, we introduced tests, the DZ test and the two sample test and the pair test. And all these tests, they were focused on detecting the difference between the population parameter theta and the value theta zero for a new hypothesis. So the example that we gave is that a factory uh, produces uh, like a bar of steel and our idea is that we want a method that the error of this bar of steel is smaller than the error of the standard method of the factory. So in this case our hypothesis was about the error, the difference between the mean, the target production value and the and the and the, the really produced value the, the variations in the production so we had the error for the standard um, production mode and we had the error for the alternate production mode and we wanted to show that the error for the alternate production mode was smaller than the error for the standard production mode so this is um, an, a new hypothesis on the quality and an alternate hypothesis on difference, okay? However, sometimes uh, there are cases, especially in engineering, but also generally in sciences, that we want to test the equivalence of two quantities. So what kind of cases are this? So one case that we can think about is compliance testing. So compliance testing is when we want to get a certification for a new industrial process. So in this case, um, Engineering, the, the engineering discipline is a very conservative discipline. So the idea is that we're creating a new method and maybe this new method has some advantages, but the most important thing is that this new method has the same security uh, guarantees that the traditional methods have. 
So we want to show that in cer for, certain cer for certain security values, for certain security parameters, our method is the same as the methods that are already guaranteed. So this would be a compliance testing, okay? Uh, in medicine, in the pharmaceutical industry, we also have equivalence uh, for, for medicines. So the idea of equivalence is to show that um, a, certain, uh, a certain new drug has the same effect as some other drug while showing uh, some improvement in some other area. So for instance, let's say that we have a new drug that we are using to cure headaches uh, and we want to show that this new drug has less side effects. So we can have a standard test, a standard test on the difference like we studied before to compare the side effects. But we also need an equivalence test to show that the effect on headaches is the same as the traditional drug. So this is a situation where we want to have uh, the equivalence uh, statistical test. So the idea is that when we do, when we think about the equivalence test, so we are not trying to establish that a population parameter is different from the new hypothesis, but we're trying to establish that the, ex the experiment, the alternate hypothesis that we are looking for, the strange thing is that we are testing a population that we did not expect to be the same as the traditional value, but it was the same as the traditional value after all. So we we'll generate a new drug and we don't expect the new drug to, the, the idea is that, look, this drug is really good. This old drug is really good. It's not any drug that can have the same effect as this one. So when you get a new drug, the alternative hypothesis is that, hey, this new drug is actually as good as the old one, okay? So, in this case, so in, in the usual test, the alternative hypothesis is that the difference between the parameters of interest. Uh, so it, the new hypothesis is that without strong evidence of difference, we cannot rule out that they are equal. But here it's the opposite. Without strong evidence, we cannot show that they are equal. Okay. So in the, ex in the equivalence experiment, our hypothesis is that without strong experimental evidence, we cannot show that quantity A and quantity B are the same. How do we do that? Okay, so in the equivalent testing, the situation is, reserved, is reversed. The approximated quality of the two parameters is the novelty. Okay, so this means that the burden of proof is not that we have to provide evidence that it's different, but we have to provide evidence that it's the same. Okay. So now we need to design a statistical test that shows that it needed to be a really big coincidence for these two values to be the same, okay? So it's important to notice that in this sense, equivalent does not mean exactly the same. It does not mean that the two populations are identical, but it means that the two populations are so close that we could treat them as identical. So we need to show that there is a limit of practical significance. So there is this delta, and we have talked about this delta before. So this delta is, what is this range that in this range we say that they are the same, okay? Now, if we think about this range to show that they are the same, we can design a procedure to show that two samples for a certain parameter uh, that, that a sample for a certain parameter can provide evidence that this parameter is equivalent to some target value uh, within this margin. Okay. So to do that, we're going to use a different term that is similar but not exactly the same. So we're going to talk about another term that appears a lot in medicine that is called non-inferiority, okay? So what is non-inferiority? The idea of non-inferiority is that we don't know if this is equal, we don't know if it's better, but we know that these two quantities 
this new, this new value is not inferior to the old one. So going back to the headache, maybe this, this, this drug is as good as the old one, maybe this drug is better than the old one, but we know that this drug is not worse than the old one when it comes to how many headaches it cures, okay? So for a non-inferiority test, we can declare that a process is not worse than a standard one if we have enough evidence to conclude that the performance of the proposed process is no more than delta units worse than the standard. So our proof here, our statistical proof here, is that given the evidence, this new process, if it's, it's, if it's worse than the old one, it's worth at most by delta units. Okay, and if we think about, okay, it's delta units worse or better than that, we can use a standard test. Okay, so in this case, it's a standard test with a one-sided alternative. And this uh, one-sided alternative would be, oh, let's say that delta equals to zero or delta equals to a very small value. This leads us to this idea, okay, of no inferiority and no and superior. So in the traditional study that we saw before, okay, we have the null hypothesis zero. And if we find, so let me get the pen here. Oh, okay. So this is the traditional hypothesis. And let's say that we are measuring something where the higher the number is the better. In this case, this here is that we cannot reject the new hypothesis because we see here that our confidence interval falls within the new hypothesis. And here we can show when we get, if we get a result like this, our statistical test will say that, hey, the new method is superior to the old one. Opposite, in the opposite side, if we're doing a test, if we're doing an experiment where a small value is better, then to establish the superiority, we need our confidence interval to fall under the new hypothesis value. Now, this gives us a study of, this gives us an idea of what would an equivalence study look like. So if this is a superiority, this is a, superi this is a superiority study, and this is, uh, sorry, this is a superior study for plus, and this is a superior study for less, we can think of an equivalence study where we have our minus alpha and our plus alpha as a study where we want to show that our confidence interval falls in the boundaries of this alpha, okay? Also, we can compare the superiority study with the no inferiority study. So in the no inferiority study, uh, we show here that this is the null hypothesis and this is the minus delta. And you see that in both cases, our uh, confidence interval falls in the null hypothesis. But in this second case here, the confidence interval also falls close to the minus delta. So the second case, we do not establish the null inferiority because maybe the true value is under this delta. And in this case, we can establish the infer no inferiority. So according to our statistics, the true value must be above minus delta. And the same thing for the opposite, right? So to show no inferiority, we define a plus delta interval, and we must show that our estimation of the true value of the parameter is below this plus delta, okay? So how can we use this uh, how can we use these ideas of no inferiority for uh, positive values and no inferiority for negative values to define an equivalence study? Okay, so the quick idea for equivalence study is then to observe the confidence interval for these delta values. Okay, so we say that we can est establish the equivalence if we define some delta. So for we start, if we define some delta value, 
and we show that the confidence interval for our um, the confidence interval for our um, our parameter that we are observing falls in this interval. Okay, so if we look at the traditional testing, in the traditional testing, we as we uh, say that uh, a quantity is different from the null hypothesis if the confidence interval does not touch the null hypothesis. In the equivalence testing, we have two thresholds. We have an upper threshold and we have a lower threshold. And for us to establish interf um, for us to establish equivalence, it's not enough. It's not even important that we touch the middle. We don't care about the middle. We care about the upper boundary and we care about the lower boundary. So as long as our value, had, as long as there is enough evidence that our value of interest falls between the upper boundary and the lower boundary, then we say, okay, we establish the equivalence between these two values. Okay. So how do we define this? So this is like a, a general, uh, how do you say? This is an intuitive description of the equivalence study. But how can we transform this uh, intuition into an actual test? So the one approach that we're gonna study today is the two one-sided tests, okay? So in the two one-sided tests, we have two, one, two tests that are one-sided, so that's why the name. So it's two one uh, single mean tests. And in one test, we're gonna test, we're gonna do a standard test to show that the value under study is above the new, the, the, the target value minus uh, delta. And the second test is that the tar value under study is below the target value plus delta. Okay, so we define here our target value. So let me just mark this. So we define here our target value. So let's say our target value is mu. Okay, and our new hypothesis is that our new hypothesis is that this difference uh, mu minus the value that was, sorry, uh, the, mu, the mu minus the value that was observed is bigger than a certain, uh, a certain delta, okay? Now, because this is, in, this is the absolute difference, uh, this splits the hypothesis testing in two. So the first hypothesis that we are going to test is this one, H1. So the new hypothesis of H1 is that the difference is equal to minus, uh, minus delta. And the alternate hypothesis is that the difference is bigger than minus delta. In other words, because, because it's minus, it means that uh, it's actually closer to our target value. And the alternate hypothesis is that here, the difference in, in, in the difference is equal to delta and alternate hypothesis that the difference is smaller than delta, okay? So we do two tests with the same confidence and the same power. And if both tests reject the new hypothesis, so if the first test reject the new hypothesis, it's saying that the difference is, the, 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 the value is bigger than uh, uh, mu minus delta. So the first hypothesis, it says, the value is more than mu minus delta. The second hypothesis is the value is smaller than mu plus delta. So if we, if we reject the new hypothesis of mu minus delta and we reject the new hypothesis of mu plus delta, then the truth value must be in the middle, okay? So that's the idea of this test. All right. So let's, we observe this like this. So here we can see how it looks like. So we have here our minus delta. We have here our plus delta, okay? And here the alpha, the error, okay? The, the type one error is if our 
process. If our real value, uh, if a re real value was here or here, we would have this probability of type one error. And if our true value falls here, we're gonna have this probability of a type two error, okay? And our target value is here. So we want to find uh, some value for our experiment that falls between this, oh, sorry, between here, right? The minus and the plus and minus delta. So, so let's, uh, in, the, in the same way, uh, so that was for one uh, sample. Now let's say that we have two samples. We have the, the data for the drug one and the data for the drug two that we did uh, in a study. And we want to show that they are the same. Uh, the difference, it's, it's, exactly, it's not very different, the testing. It's the same idea as the two sample test that we saw on the last lecture. So here, our hypothesis is on the difference between the first parameter and the second parameter. So here, uh, our new hypothesis is that the difference between the two parameters is bigger than delta. And the alternate hypothesis is that the difference between the two parameters is smaller than delta. So we break again our hypothesis into two one-sided hypothesis. So we test the two one-sided hypothesis. And if we reject both of the new hypothesis, uh, we can say that our test indicates that the two samples come from uh, distributions with the same parameter theta, okay? So let's see a numerical example. So here we have an industrial certification. So we have a laboratory that is creating this very, very smart gun shield. So you have a gun and you put a shield in front of you and the shield will protect you from bullets. Okay, I don't know how smart that is. Uh, it doesn't sound very smart, but there are some people that sell that. So uh, anyway, the laboratory has to provide evidence that this shield is, um, is effective given a certain equipment. So uh, they have the shield and they want to certificate that the shield uh, actually um, defends as much as it's said to defend. So they will do a certain calibration procedure with some reference equipment. They will shoot at the shield and they will look at the size of the holes, okay? So the certification demands that the whole area generated by this procedure be the same as the one for the reference equipment. And the holes should have deviations no greater than four millimeters. So they shoot at the shield, they measure the hole uh, with the equipment and the status. So they say, okay, we're gonna shoot from this distance using these weapons and we're gonna measure the hole. And then they see if the size is different, okay? Now, uh, they know from the, 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 the company that is trying to get the certification, they know from uh, previous measurements that these deviations can be estimated as the error of the laboratory, that's the laboratory that's gonna do the test, is about five millimeters, and the error of the reference is about 10 millimeters. And they defined that they want the error levels to be, they want a confidence uh, of the test to be 0 0.01, and they want the power of the test to be 0 0.1. So this is actually a very low power test, right? So uh, how do we do this? So the first thing that needs to be done is to calculate the sample size. Uh, you, you always have to estimate and sample size. And in the future class, uh, we're going to discuss these details uh, about. But I'm just showing here the calculation the user of a function. There are many uh, sample size calculators for several tests. So here is a function that calculates the sample size for the two one sided um, test. And they added here all the data that they wanted. So, okay, we want an alpha of 0 0.01, we want a beta 0 0.01, and we want a difference. Uh, of no more than 0 0.5 millimeters. That was the difference that we stated that the, inter the difference of interest, okay? And then we have the standard deviation for sample one is five, standard deviation for sample two is 10, okay? So this gives that they need 145 observations for each group. 
So because we're doing two tasks, we usually need a little bit more observation. So they're gonna have to do 120, 145 shots for the laboratory and 145 shots for the reference to compare. So they compare that and they execute the analysis. So the analysis, as you can see here, we are using the same t-test function that we used for the one sample test in the last class, except that here we're doing this for two, okay? So we have one t-test where we're testing if it's the alternate, the alternate hypothesis less than the less than the, 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 the less than the difference of four, okay? So the difference here is four. So we have to see if the difference is less than four. And in the second test, we want to see if the difference is more than minus four. So we do one test, is the difference less than four? And the second test, is the difference more than minus four? Okay? And we see that in the first test, we got a p-value of 0, 0. 0. 0.003. So we reject the first new hypothesis. And in the second test, we got an even smaller uh, p-value. So we reject the second new hypothesis. So because we reject the first new hypothesis and we reject the second new hypothesis, we can say that the two values are equivalent. Of course, it's important to observe this. So we plot uh, two confidence intervals here. Uh, sorry, we plot the confidence interval of the difference. So the confidence interval of the difference is minus 0 0.5 to 3. So we see that our confidence interval is between the two limits that we draw and we draw the box plots for the two and we see that uh, they have indeed do look quite similar okay of course uh, after we do the experiment we need to think about the um how do you say uh the assumptions of the test so the first assumption of the t-test is the assumption of normality so here we are plotting the qq plots for the laboratory data against the quantiles and the reference data against the quantiles. And we can see that in general, both data follows, uh, are no, follows the, no distribu the, the normal distribution. So we cannot reject the normality assumption here. And here we're just illustrating the use of the uh, Derby-Watson test to test for independence. Um, or in this case, if we assume that the tests are done one after the other after the other, uh, this plot would show a, a correlation if there was a dependence. So if we shot many times and the equipment showed a temporal dependence uh, on the results, it would show on the Darwin Watt test. But just remember that uh, if you change the order of the data, then you will, the, the, the result of the Darwin Walton test would be completely different. So we need to make sure that your uh, general assumptions when designing the test will guarantee a certain degree of independence. And you can just do a quick Darwin Watson test to see if you are not surprised by anything that you did not take into account during the, um, during the experiment design stage. Okay. All right, so this was the first part of the lecture. So just to summarize, to do an equivalence test, the idea, one simple way to do it is to choose two one-sided tests. So we do one single test to see that the value is above the key value minus a delta, and another test to show that the value is below the key value plus the same delta. And if both tests are rejected, it means that it's not below the threshold and it's not above the threshold. So it must be uh, equivalent to the value of interest. Okay, now we're gonna give a quick break and then we're gonna come back for the second part of the lecture, no normal data. Hello everyone, uh, this is Klaus Aranha from the University of Scuba and we are going to now to continue Experiment Designs for Computer Science, Lecture 5, uh, Part 2 and we are going to talk about dealing with non-normal data. Uh, non-normal data is at the same time something that uh, happens less often than we think and more often than we think. 
So let's try to explain that in the in this lecture. Right. So until now, uh, we studied methods that assume that the experimental data comes from uh, the, the parameter that we are interested in comes from a normal distribution or something close enough. Okay, but in some cases, this assumption does not hold. So how can we perform the statistical analysis of the results in these cases? Let's start with a simple example to show that sometimes no normality can creep in and takes us by surprise. Okay, so imagine that we have a researcher that is examining two different diets, diet A and diet B. Okay, and the researcher wants to compare uh, the weight loss. So he measures people for a week or a month and um, measures how many how, how much weight they lost and they wrote it on a, on a data on a data set actually so that a they followed some people it got four three zero minus three minus five eleven minus fourteen minus fifteen minus three hundred and diet b we got minus eight minus ten minus sixteen minus twenty one minus twenty four so as we if we take a look at this data and it's good to always take a look at your data before you start doing tests uh, you might notice some very interesting things uh, the test uh, i have many i have seen many students of my laboratory and of other laboratories that they focus so much on the result of the test that they forget to look at the entire data and that may result in a kind of a tunnel tunnel vision right if we look at this test we can if you look at this data we can see two things right away it seems that in general the values of diet B are lower. It seems like that. I mean, most of the values in, in, the, in the highest value of diet B is minus eight, and that's quite that's lower than the median of diet A. But on diet A, we got this weird value in the end, minus three hundred. Now, what is this minus three hundred? Well, I did not collect the data, so I don't know. It could be someone that really, really got really thin during the, the time. It could be that the person who was entering the data typed an extra zero in there. It could be an error in the measurement. It could be that uh, the person did not, the, the, the data was uh, done correctly, but the balance was broken. Or it may be a true data, I don't know. Okay, so, but it's a big outlier. And we're gonna see that if we try to visualize, if we try to do a box plot of both datas, um, and we have a hint here of what's going to happen. If we just call the box plot on both data sets, we're gonna get a graph like this. And in this graph, well, we can see the difference, but it looks quite close. Now, if we remove, and here's the outlier, minus 300. If we remove this outlier and plot this again, we see that the two data compared, we see this difference. So I guess you can kind of see where I'm going over here. So this outlier is going to change how the statistic function looks at the data. So let's see what happens with the t-test. So when we look at the result of the t-test, we can see that we have a t-test, two sample t-test, our t value is minus 0 0.5. And if you remember your, the, the test that we did before, if you did some test by yourself, you can see that this is actually a quite middle way in the t distribution. So with nine degrees of freedom, our p value is 0 0.6. So if we just do the t test on these two data sets, we cannot reject uh, the new hypothesis that they might be the same. And this goes a little bit against what we're looking at. I mean, even if, even if they were not as, even if there was not a significant difference, we would not expect such a high p value. If we look at the, and, and we, when we look at the confidence interval, and this is why it's important to look at the confidence interval. When we look at the confidence interval, we see that, okay, the estimate value of the difference goes from minus 82 minus 82 to plus 50. If we try to plot this, uh, if we try to plot this standard deviation here, minus 82 to plus 50, 
we see that the confidence interval of the difference is higher, is bigger than the entire data that we're looking at. So this tells us that there's something wrong, okay? It's not even just the p-value, just the confidence interval. Look at the confidence interval and compare the confidence interval with the values that you actually have. You see, hey, there's something wrong here, okay? All right, so what happens? How do we deal with this, okay? So in here, it's clear that the case, by the way, the problem here is that if you remember, the t-test is based on calculating the mean. What happens to the means when we have a big outlier, okay? So for instance, if you study it, uh, a little bit of social, social science, you see that you don't want to take the mean of something like the salary. If you take the mean of the salary of the population of a country, this mean will be much higher than the salary that a lot of people receive because you have very few people with very large fortunes that will be outliers. So you have like maybe 1% of the people that have 80% of the, the value uh, in, some, in, in some country. And if you just take an average of how much money everyone have, these outliers will pull the average much higher than what's reasonable. And that's the same thing that's happening here. So if we know that the outlier is an experimental error, if we know that, oh, the balance was broken or the person wrote it wrong, I mean, we saw the outlier, we saw that the outlier is uh, affecting our results, we can go and just remove the outlier, okay? On the other hand, maybe we don't know, maybe the outlier is some important effect worth of being investigating. If this is a diet, maybe we can see that the outlier is a special case where the diet has some serious side effect. And then we want to know how often does this special case happen? We just tested 10 people. If we test 100 people, we will see this outlier happening more often. So the outliers may be either errors that should be discarded, or they may indicate special effects that should be studied. And there is no formula to tell you that. You have to do that by using your knowledge of the experiment that you're conducting. If we don't know, we can also use some test that is not sensitive to the outliers. So uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about this later, but a non-parametric test is a test that you, does not use a distribution uh, defined by parameters, okay? It's a position, it's a relative position test. So if we use a non-parametric test for this data, this test will correctly indicate a rejection of the new hypothesis of equality. So here we're using the Wilcox test that we are going to describe. And the Wilcox test among the two data, we can see that the Wilcox test gives us a p-value of 0 0.01. So it indicates a true location shift. So what is a true location shift? A true location shift means that the median of these two values, it has a real shift. It's not on the same location. These two values are not equivalent one of the values has a shift in position of the others. Now, one thing that we can see here is that the result of the Wilcoxon test will not give us a confidence interval and will not give us a central value that we can say, oh, this is the delta that we are looking at. So the Wilcoxon test gives us less information than the t-test. So it's a trade-off. The Wilcoxon test is not uh, sensitive to these outliers but it's gonna give us less information about what, is actually what it is actually testing. And when we explain the Wilcox test, you understand why this happens. All right, so let's go a little bit ahead. Um, so, um, how can uh, some data violate the assumption of normality? Uh, I'm highlighting here four types, okay? So for instance, like we saw before, sometimes we have special observations in the data that break uh, the assumptions of normality that the test makes. So for instance, very big outliers or data collection errors. And sometimes it's not as easy. Like if you have 10 data points, you can find an outlier easily, especially if the outlier is 100 times bigger than the rest of the points. But that's not always the case, okay? Now, 
another case, another special case that is also for special illustrations is one comment that was raised by one of the students in this course in the video comment from last class. And the student was saying, oh, I am measuring a time. Uh, so he was measuring, I, 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 he did not say exactly what he was measuring, but he was measuring time. And if you measure time, you can have something like one second, two seconds, 0 0.5 seconds, 0 0.3 seconds, time from the beginning of an experiment. And when he calculates the, uh, the, the confidence interval, he saw that the confidence interval went into values that are lower than zero. And he asked me, how do you interpret that? Okay, how do you interpret when the confidence interval includes values that are less than zero? Well, there are two answers to this question. The first question, the first answer is that we can look at the back to the future movies and imagine that we found a way to go back in time. The real answer is that this distribution is not really normal. So let me just pause real quick for a sneeze. <coughs> okay, I could not pause, okay. Um, all right, sorry about that. So when we have a normal distribution that is limited on one of the sides, well, sorry, when we have a distribution when living on the sides, the distribution will look like this. So all these values under the zero, they are, not, they are not allowed. So this is not really a normal distribution, right? Um, it does not have the same properties as the normal distribution. So in this case, actually using a confidence interval is not correct. The confidence interval will give us wrong information. So this is a case, like if we have uh, values that are close enough, okay, if we have values that are close enough to an absolute limit and a normal distribution will describe values that go across the, this limit, then this is an evidence that these values don't actually come from a normal distribution. They come from some different distribution that obeys this absolute limit. So we cannot use techniques based on normal distribution here because of this, okay? Now, um, this is similar to the second condition, which are extreme non-normal distributions. So we have, for instance, the power distribution and the Cauchy distribution. They are very non-normal. And if you try to apply normal methods on this, you're gonna get wrong results. Now, both of these cases, we still have standard numerical data. Now, in some experiments, we have what we call ordinal data. So ordinal data is data that we can compare and compare it by some criteria, but we cannot apply traditional algebra on it. And a very good example, we're gonna talk about, give a little bit more description later, is subjective scores. If you have some data, for instance, let's say that you're measuring an app, and this app, you're gonna rate, hate other people, and when you're rating them, you give them a score between one and five stars. Now, if you give it to, this, to many people, and they start to give one to five star scores to people. Well, first we have this absolute limit that we we're talking before. We have no value lower than zero stars and no value higher than five stars. So this already indicates that uh, maybe a normal distribution is not a very good fit here. But more than that, what is the difference between five stars and four stars? What is the difference between four stars and three stars? If I'm counting seconds, okay, four seconds is double of two seconds is four stars double than two stars? Is someone that received, like if you rate up an application with four stars, is that application two times as good as an application with two stars? Well, no, that makes no sense, right? Because this is ordinal data, this is not numerical data. You cannot apply algebra here and expect the values to make sense. So this is a problem. And finally, we have completely no numerical data. In some cases, we don't, because you, you can still say that four stars is better than two stars. You cannot say that it's two times as, as good as two stars, but you can say it's better. But what if you're testing for colors? You want to see if people wear more blue shirts or red shirts or white shirts, and your data is blue, red, white. Now your data is not even numeric. You cannot even say blue is bigger than red, red is bigger than white. So you have a problem here. So you have to think about how you're gonna deal with this data.
So let's see some examples. We're not still, we're not see all the examples to do all of this, but we're gonna see some of this. Okay, so let's talk about sources, how this non-normal data search uh, appear, right? So random processes in nature. So when we look at the nature and we see random process for nature, like a plant growing or shell forming or height in animals or size of animals, it's interesting that we often see this random process follow our normal distribution, okay? Uh, on the other hand, we, there are many random artificial processes that do not follow this normal distribution. For example, if we go to computer programs uh, and from computer programs that use random number generators, most times these random number generators will use a uniform distribution. We say, give me some value between one and a hundred, give me some value between zero and one. And you say, okay, uh, I'm using, I'm, I have a game here and this game will generate values between zero and one. And every time this value is above 0 0.7, my character takes some damage, okay? So this is a uniform distribution. A uniform distribution is not a normal distribution. However, because of the CLT, the, the central limit theorem that we studied before, if we do many samplings from the normal distribution and we average these samplings, the result will be approximately normal for very small numbers of samples. Like if we sample, we get a, a uniform distribution and we sample three or four times, the sampling mean, the, the, the distribution of the sampling mean will actually be quite close to normal, okay? On the other hand, there are some distributions that are much farther away. And one of them is the power distribution, which is a distribution that happens very often. It happens when we're talking about for salaries, as we said before, and also it's a distribution that happens when talking about social networks. So in these cases, um, we're gonna have these binomial or power distributions that are very far away from normal. So it's important to know what kind of situations uh, they will uh, generate these non-normal distributions. So just going ahead. Now, another case is, like I said before, uh, the cases of uh, subjective values. So this is, oh, there's a name for those data, it's called Likert data. So Likert data is the data that you often see collected from surveys and interview questions, usually composed of some multiple questions to say, oh, um, I like ice cream, and you have to mark strongly agree or strongly disagree. And like we said before, uh, these data will not be normal because first, values beyond the minimum and maximum value, they have no meaning. And algebra also has no meaning. Like we said about four stars being double two stars. And here also, if you have neutral and disagree, what is neutral plus disagree? You cannot do algebra on these values, okay? Now, uh, when our data is not normal, what can we do? There are some strategies uh, that we can think about uh, to when our data is not normal. And the first strategy, surprising a lot, is just to do nothing. So for instance, we can remove some outliers that break the normality, as we saw in the first example, or we can also trust that our test will be robust enough for small deviations of normality. And for many cases, uh, this is actually quite enough. Uh, like we saw, I think, in the very first example of a t-test, uh, if, if the data has some deviation for normality, then that's fine. Of course, this is some deviation from normality. It's not like completely no normal data or even, even no numerical data. If the data is like a data, doing a t-test on like a data does not make a lot of sense. Well, we can also transform the data. So there are some transformation techniques that can be used to get a data that is not normal and transform it into normal data. And finally, as we saw in the first example of this lecture, uh, we can also use non-parametric testing. So non-parametric testing are, are statistical tests that do not make the assumptions of normality on the sampling distribution. And there are more solutions. So that if your data has some special characteristics, it's worth looking for a statistics book that will guide you on how to perform the data or even talk to a statistics professional. Uh, different tests require different, different experiments, require different tests, require different statistics. So make sure that you know uh, what data you're dealing with and what are its characteristics. 
So let's talk a little bit about transformations. So for instance, uh, transformations are just apply some function to the data. So we can have, for example, the, nor the log transformation. If we have some data that follows a log normal distribution like this, if we apply the log to a log normal distribution, the values will follow a normal distribution, okay? This is how you would apply. So we can get the R norm, a random normal, and we can take Y will be the log of C, and we can do the log transformation, right? So if we do the exp uh, exponential of normal, we're gonna have Z is a log normal distribution. And if we take the log of C, we have a normal distribution with mean y and standard deviation, okay? Now, uh, another transformation that we have is when the data has a lot of skew. So skew uh, is when the data has a bigger error to one side than to the other. So for instance, if we have some data like this, and our mean is here, when we have a smaller uh, error here, but a larger error here, in cases like this, we can use a uh, transformation to remove the skew of the data. The skew can shift the location of the norm, the mean, in relation to based on the error. So it can cause standard statistical tests to give wrong results. So if the data is skewed to the left, we can do a square root transformation or a cube root transformation, and the data will go back to a normal with the same error on both sides. If the data is skewed to the right, we can do something like a square root transformation with a constant or a cube transformation with a constant. And then these roots, like um, the logarithm, like if we have negative data, we're gonna have no defined results. So we might have to add some constants here, okay? So this would transform the data and allows us to work our statistics on the transformed data. However, uh, it's important that when you transform the data and you do the statistics on the transformed data, your results are referred to the transformed data. So when you report these results on your paper or when you are describing making a plot, you must make it clear that you did the analysis on the transformed data. That might influence how people uh, um, understand uh, your results. So for instance, um, any transformation that you do on the data needs to be explained in your experimental design section of the paper or your report. Experimental design, we collect the data, we apply this transformation, and then we do this test on the transformed data. And when you discuss the results, you must go back to the original data. Like if A is bigger than B by some, 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 some certain delta that you decide, define it, what does this delta mean when you transform the data back to its standard values, okay? So if you're saying that, okay, my result was at least this much difference, this was my uh, result of practical significance, this practical significance must be reported in the original data, not the transformed data. Just to give an example, if we do the, the, the mean of the log normal distribution includes the variance, so if we, however, when we do a transform it, when we take the log of that, the mean of the normal does not include the value of the variance. So in this case, uh, the new hypothesis on the transformed data will not be valid if the variance is not the same, because when you transform back, it will include the variance in the mean, okay? So you need to be careful when you are interpreting transformed data. Uh, another technique for, trans for obtaining normal distributions is to use bootstrapping. So bootstrapping is, in statistic is a procedure used to obtain an approximation of the sample mean distribution. Remember that when we were doing the analysis of the t-test in the third class, we said that the, the statistical test works on the sample mean distribution, which is the distribution of means of the sample, the distribution of the mean estimator. We estimated the mean of the population by taking the mean of the sample, and we, our test was about the, uh, the sampling mean, okay? 
and we can extract the sampling mean, the sampling distribution from the uh, from our uh, from our data. So, following the properties of the central limit theorem, uh, we can we can we know that this, the sample mean distribution will usually follow a normal distribution, even when the underlying distribution of the observations is not normal. So, what does that mean? So, what is the bootstrapping procedure? So, this is the bootstrapping procedure. First we take an initial sample with M, M observations. So this is the sample from our experiment. Now, from these M observations, we create N bootstrap samples. So we have our initial experiment with our sample with size M. And for each of these, we have N bootstrap samples. And for each of these samples, we have MB. So we have smaller resamples. And using these bootstrap resamples, we can do our bootstrap mean with the bootstrap distribution, which will follow a normal. Okay, so if we calculate the mean of each of these bootstrap samples, we this mean we're going to follow a bootstrap distribution, which will be approximately normal. Let's see a clear example here. So this is, uh, we're doing bootstrap here using the boot package in R. So the boot package does bootstrapping. It calculates confidence intervals of bootstrap. It does statistical uh, tests, the t-test and the z-test on bootstrap. So you can study this, the, this package to learn how to do all these things. Right now, we're gonna focus on just uh, the analysis of the uh, of creating the bootstrap sample. So here we have the city data set that measures, um, I forgot right now, but I think it's the density of the population, the size and the number of people or the, uh, the number of people and some occurrence in the city. But what matters is that we have two values, U and X, and our value of interest is U divided by X. So here we are calculating the ratio that is u divided by x. And here is the value of this ratio. And you can see here that this is not a normal distribution, okay? We can take the, we can have one extremely high value and a bunch of values that follow what seems to be a uh, uniform distribution. So this is not normal. However, we can take the bootstrap. So by taking the bootstrap, we take the sample and we take 1000 resamplings of this and we calculate the average of each of these resamples, okay? And when we do that, we see that our bootstrap distribution follows a normal distribution, okay? So the bootstrap distribution can be used to generate a normal distribution from a non-normal data set. Of course, the same thing for the other transformations apply. You need to be clear, careful by describing that your statistical analysis is done on the bootstrap distribution and not on the regular distribution. All right. Now, <clears throat> what if we cannot or we don't want to transform the data? In that case, we can use non-parametric tests. The idea of non-parametric tests is that they use statistics. Remember, statistics means functions on the data. So they use functions on the data that do not assume the normality of the population distribution. Uh, so when we have a test that assumes fewer things, these tests, they are usually weaker, okay? So we have weak assumptions. The weakest, if we assume less things, if we say, okay, any distribution can work on this test, this test will usually be less stronger. So non-parametric tests are usually less strong than parametric ones. Less strong means that uh, they will detect uh, smaller, they will be less sensitive to differences, and they will give us less information about the differences that we detect, okay? So for the, the, the non-parametric test, we have three uh, very classical tests. Uh, these are the uh, Wilcoxon signed rank test, which is a test for one sample. And then we have the Wilcoxon rank sum test that is for two samples. And we have the Kruskal-Wallis test that is for multiple samples. 
And we have not yet studied multiple samples, so we're not going to see this here. We're going to go back to the Kruskal Wallis test when we studied uh, tests with uh, statistics with multiple samples. Okay. So uh, let's see about the Wilcoxon test. So the idea of the Wilcoxon test is that we want to calculate this U statistic, and the U statistic will give us the relationship between the positions. So the U statistic is about the positions of two values. So here we have two samples, okay? So we have the blue sample and the red sample, and we can see that the blue sample is ahead of every red sample. The second blue sample is ahead of two red samples, uh, is behind two red samples. The third blue sample is behind the three red samples, and the fourth blue sample is behind four blue samples, four blue. So our idea is, if we take the red and the blue, who is ahead of the other more often? Okay, so we just want to know the relative position of these two. If both samples come from the same distribution, then they would be ahead of each other an equal number of times. However, if one of these distributions is more ahead of the other, we're gonna see a shift between the order of the two samples. And the U statistic calculates this shift, okay? So how do we calculate this? First, we calculate u and u prime. So we have u is this order, and u prime is u plus u prime is equal to the size of sample one times the size of sample two. So u is nine, we calculate the zero plus two plus three plus four, that's nine. However, we have a total of four on one and five or two, so this is 20. So u, u prime is u, plus u prime equals to 20. So nine plus u prime is 20, so u prime is 11. So first, to calculate the statistic for the man with the test, the first thing we do is that we choose the smaller value. So between nine and 11, the smaller one is nine. Now our new hypothesis is that both samples come from the same distribution. And if both samples come from the same distributions, for a big enough n1 and n2, u, will follow a normal distribution. So we calculate this value of u, and although the, although the samples do not follow the normal distribution, this u that we calculated will follow a normal distribution. So u will follow a normal distribution with mean n1 times n2 divided by two, so in this case with mean 10, and variance n1 times n2 uh, times n1 plus n2 plus 1 divided by 2. So we can calculate this variance and we can calculate this mean. Now, when we have this normal distribution, we can just calculate the z statistic and we do a z test of u with this distribution. Then we have the same statistics. So we can see here, we, when we have a norm normal, we calculate a statistic that follows a normal distribution and we use the traditional tests that we already know. Now, the Wilcoxon sign rank test is when we have a paired data. So if the data is unpaired, we compare everyone against everyone. When the data is paired, so we have two groups, let's say uh, weights or heights, okay? And these are paired. Let's say that it's the same people doing two different treatments before and after. And now what we do is that we compare plus and minus. So in here, the second group is bigger than the first one. So that's a plus. Here, the second group is a smaller, so that's a minus. So that's a minus, that's a plus, that's a plus, that's a minus. So the Wilcoxon sign rank test will take the relative difference of pairs, how many plus and how many minuses we have. And the new hypothesis here is that the positive signs and the negative signs are equally likely. On the other hand, uh, so here we're gonna compare the number of signs against a binomial distribution under the new hypothesis. So if we want to do the, uh, the, the SIG test, we can go straight to R. So here we have uh, these X and Ys are Hamilton and Wolf Hamilton data. So it's Hamilton depression scale. So there are nine people that they had in the first visit to the psychologist, uh, or to the therapist, they give their uh, depression score. And in the second visit to the therapist, they give the, 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 their uh, the depression score. 
So they compare the depression score before and before the first visit and before the second visit, and they want to see if the therapy is having some success. So for each of them, they see if they improved or if they did not improve. So here we have the Wilcox test with X and Y, and we say it's paired because it's the same patient. And the alternative is that we want to see if the score becomes bigger. And when we see this, we see that the value is V is 30 and we are value is 0, 1. So we have a true location shift that the second value uh, becomes uh, bigger. Okay? Sorry, uh, this first value is bigger. Okay? So to summarize this lecture, um, we can test for when we can test for equality. So if we want to test equality for two conditions, we test equality by establishing or minus delta and or plus delta. And we want to see if our experiment, if our sample is above, we test if the sample is above the minus delta and we test if the sample is below the plus delta. For no normality, there are several different cases, such as outliers, data limits, ordinal data. And for small cases of no normality, we can just remove outliers or do a small transformation. If when we do transformation, we have bootstrapping. Bootstrapping is a good general technique for transformation. Uh, and if the transformation is not feasible, we can use non-parametric tests such as the Wilcoxon rank sum or the, uh, the Wilmet Mayu test to calculate the uh, changes in the central value of the data. So that finishes our class for today. I just want, I have one last thing to talk to you about. So if you remember from our um, schedule, our next class uh, will be a question and answer. So I would like to sit down with all of you who are taking this course. And I would like to have a session where you can ask me questions and I can answer the questions. I want also to talk a little bit about your report. So I like to review the reports and show what the reports did right and talk about some common mistakes. Um, and also our TA will give an example of how you use the tests that we already we have already discussed on a real experiment in his research. So I would like everyone to participate, remi reminding you that our lecture happens from Friday. It will be next Friday, uh, 3.15 3 to about 6. Okay, uh, we can finish it early if there are not enough questions, uh, but everyone please come at this time. Now this lecture will take the shape of a Zoom meeting. Uh, I will give you the information about the Zoom meeting on Manaba, so please uh, follow uh, the meeting. Uh, I'm sorry for those of you who are uh, following on YouTube, uh, but I don't know when you're seeing this, this video, so maybe it, it's already like many weeks after this, this class was given. But if you have questions, you can always send me a message or a comment. Okay, so I will send you the details for the meeting and I see you uh, next week. So our, and here is some recommended reading. So I really, uh, would really like to suggest that if you want to know more about the quality testing or about uh, non-parametric testing, you take a good look. All of these texts are relatively short, uh, maybe four, five, six pages. Um, so it, some of them say why you should transform, some of them say when you should not transform. So I really recommend that you do some extra reading for this class. Thank you very much. And I see you uh, next week. Bye-bye. Hello everyone, uh, this is Klaus Aranha for the University of Tsukuba and this is topic 8 of the experiment design for computer science. Uh, today we're going to talk about multiple comparisons, uh, especially ANOVA and post hoc testing. Uh, now, uh, in this first video I will actually do some housekeeping regarding the course. So as you know, last week we did not, uh, I did not uh, publish the lecture video, I canceled the lecture. So we're going to have a small change in the schedule. Also, there was an extension for grades report. So I will also talk about that. And I will talk a little bit about like, uh, what is the third report and how we're going to do grading and um, some interesting, uh, insightful 
um, topics that I saw on social media this week. Uh, if you want to go straight to the lecture topic on Innova and post hoc testing, you might want to skip to the next video, although this one should be should not be a very long one. Okay, so um, let's see. So about the new schedule. So last week we did not have the lecture, and at the same time there was an extension for a grade uh, deadline. Uh, so uh, I will restructure the rest of our lecture as follows. So today we're doing the lecture topic eight, multiple comparisons. Uh, that will be the class in the next video that I will publish all together with this one. Next week, we will talk about the topic that I was going to talk about last week, which is calculation of sample sizes. And these will be the last two topics of the of our course. And then on 627, I will hold a second uh, open, oh, sorry, 627 is a Saturday. So according to the university calendar, we should have lectures on 626, a Friday, and 627, a Saturday. And honestly, I don't think that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I am going to use the 73, which was supposed to, to be the final examination that we're not going to have anyway. And I will hold an open question session. So instead of having the lecture on Saturday, we're gonna have the final lecture on 7.3. And on 7.3, at the regular time, 3, 3, uh, 3 to 6, uh, you can come here on, I will open a Zoom talk with everyone like I did last time, I'll post the details to Manaba. And you can come and ask questions about multiple comparisons. You can ask questions about sample sizes. Uh, you can ask questions about anything else that you want. The last time we did an open question session, it was very popular. Uh, lots of people had interesting questions. You can also ask about your uh, third, uh, the third report. I expect that I will have finished grading the second report. By then, I, I don't promise, sorry. But if I have, you can also ask questions about the second report and the third report. The deadline for submission of the third report is July 20th. So I'm giving you a lot of time, a month, so that you can also finish the report for the other le uh, lectures. And also, uh, you're gonna have a lot of time to ask me questions. Uh, there were two students who showed me their reports for report two and got feedback on them. And honestly, if you want to do that, I say that's great. Ask me some feedback for your report if you want. I will be happy to give you some feedback. And the grades will should be announced on July 26. And I will give you a little bit of time to ask questions about the grades before they are registered on Twins. Okay? <clears throat> if you have any questions about this, uh, it's better if you ask on Manaba. Okay? All right, the second announcement is about the third report. So the idea is that the third report is like the first and the second one. You have to do an experiment, you have to collect data, you have to analyze that data using the techniques that we're going to discuss in these lectures, and you have to write a report. And you submit that report, the data, the script with your analysis, just like the first two reports. Now, report three, there are two uh, characteristics for report three. Uh, I, uh, different from report one and two, in report three, I want you to use calculations of sample sizes. So until now, we just assumed that we had enough samples, but we did not use any technique to say, okay, I need exact, uh, this, number of, this number of observations to guarantee that my experiment has this much power and this much confidence. Next lecture, I'm going to be talking exactly about that. And I want you to use some of the techniques in the next lecture to calculate the number of samples for your experiment. Also, um, I want you to use some sort of comparison of multiple samples, which is the topic for this lecture. So you have to think about in your experiment, how can you use multiple samples? And feel free to talk to me about that if you are not very sure if you want to exchange some ideas. Now, about the grading, originally I was expecting, uh, before we had corona and everything, I was expecting that we would have some time after the third report so that I would say, okay, if you want to improve your grade, you can resubmit one of your reports. That was my original plan. But because of the general delay of uh, calendar for this class and for all the other classes, 
I decided to scrap that plan. So instead of, well, of course, I don't want to create to, um, how do you say, to cause a problem to the students. So instead of resubmitting one of the reports as which was my original idea, what I'm gonna do is that for this year, uh, I will grade your two best, so you're submitting three reports, I will grade the best two, okay? So you have report one, two, and three, I will give a grade for the three of them, but your final grade will be the average of your best two reports. So if your best reports are the first one and the second one, I'll take the average of that. If your first report was not very good, but your second you improved for the second one and you improve for the third one, I'm going to take the average of that. That said, even though I would take the average of the two reports with the best grades, you still need to submit all three reports. If you don't submit one of the reports, I will not I will calculate the grade as before. So please submit all the three reports. Okay? Do an effort. <clears throat> okay. Uh, the third announcement is not related to this course but it's related to the topics in computational science course. So some of you might have seen that in the computational computer science for English uh, um, list of courses, there is this course, Topics in Computational Sciences, which is an intensive course for how to see, for Spring C. Uh, this course is a uh, intensive course that covers several topics. So every year, uh, we have different professors coming and giving short talks for this course. And I have finally contacted all the professors and I, ha I, I have asked this course to be registered on Twins. So when you see this video, you should be able to go to Twins and check the course code. And as you can see, the course code is here on the top. It's either uh, 0AL5402 for those of you who enter the, um, enter the program this year and 01CH751 for those of you who are second year master students. Okay, we had like a change in codes as some of you know. Uh, the new code for this course is this. The old code for this course is this. So the idea of this course is that it is a colloquium. Uh, this means that we're gonna have five professors and each professor will talk about one of different topics. So Professor Adam Jantot from the University of, from Kyoto University, will talk about information access and knowledge extraction from news archives. And that's really interesting. That was a really interesting talk. I saw his talk last year. He was in this course last year too. Professor Stephen Turnbull, that he is here from Tsukuba, but he's from Shako, not from computer science. And he's gonna talk about modeling and especially important in this year now with many different models that are have been done for the COVID pandemic and what we can learn about those. Uh, Professor Yeshu Kai, she is from the computer science department. She's going to talk about clustering, so different ways of doing clustering and how you can apply that. Uh, here there's a typo here, okay. Professor Simona, she is going to give this course the first time for, our, for, for us and she's going to talk about test case generation which is very important for all of you who are going to do big, um, <clears throat> uh, big softwares for your ex for your uh, courses for your research, and Professor Baku Kumar will talk about bioinformatics, which is how we use computer science to um, find new uh, new data about biology. So, different professors, different research topics. I highly recommend that you do this course to have a broader view of what is science, okay? Uh, if you cannot find this course on Twins, uh, let me know, I uh, will check to see, but it should be already available when you see this video. Finally, um, the last two videos, I did not include uh, the research top, so I decided to do it again for this one. And there were uh, three news I saw on social media this week that remind me of something that I like to tell the students. And it's a question for you. Have you ever tried to Google your own name? So maybe you want to pause the video and try right now. If you Google your own name, what comes up? So all of you are uh, master students. Uh, you are entering um, the academia. You are entering uh, the world of science. And 
one thing that I always tell my own st the students that I supervise is that it's important to have to make sure that you control your online presence. What does that mean? That means uh, making your own web page or um, <clears throat> uh, participating in social media in scientific circles, maybe doing videos or doing blogs. So anyway, having an online presence to tell the world, hey, I'm this person and I'm doing this research and I'm really interested about this, okay? And, and why is that important? Well, um, in, today, uh, a lot of search science goes online. I mean, probably when you look for papers, you're gonna look uh, online for papers on your topic. And <clears throat> this class right now, you're taking it online. For those of you uh, who came from outside of the University of Scuba, you probably checked the Scuba University webpage. Maybe you check the webpage of the professor who is your supervisor right now, I guess. So when you choose your professor, you looked online and you found the page of, your, of the laboratory. And you think, okay, right now I'm consuming. I'm checking the webpage of the university. I'm checking the webpage of my professor. I'll check the webpage of this course. But as you advance, in your professional life or in your academic life. Uh, this balance will be from you looking up, looking for information about other people to other people looking for information about you. So maybe someone is looking for a reviewer uh, and, they, and you can sh show up on the search as, oh, this is a person that reviews, the, that, that, that works on this area. Or maybe uh, there's someone looking for a collaborator. Maybe you're, uh, uh, they want to know, oh, I'm looking for someone who studies modeling using deep neural networks. And if that's your topic and you put that on your web page and they search for that keywords, they'll come for you to ask for your opinion on the research. This has happened to me three or four years ago. Uh, there was a research in the UK that was looking for um, black box optimization of modeling and he came across my web page he sent me a message and we talked and we not, right now we're doing a collaboration for the last three four years um <clears throat> you eventually will want maybe you will gonna want you want to apply to a grant or a student grant like a dc grant or maybe you want to apply for like a grant for a company and if you have a web page where you have your papers and your research activities and your thoughts uh, people say, oh, this person actually is doing some work. Uh, this is what she looks like uh, when she's doing research, okay? So, uh, yeah, th there is this opinion that I think it put it very succinctly, very similar, like um, it gives, make a personal research page, it gives you an opportunity to introduce yourself as you want to be seen and to frame your publication list. And this is important, like um, if you, even if you don't worry about, if you don't, <clears throat> make your online presence, uh, Google will do it for you. Uh, there are several web crawlers that list uh, people, like Google Scholar, for example, list people by their research. So if you look your name and if you have a kind of unique name and not many people have the same name as you, but you don't have a web page, if you look, search for Google, it will probably find your Google Scholar page. And there is a list of papers, but it doesn't say, okay, but what does this person research? What, is, what, are, what are the goals of these scientists? Okay. So, <clears throat> so, okay, so what should you do? Okay, so you think, okay, maybe I need to think about my web presence. What do you do? Is this complicated? Actually, it's not very complicated. Okay. Uh, you already, as a computer science student, you have a account uh, on the university web server so if you take a look at the manual for your email there is also how to update your personal web page somewhere in there um, so you can have a web page in the university web page and, and and that already gives a lot of credibility uh, it gives you a lot of, of credibility for your web page um, and it doesn't need a lot of content I, I was thinking about it and I mean a very simple yet effective web page for a master student in the first year would be add your institution and position so like i am i am x i am a master student at y lab and then make, make a la link for your laboratory at the university of scuba then you make a link for university of scuba maybe i don't know add your either your picture or maybe a logo that identify yourself that's not super necessary uh, maybe some image 
Like if you're researching neural networks, maybe add an image of a brain there or something like that. Uh, your research agenda. So what is a research agenda? It's, it's just a small paragraph that says, I am studying X and Y. In the future, I want to make Z happen. And this is important. This X and Y is what you're studying right now. And that will be kind of summarizing the papers that you write, the, the classes that you take. But this is actually more interesting, especially for if you want to, uh, for recruiters. Like, what do you want to do? Why are you studying what you're studying right now? Okay, how do you want to change the world? So that's good, something that is good to put in your personal web page. And of course, uh, maybe a few research achievements. So if you have some articles, even if it's just local, um, <clears throat> local presentations, put a list of the things that you do. If you have not published anything yet, but maybe you have some archive publications that you want to put in there, that's fine as well. Or even if you just have like a GitHub account that you write there, just having that may get other people to know, oh, okay, this person writes code from time to time, or maybe uh, you go to some social media, maybe Twitter or Facebook, and just write your opinions. Oh, I think this research is great. Oh, I read this nice paper. It puts you into the conversation, okay? It's important to be part of the conversation. Science is a community, and <clears throat> by putting like this, this position of yourself in the map, uh, your opinions, like I wrote here, your opinions about science are super important. Maybe you are someone who uh, boosts other people. Maybe you are someone who criticizes other people. So having your, having your own, learning to make your own voice is super important, especially if you want to stay in academia, okay? Okay, but we're on a experiment design classes, right? So is this just opinion? Well, actually, and what motivated me to write this was this paper that there, there was this paper that was uh, announced on on the so on social media this week it's jessica luck and others i think there's about eight or seven authors for this paper this is from the annals of thoracic surgery so this is a, a medical journal uh very uh, published very recently there is a link here you can click on the link to read the entire paper it's not very long but the idea basically is that they wanted to see what was the influence of social media on the cita citation rate of papers? So the idea is that if you put a paper on social media that was in a journal, how it, well, some people believe that it might get more notice, it might get, might get more attention, might have, get more citations, but in concrete terms, in actual numbers, what is the difference? And that's what they wanted you to do. And they also wanted to do something a little bit more rigorous. So they tried a large number of papers. So they took 112 papers from this journal. So these are all papers from this journal that had not, did not, did not have yet um, a social media presence. And, and this is important. They did, they did a random sample. So <clears throat> they got the 112 papers and in, the, in, the, in, in this paper, they describe how they selected these papers. And they select half of it randomly uh, half of it they would put they, they would announce these papers in a large account with 50,000 followers and the other half they would not do that so they did this for a year for one year every <clears throat> every week sorry every day they would announce one of the papers on the social media account and that happened in 2018 and then the following year they measure the number of citations as well as other metrics for the papers that were cited. And the results uh, you can see here, uh, the papers that were tweeted, they had on average three citations in this year, in the year 2018. The papers that were not tweeted, they had on average 0 0.7 citations. Uh, this was so there are 52 papers in this group and 52 papers in this group so this was very interesting <clears throat> uh, a lot of people discuss these results and this is something that i think for you okay you hear about this what do you think what's the thing that comes to your mind there were many people some people were saying oh okay so 
this is important. I need to tweak my papers more. Other people should, well, were saying, oh, okay, that means that we should try to reduce the number, the attention because social media does not say how good a paper is. And other people were saying, okay, this shows how important it is to make sure that people who do not have good networks are raised, are like boosted <clears throat> by accounts from journals and societies. So journals and societies are responsible for maybe trying to bring attention to papers because if you are a very famous scientist, you have a, a big follower, you can increase your number of citations just by using your big follower count. But if you don't have a big, if you're a small scientist, maybe you need someone to help you there. Um, so there were many different opinions. So I encourage you to read this paper. Uh, also because it has some very nice uh, experiment design. They describe really carefully how they collected the data, how they selected the papers, how they did the analysis, uh, what were the parameters of the experiment. So from that point of view, I also recommend this paper. And also to think about what does it mean? What does it mean that uh, social media has such a large influence in the number of citations that papers get? Remember that this was random. It was not like the good papers that were uh, announced. It was randomly. They did not they did not choose the papers by quality. <clears throat> okay, so now I'll stop this video, and on the next video we're going to start talking about multiple comparisons, the topic for this class. See you there. Hello everyone, uh, this is Klaus from the University of Tsukuba and this is Experiment Design for Computer Science, Topic 8, Multiple Comparisons. So in this video, we're going to talk... So until now, in the previous videos, we always talked about um, exper uh, ana statistical analysis where you had two samples that maybe came from the same population, maybe they came from different population, and you want to make a comparison between them. Well, in this video, we're gonna talk about a different situation. The situation that we're going to talk about is the following. Uh, imagine that we have multiple samples, more than two, three, four, five samples, and maybe some of those samples came from different populations, Maybe all of the samples come from the same population. And you want to test uh, a hypothesis made based on a parameter of these populations. Where could this happen? Let me give you two examples. One example that is very common is uh, parameter tuning. So parameter tuning is when we want to test multiple settings of a different parameter. For example, uh, let's say that you're testing a neural network and you want to test one of the hyperparameters of the neural network. Should this network, for instance, should this network have two, three, or four layers? So you do one experiment with two layers, one experiment with three layers, and one experiment with four layers. And you want to compare these results. So you have three samples. How do you compare three samples? Okay. Another is a comparison of multiple algorithms. Let's say that you propose a new algorithm for uh, black box optimization. And for the problem that you are studying, there are four algorithms that are the state of art. And you want to compare your algorithm against all these four algorithms. So what do you do? Okay, so in the t-test that we studied last lecture, it can be used for hypotheses about one or two samples. So how do we do with these test cases where we have more than two samples? Think about it for a second before advancing. So, one way that we see many, sometimes in the literature, but is a wrong approach, is to do multiple pairwise testing. So, for instance, let's say that we have six methods, A, B, C, D, E. So, in the paper, they will do a series of t-tests. So, they will do a t-test of A against B, a t-test of A against C, a t-test of A against D, a t-test of A against E, etc., etc., etc. What is the problem with that? What is the problem of having this big table with t-tests all over the place? Okay. Well, remember that each time that you do a hypothesis test, 
this hypothesis test will have a type one error. So when you say, oh, I did my t-test and my p-value was 0 0.001, uh, that means that you have 0 0.001 chance of having a uh, type one error. So when you set your confidence, in, your confidence value of the test to be alpha equal to 0 0.05, it means that even if your test is statistically significant, there's still a 5% chance that the new hypothesis might be true. If you think about how probabilities work, if you have independent events and you start to repeat them over and over and over and over, uh, the probabilities, they compound by multiplying against each other. Let's see an example. Let's say that you do one test with alpha equal to 0 0.05. If you get, if you reject the new hypothesis, you have a 0 0.05 chance of being wrong, of having a type 1 error which is what we wanted in the first place. However, if you do two tests, A versus B and A versus C, now there's a chance that the first test is wrong and there's a chance that the second test is wrong. What is the chance that you did not get a type one error? Well, it will be one minus 0 0.95 times 0 0.95. So the chance of not having a type one error when you have two tests is 0 0.09. What if you have six tests? If you have six tests, now your chance is even more compounded. You have one minus 0 0.95 times 0 0.95 times 0 0.95, six times. And your compound type one error rate is now 0 0.26. So now you have one in four chances of having a type one error in your experiment. That's getting pretty big. What if you have 20 tests? If you have 20 tests, the chance of a type one error becomes 0 0.64. Can this happen? Well, actually it's, it's not very hard, okay? There is this, um, I will show you this uh, cartoon, which kind of illustrates the point. And if you don't know XKCD, I highly recommend it. It's very nice, anyway. So, here we have a situation where one person is saying, she's saying, oh, maybe jelly beans cause acne, and they decide to do an experiment to test. So, the scientist did an, did an experiment to say, oh, no, no, we did not find any relationship between jelly beans and acne, and the result was statistically significant. Okay, great, let's go back to play some games. Except that she goes, no, no, wait, wait. Maybe it's only a certain color. Maybe it's only, uh, it's one of the colors that call, cause acne. The others don't cause. So they decide to test all of the colors. So they start to test purple, and then they start brown, and then they start pink, and then they start blue, and then they start teal, salmon, red, turquoise, magenta, tan, cyan, green, lilac, black, peach, orange. They test all of them, except that <clears throat> when they test, uh, the green jelly beans, their experimental results gives a p-value of under 0 0.005. So they found a statistically significant link between green jelly beans and acne. Whoa, right? So you got your paper and you got the news. Green jelly beans cause acne and you have 95% confidence. Well, can you see the problem here? Okay, it's like you're trying every time you're doing an experiment and every time you have a chance for this to happen, okay? So if you keep repeating your experiments over and over and over, there is a small chance that you're gonna get a type one or a type two errors and you don't want that. Okay, so what can you do? There are specific techniques that we can use to avoid uh, this kind of problems in experiments involving multiple comparisons. In this lecture, I will explain one of these techniques, which is using the ANOVA, the analysis of variance, okay? The ANOVA is a statistical test that detects differences in sets of samples. So we're gonna work with a set of sample and we're gonna build a statistical model that will test if in that set of sample, 
if there is at least one sample inside of that set that is different from the others. In other words, if there is at least one sample from the set that does not come from the same population as the others do. Okay? Uh, after we do the ANOVA, we know that in the set of samples that we are studying, there is at least one that is different, but we don't know which one. So to know which one, we do what is called a post hoc comparison. And we're going to see what is a post hoc comparison. We're going to see some types of post hoc comparisons and how we add post hoc comparisons in our experiment design. Okay, of course, the, this is not the only way to deal with multiple samples. Uh, it's just one example. And you want to study uh, your particular case to see what would be the best way to deal with multiple observations in the case that you're in the, in the type of experiment that you're trying to do. Okay, let's get into it. Okay, so let's start with an example. Okay, so uh, we're gonna examine an example where we have a paper manufacturing operation. And in this paper manufacturing operation, we want to know which material is the best material to use for paper, for paper production. So let's say that we are interested in creating paper that has the highest possible tensile strength. In other words, tensile strength is the, uh, the ability of the paper of not getting sheared up. And that's very important for industrial paper. Okay? So, of course, paper is made of wood. So it makes sense to imagine that depending on the type of wood, uh, the, tensile, the tensile strength might change. So we're going to test several different woods and we're going to try to figure out if any of these woods is superior to the others based on the tensile strength, okay? So in this case, we were using a pilot plant, which means that we're using a special factory that is going to be used just for this experiment, okay? So let's say that we have a limited budget to do this, we don't have unlimited, uh, we don't have unlimited resources. So we, we are limited in the number of experiments that we can do. So for each kind of paper, for each kind of wood that we're going to test, we can only create six observations. We can only create six, um, six packages. So we generate six packages of paper for each type of wood. We calculate the average tensile strength for each of the six packages of paper, and we use that as our four samples, okay? So with these assumptions, we say that our experiment has one factor, okay? Wood fiber. So this is what changes in our experiment, the type of wood. It's the same factory, same number of samples. We have one thing that changes, that is the type of wood that is used as material for the paper. And we have four levels. Okay, because we have four types of wood. Wood type A, wood type B, wood type C, and wood type D. Now, for each of these four levels, we have six replicates. So we have six observations for each kind of, of level. Six observations of A, six observations of B, six observations of C, etc. Now, the response variable will be the tensile strength of the paper. So this is the variable that we are interested. And uh, for instance, let's say that it's measured in kilo PA. And the team wants to know if any fiber type would lead to an increase of the mean TS value of the paper. So of course there is a variance in the production, but we want to know if on average is any of the, the types, of, types of wood better for guaranteeing a high PA. Now, like we said before, it's important that we want to know not only if the average is better, but we want to have a minimum effect of significance. So for this experiment, we're saying that the minimum difference that makes sense is five kilo PA. Any difference below that is too small to, to really matter. We just buy both types of paper and the differences are very small, okay? Now, uh, the upper estimate for the standard deviation of this process is six kilo PA. 
And the desired error levels are 0 0.1 for alpha, so we have a confidence of 90%, and 0 0.2 for beta, so we have a power of 80%. So <clears throat> it's good when we do the experiment. So we collect the data, we go for it for the factory, we produce six, um, six sets of paper from each type of wood, we randomize the production order, and we collect the data. So the, good, the idea is that first, before we do the analysis, we take a quick look at the data. So one way to do that is to draw the box plot of the six uh, plots. So we have here one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. And we are interested in seeing, so from looking at this, it looks like there is a difference, okay? It looks like there's a difference uh, between the different papers. We also observe, okay, that there is, a, there is a small variance, and we can see that paper type B has somewhat bigger variance, but it's not too much bigger than the others. So we're gonna do a test for this later, but it looks like for each type of paper, they have about reasonably similar um, vari variability. We also see that type C has one outlier here. This might, come this might become important later, maybe not. Okay, so now that we have the data, what is the statistical model that we're going to use? Remember that we built a statistical model in the last lecture. So we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to build a statistical model for our, uh, for our situation. Now remember that we have six observations of four types of papers. So we have 24 observations. And these observations, the value of these observations can be represented as yij. What is iyj? Well, we have the means model, which means that the yi, the value y of the observation i, is based on the mean i, okay, plus the error ij. Now i changes according to the paper. So i goes from one to four, paper one, paper two, paper three, paper four. And j changes according to the repetition. So we get one, two, three, four, five, six. So when we say that the value of the output of paper i repetition j, it's equal to the mean of paper i, and maybe these means are the same, we don't know yet, we are still thinking about how we're gonna model this, plus the error of that repetition, error of paper i repetition j. We can break this down, this is the means model, we can break this down as the effect model. So now the value of ij is the grand mean, is the general mean of the process, plus, uh, a, a, a change based on the type of the paper. So the, pa the type of the paper will increase or decrease the mean of the process, plus our error that is based for every repetition. So this would be the random error, this would be the influence of the paper type, and this would be the grand mean of the process, okay? So U is the overall mean, TI is the effect of the ith level, and EIJ is the residual, the error, okay? Now, uh, in the to think about the statistical tests, so we use the effects model. So we're going to use this effects model, and we're going to make some assumptions, okay, for the ANOVA. So we're going to so we use the effect model. We say that yij is the great mean plus the effect of paper i plus the air, the residual of paper i repetition j. Okay, so we have a levels and n repetitions, and we're going to say that this error is independently distributed, okay, like we said before, independent and identically distributed, and it's distributed following a normal distribution with mean zero and variance sigma. So we're gonna say that the residuals of the production, they follow a normal distribution, which is equivalent of the assumption of normality that we did on the last few classes. So a way to visualize the uh, the effects model that we described here is this. So we have the grand mean here, okay? And we have variation on the grand mean based on the effect. So this is the variation for paper one, this is the variation for paper two, this is the variation for paper three, this is the variation for paper four. And for each variation, we have some variation within the same paper type, 
from the uh, from the variance of the process itself. Okay, so now what we do? This is, will be very similar. So if you understood the lecture of unpaired uh, testing, this is very similar. So we are interested to see if any of the papers has an effect, if any of the paper types, if any of the materials has an influence on the mean, which means that we want to know if this Ti is different than zero for any type of paper. If Ti is zero for paper type I, this means that the mean of the paper is equal to the grand mean. But if Ti is different than zero for the paper type I, this means that paper type I has an effect that changes the mean of the process to the mean of that the paper type. And this, for this effect can be positive or negative. So we have two hypotheses. Hypothesis zero, the new hypothesis is that Ti is zero, so the effect is zero for every i in the number of factors, one, two, three, four. The alternate hypothesis is that there exists at least one Ti that is different from zero. So look here, new hypothesis is that all the Ti's are zero, and our alternate hypothesis is that at least one Ti is not zero. At least one Ti has an effect. At least one type of paper causes the mean of the population to change from this normal mean of the process. So this is the normal mean of the process. This is the mean of one type of paper that has a Ti that is different from zero. Okay? Now, if the data collection is done in a random order with constant experimental conditions, we describe this as a completely randomized design. So if you see, oh, this is a randomized design, this is what we're talking about. We have one factor, we change this factor, and we sample this factor from the system in a random order, and we expect that besides the factor that we are measuring, all the other effects don't have a big, uh, a big influence on the results. Okay. <clears throat> So this approach to modeling the mean effects is also known as the fixed effect models. And we're gonna talk about the mathematics of the fixed effect models uh, a little bit, okay? So this will allow us to test a hypothesis in a situation where the factor levels are defined by the experimental. So the inference will be done, we're gonna do inference over the mean values of each level. So for each level, we're gonna calculate the mean and we are going to do the inference on this. One thing that is important to know is that for this statistical test, for this statistical modeling, we cannot extend the results of this modeling for other levels. For instance, let's say that we have four levels, one, two, three, four for a parameter, and we do this analysis. This analysis will only be effective for one, two, three, four. It does not include level five that we do not test. This is because this, this, um, this analysis will be based on, on the interaction between these factors. If you add level five later, the interaction of level five with the other levels may change the result, okay? So if you, want, you cannot generalize the results of these uh, fixed effect models to other effects that you did not predict, that you did not add in the experiment, okay? There are, ways to deal with that, mixed effect models, uh, but we're not gonna see them in, in this class. Okay, so let's go back to the analysis. So we're gonna use the effects model, the fixed effects model to describe the statistical test. And remember, our new hypothesis was that uh, all Ti are zero. So the sum of Ti for Ti1 to A will be zero. That's our new hypothesis. T1 is zero, T2 is zero, T3 is zero, T4 is zero. Now, uh, if we think about the variability of the data, the total variability of the data, we can describe the total variability of the data as the sum of squares, okay? And what is the sum of squares? It's like we have the data for factor I, uh, observation J, and we can, see, we can subtract that 
from the, the uh, overall sample mean. So y bar is the, sample, is the mean of the entire sample from all the observations. Now, if we square this difference, this is the squared uh, deviation. And when we sum this over all a and all n, we have SST, which is the squared deviation, okay, of our, of our population. Now, if we break down the sum, we can divide our SST into two components. Component one is the levels. So this is the error of the levels. And component two, this is the error of the repetitions. Okay, so this is the variability of, that is, this is the part of the vari variability that is due to the difference in levels. And this is the part of the variability that is due to the uh, arbitrary errors. <clears throat> so uh, if we divide the sum of squares by the degrees of freedoms, we're going to have something called the mean square. Okay. Remember that the degree of freedom is the number of data that we got. So we're basically dividing the squared residuals by the number of samples, and that will be the MSE. Okay. So we have the mean square error, which is the sum of square errors divided by the number of uh, levels times the number of repetitions. Now, if we, we can generalize this for the mean square errors of the levels, and the mean square error of each level is the square error of each level divided by uh, the number of levels. The expected, the expected value for this is that the expected value for the mean square error is the sigma, is the, uh, <coughs> the variance of the population. And the, square, the expected value for the mean square error of each level is the sigma plus this factor that is the influence, the part of the variance that is because of the influence of the, 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 the parameter tau. Okay, so we have two expected values here. We have the mean square error that is alpha sigma g square, and we have the mean square for the levels that is sigma square plus this value. Okay? Uh, now, you notice that here we have an unbiased estimator, okay? The estimator can error for more or for minus, but it does not have a tendency to, 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 error, for, to error more for one side or the other. On the other hand, this error here, it's biased because it's biased by the size of the squared, uh, the, the, the error part that is responsible by tau. So the more that tau i the more that one of the factors influence the results, these expected mean square levels will be bigger, okay? So now this says that if we have an influence of the factors, uh, the, the, the expected values of mean square levels will be different, will be bigger than square level, the square value of uh, the, mean standard, uh, the mean squared error. However, if one of the tiles is different from zero, we're gonna have this extra factor that will increase the value of sigma square. So what this means is that if the null hypothesis is true, the mean square error is equal to the mean square of the levels, which is equal to sigma square. This is because all ti is zero. That was our null hypothesis. If the null hypothesis is not true, this sum is not zero and this equality will not hold. So, I guess you can see that to test for the ANOVA, we are going to test for the equality of these two errors. So even though we're going to say something about the means of the samples, the test will be done on the squared errors, on the variability of the samples. Okay, I find this to be a very interesting point. So uh, we're gonna define an F statistic. And F0 is the square, level, the square error, the mean square of the levels divided by the mean square error, okay? And this F statistic will be distributed according to a F distribution. So there's an F distribution that will, um, <clears throat> will describe the distribution of this fraction, okay? So we can define the degrees of freedom of F 
And just like in the T test or the Z test, we calculate a, a percentage of the cumulative distribution function that will fall, will fill, um, <clears throat> will fill a value equivalent to the interested um, um, confidence value for the test. Okay, so we calculate the percentile of FAAN and we compare that with the value of S0 to choose our critical region. Okay, so the end of the test is the same. The part that changes is the middle. We choose what is the statistic that we want, it's statistic F0. We choose what is the threshold values that we want, and it's this, um, <clears throat> it is this FA minus one, FA minus one, okay? And in this case, if the loop hypothesis is false, then this value, the MS level, will be much bigger than MSE. Okay, and then we're gonna have larger values of F0. If not, if F, F at X0 is true, then these two values will be very close to each other and F0 will be close to one. So in the paper manufacturing, let's see an example. So we can run this in R using the AOF function. So the AOV function, we calculate uh, TS of KPA explained by fiber type for the paper data. So we get two variables from the same paper and we calculate an AOV of one based on the other. Okay, so we can get here the values. So for fiber type, we have three degrees of freedom that's because we have four fiber types. Uh, for residuals, we have 20 degrees of freedom. That's because we have four fiber types and one uh, individual, so 24 minus four. And here we have the, knee, the sum of squares and here we have the mean square. And we can see here that the mean square is much smaller than the sum of squares, like it's three times smaller. And here it's 25 times smaller. So for this value here, the F value will be 13.2. For, for this value here, the F value would be much, much, much lower. Okay? So the ANOVA table, this is, the, this is called the ANOVA table. And the ANOVA table will give us information of the source of variation together with the corresponding values. Okay? So in this case, this ANOVA test rejected the new hypothesis that all the effects are zero. But what does this mean? We want to know which one is the best. And all that we know right now is that the new hypothesis that all effects are zero is not true. So what is the situation that we have? Okay. So I'm going to pause uh, the video a little bit and I will continue uh, the discussion on the next video. See you there. Hello everyone, uh, this is Klaus Aranha at the University of Scuba for the Experiment Designs for Comparison Sciences, Topic 8, Video 3, uh, Multiple Comparison, ANOVA, and post hoc Testing. So in the last video, we described the statistical model for ANOVA that is used when you want to compare a set of samples. The idea is that by observing the difference between the mean standard error, which is the error of the entire set of samples considers a single sample against the effect that means uh, <clears throat> against the effect error, in other words, the error of each sample independently, we could calculate the F statistic, and the F statistic would tell us if any one of the uh, sample, any one of the uh, samples, any one of the effects ha would move one of the samples away from the, <clears throat> from the great mean. In other words, the ANOVA tests a new hypothesis where every uh, effect uh, has zero effect on the sample mean against an alternate hypothesis where at least one of the effects changes the sample means. But the question is, even if we reject the new hypothesis, we still have the question, which of the effects is the one that is producing the effect? Okay, so for, for us to take this question, we need to answer two questions. First is, can we verify the assumptions of the test? And the second is, which means are different from which and by how much? So let's go for the assumptions. 
Okay, so as we mentioned before, the ANOVA model is based on three assumptions on the behavior of the residuals. The first assumption is independence. In other words, uh, the residuals, they do not depend on each other for the values. They are all the, the, the errors of the observations, they are drawn from a normal distribution with independent, um, independent sample. The second, and maybe the most important, is almost this, this dasiki. Difficult word, uh, so, but it means the equality of variances across groups. The variances don't mean need to be exactly the same uh, on the samples, but they need to be similar enough that we can say that all of them came from the same population. Finally, we have uh, the normality assumption that we talked a lot about before. So uh, we can observe, obtain the error. So all these three assumptions, they are assumptions on the residuals. So we want to do our assumption testing on the residuals. And the residual EIJ is calculated as YIJ, so the observation value, minus the, uh, obs the estimated mean of all the observations. So it's YIJ minus the global, uh, the observed, the calculated mean, plus the calculated average of the values. So it's YIJ minus YI. So basically, the uh, <clears throat> the residual is calculated by separating the observation from the mean of the sample that observation came from. So these are our residuals. Okay, it's not the observation minus the global mean, it's the observation minus the mean of that sample. Of course, if the null hypothesis is actually true, these two things are the same thing, but if the null hypothesis is not true, uh, the calculation will be different. So we want to use the second calculation. Uh, observation minus mean of each sample. So, uh, the normality assumption can be tested uh, using methods that we've seen already, like the Shapiro weak test or observing a normal Q2 plot, okay? The ANOVA is relatively robust on violations of normality as long as the other assumptions are verified, okay? So let's look at homeostasity. So homeostasity means similar variances. So the homeostasity assumption, you can test it using the flinner kuhlin test. And we can also uh, visually test it by plotting the residuals. And we saw how to calculate the residuals before. So these are the residuals for our experiment. And we can see that in general, they seem to be equally distributed. Okay. Um, also, even if they're not exactly the same, the ANOVA is relatively robust to modest violations of almost sedacity as long as the sample is balanced. And we're going to talk a little bit about unbalanced samples. We might talk more about unbalanced samples next class because unbalanced here means that the sample sizes are the same. As for the independence assumption, as we said before, the independence assumption should be guaranteed by on the design phase. So it's very hard to test for independence. Uh, we can test some trivial examples like, okay, let's see if there is a time dependence by checking if the samples are autocorrelated. But the test for time dependence, the test for autocorrelation can be broken by simply mixing the samples. So if there is a dependence, there, if there is some sort of dependence between the observations that is not related to time, that can break the test. So you need to be careful about that. Okay, ways to do that is to make sure that you avoid pseudo replication and pseudo replication. We talk a little bit about it on the <clears throat> paired uh, test. Pseudo replications is, for example, let's say that we have um, different types of woods A, B, C, D, but by a mistake, uh, C and D are the same type of woods. So now we have some pseudo replication here. Okay, so we have to try to stop that kind of stuff. Uh, to test for serial correlations, we can use the Durbin Wilson test, as mentioned before. Um, and the ANOVA is quite sensitive to violations of independence. Okay, so we need to be very careful about uh, the, the observation, the violation of independence when we're doing an ANOVA test. Okay, so let's say that we passed all the assumptions, we cleared the assumptions. So now we need to determine which levels of the factor are uh, dif significantly dif different. 
Okay, of course, uh, this is if we reject the new hypothesis. If we did not reject the new hypothesis, then we assume that all the values are, uh, are, are not significantly different and they might probably come from the same, um, the same, the same population. In that case, uh, there's a paper here that you can take a look to see how do you deal when uh, results are not significant. So of course you don't, don't just throw away, you have to report them. The reporting is a little bit different, but it's still important to report uh, non-significant, statistically significant results. So um, there are different ways to determine uh, which levels of the factor are different. Uh, but one thing that is very important to mention is that you should choose one of these ways before you do the test, okay? So when you do your experiment design, you say, okay, we're going to do an ANOVA, and after the ANOVA, we're going to do, we're going to do an all versus all comparison, or we're going to do a one versus all comparison. We're going to do a best versus all comparison. We're going to do a standard versus all comparison. It's important to make this the definition before you do the, exam, the, the test, because if you don't do that, you can do something like, okay, let's try one, did not give a, the result that we want. Let's try another, did not give the result that we want. Did not, this, did, let's try another, did not give. Oh, this one actually gives a result. Let's write a paper about this. This is, a very, this is called harking. So hypothet, hypothetizing after the results are known. And this is a very easy way. This is a very common entry point for research, researcher bias. Uh, there were some very hor some horror stories about that. I don't have them right now, but I'll see if I add them to maybe the discussion uh, lecture. Okay, so let's try to define before we do the test which test we we, we need in advance. So um, the planning of multiple comparisons must be guided by the technical question. So depending on what kind of question you try to answer, uh, you want to use different ways. Uh, to calculate that, okay? So whenever possible, we should try to do the smallest number of comparisons that we need. Uh, the less comparisons that we do, uh, the better, uh, the, the more reliable our results are, okay? This is also use smaller sample size and also give us the largest power for the same experimental setup. So uh, the questions that we usually have is, how does one level compare to others? Um, how does each level compares against the grant mean? So we can see like which of the levels is statistically different from the grant mean, uh, which of the levels is different from the others, or which of the levels is different against a standard level. So the multiple comparisons uh, in ANOVA, when we do these multiple comparisons, here we're gonna actually do a series of the tests which is kind of different from what I talked at the beginning. But the idea here is that we are coming into these two tests with our eyes open. We already did an ANOVA, so that guarantees to us that at least one of the levels is different. And we're going to perform a, a compensation on the p-value to avoid the compounding errors that we talked before, okay? So if the assumptions of the ANOVA are verified, we already have some information. We know, for example, that the groups are almost density, and we know that the common variance is estimated by MSC, okay? So we also know that if we're going to perform multiple tests, the probability of type error on each test is A, and we need to correct the alpha value to have the exact type one error probability. There are many different ways to adjust the alpha value of the pairwise comparisons. Uh, so, <clears throat> Two of the most commons are the Bonferroni and the CDAC correction, okay? So let's say that we decided to do K comparisons. We decided to do six, uh, three comparisons. We're on the, on, the wood, on, on the wood experiment. So we have four types of woods. We compare one of the types of the woods against the three others. So that's K comparisons. So our alpha adjusted would be the desired alpha divided by K. So if we're doing three comparisons and we wanted a 0 0.05 alpha, the alpha that we will actually use on our tests is 0 0.05 divided by three. This is the Bonferroni, this is the Bonferroni adjustment. The CDAC adjustment is a little bit different. 
it uses one minus one minus alpha family to one over k power. So in this case of um, alpha equal to 0 0.05, uh, we want to use with k equal to three, we're gonna use 0 0.95 to the, uh, the square, the, the cubic square, the, the cubic root of this one minus that, okay? There are other methods. These two are very conservative, which means that they are they protect the most against um, type one errors at the expense of being slightly less powerful, of expense of having a higher probability of type two errors. So let's see the type of errors. We can, uh, the type of comparisons. We can do an all versus all comparison. So A versus B versus C versus D, B versus C versus D, and C versus D, okay? So if we just want to know which levels are significant, different, and which levels are not, we compare everyone against everyone. We don't have any extra information. In this case, the number of comparisons will be A times A minus one divided by two. So for the four types of papers, we're gonna have four times three, that's 12 divided by two, we're gonna have six comparisons, uh, which is, well, so we have six comparisons to compare all the types of woods in our previous example, okay? So we're gonna have sample size, the sample size calculations for this case follow the same rules for the t-test, uh, but with the alpha value corrected. Uh, we're gonna go talk about this next, uh, next lecture, okay? Uh, so, for compare, performing all versus all multiple comparisons, a common alternative is to use the two key wholeness significance difference, the 8SD approach. So, this method is generally chosen because it provides a slightly higher power than the bone ferroni correction. So, a, sim a simple approach is to calculate the sample size using bone ferroni corrected alpha values for simplicity and then performing the test using the to, to key uh, HST correction for the better power. So we have our number of samples to be n equals to two with the t adjusted divided by two plus t beta uh, times the uh, estimated uh, error divided by the desired difference. And this would be the number of uh, samples that we want for the all versus all comparison. So this would be the, uh, we can, one way to, uh, to program this, we can use on R, the multi-comp library. It implements the HSD. So first we get uh, the two key model for our, for, for our ANOVA model that we already calculated. And we say that our level is 0 0.95. This is the desired level. It will correct uh, for the desired level. And then we have the confidence intervals. And in this case, we have this middle line is the grand mean and the confidence intervals that do not touch the line are the ones that are significantly different from the uh, from the grand mean. So we can say that there is a difference on D, sorry, not the grand mean, the zero. So we can see that D and B are statistically different from each other, C and B are as well, and C and A are also uh, different from each other. So in comparison with the O versus O, we also have the O versus one. So comparison of O versus one happens when we have, for instance, one proposed approach versus a series of existing approach. So in our initial uh, suggestion is when we have our proposed approach versus the, a series of SOTA from the literature. Or when we have a comparison of different approaches versus a standard one or a placebo, we have a different uh, treatments and we want to compare all the treatments against a placebo to see which one performs best against the placebo. In all these cases, we have a smaller number of tests. The number of tests is K, which is A minus one, where A is the number of levels. So each test, again, can be done using the T statistic. Now, <clears throat> when we're doing all versus one comparisons, there are two approaches that we can do. We can have a balanced design where all the, um, all the comparisons have the same number of um, samples, uh, same number of observations, and we can try to do an optimal allocation 
where um, we're trying to give more uh, observations for the tests that have higher variability. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip this because this does not make a lot of sense without the um, without the lecture on sample size, but go back to this slide after the next slide, uh, lecture to see how we can calculate uh, sample sizes for the balance level and for the optimal location. One thing that is important is that there are softwares that can do the calculation of uh, sample, sample calculation for you. For instance, the G power three, you can give it uh, your uh, estimated variance and the power and the, uh, and the difference that you are interested in and it will give you some uh, sample size calculations based on that. Finally, uh, we also have the Dunes test uh, for all versus one. Uh, <clears throat> so the Dunes test can be done for all, uh, all versus one comparison. So we decide the control group size sample n is zero and we, we, uh, we compare all of them against this n is zero. So to do this on the to do this on the on R, let's say that our base case is B. Okay, so B will be our standard level, and we want to compare everyone against B. So we can use this V level to generate the B uh, the B levels from the <clears throat> from the data. Uh, we do the analysis of variance, and here we can use uh, the multi multi comparison package to do a done it uh, test on this model and you can see here the confidence intervals and you can see that a is not statistically significant from b but c and d are statistically significant from b notice that this test does not say anything about the comparison between c and d here so we cannot say if c and d are similar or not we just know the relationship of c and d to b so some final considerations this type of comparisons that are performed after ANOVA, they should be planned in advance. So just to remind, you should decide before you do the ANOVA, you should decide that are you going to, if the ANOVA rejects the new hypothesis, are you going to do an all versus all, an all versus one? And if you're going to do an all versus one, which is the one that you're comparing against? Is it a fixed value? Is it one of the groups? Okay. Um, and, in general, you're going to calculate the sample size. You use the sample size for the post hoc comparison. They are usually bigger than the sample size for the ANOVA. So you can, you can gather the data assuming that you're going to do the post hoc comparison anyway and use that data for the ANOVA in the beginning. Okay? There are other approaches. We just covered two of them, all versus one and all versus all. But uh, there are many more for specific cases. There is a link here for uh, a paper where you can have more information about that. Okay, uh, thank you very much for looking for this class. And next week, we're going to talk about how to calculate sample sizes for uh, tests on two samples and tests for multiple samples like ANOVA with some examples. See you there. Hello everyone, this is Klaus Aranha for, uh, for the University of Tsukuba and this is Experiment Designs for Computer Science uh, Week 8 uh, and we're going to talk about experiment power and sample size. I'd like to start by apologizing for this late lecture. Uh, this particular lecture was supposed to come last Friday but I had a problem with recording. Um, and I also would like to remind everyone of the dates for this um, for the end of the course. So this will be the last video lecture. Okay, so we're going to talk about sample size calculator, and this will close uh, the video lectures for this course for this semester. This Friday, July third, we're going to have our second Q and A session. It will be in the same format as the first Q and A session. I will write the details about the online meeting at the Manaba for this course. Finally, um, as I mentioned in the last video lecture, we had a large extension for grading. So the deadline for the report three has been extended to July 20th. So you still have 20 days from this lecture uh, to work on report three. And uh, if you remember from the last video lecture, 
the report three will be a report on an experiment that uh, you perform. Uh, and these exper this experiment must include in the experiment design comparison of multiple samples and uh, sample size calculation. Okay, if you have any questions about how to design your experiment, if you have a, 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 an experimental proposal but you're not sure if it, uh, if it meets all the requirements for report number three, please do not hesitate to contact me by email or just send a message to um, Manaba um, asking more questions about this report. All right, so let's move into the lecture. So the outline for the lecture today, uh, the topic is the calculation of sample sizes. We're gonna do a very quick review of type two error and approaches for choosing uh, sample sizes. And then we're gonna spend most of our time uh, talking about sample size calculation for different tests. So we studied several tests in this lecture like the single sample test and comparisons of two samples, paired comparison, equality testing, and ANOVA. And we'll talk about how we select samples for each of these cases. So what is a sample size calculation? So during this course, we introduced several kinds of statistical tests. So you have one sample, or maybe you have two samples that you obtain during an experiment, and you want to determine uh, some inference hypothesis based on the, the samples, or maybe you just want to calculate a uh, confidence interval, or you want to calculate some estimator for the population from where the samples came, okay? Uh, in all these calculations, in all these statistics, there is an assumption that you have um, a large number of observations for your sample, okay? Why do you need uh, these observations? Well, by obtaining more observations, we can increase the precision of the point estimators that we are using to estimate the population parameter. Especially, for instance, in the case of par um, interval estimators, such as the confidence interval, um, a larger number of a, lar a larger number of observations will usually lead to a smaller. Um, region of the confidence interval will give us a better idea of what is the max what are, what are the uh, reasonable values for estimate for the parameter being estimated okay uh, also we saw that increasing the number of observations can be used to increase the confidence or the power of a test so we saw that uh, the calculation of alpha the power of a test is um, the, is the, the, the power of a test depends on the, on the number of observations, as well as the confidence of a test also depends on the number of observations. Beta, the power of a test, or alpha, the confidence of a test, is related to the number of observations. Also, when we have a large number of observations in our experiment, it's easier to, for us to find um, outliers and special situations, like if you only collect a, a very small number of samples, you might not have the chance to observe some, some unique cases of your experiment. Um, so all of these are good reasons uh, to take multiple observations when conducting an experiment. But this leads, this leaves the question, okay, so we need a lot of repetitions, but how many repetitions do you need? How many observations is necessary for our experiment, okay? One simple answer, and that is, of course, it's a simple and not correct answer, is that the more the merrier. Just let's try to get the biggest N that we can. Let's try to, let's get the largest number of observations that we can, okay? But there are some problems with, uh, if the number of observations is very large. The first one is a numerical problem. If you remember our lecture on hypothesis testing, uh, I showed to you that it's possible to reduce P arbitrarily by increasing the value of N. And this is especially worrisome in computational experiments 
because in computational experiments, you can reproduce your experiments very easily. So you can execute an experiment maybe one million times or two million times. And by reproducing the experiment two million times, you're going to have a very, very small confidence interval, a very, very small p-value that does not really indicate uh, what is the actual difference that you are observing in the experiment. And some of you saw this in your experiments, like you had this tiny difference between two, two distributions. And you could, sh by sampling from these two distributions a million time, times, you could show that this tiny difference was significantly, uh, was statistically significant. And that leads to the second question. Okay, it's, it's statistically significant, but is it relevant? It's, it, it is a, a meaningful difference, okay? So sometimes just having a very large sample size does not help us answer the questions that we are really interested in answering in our experiment. Also, um, when we go a little bit away from computer experiments, um, the cost of taking a, a, doing a lot of observations can be uh, very high. So if, if our experiments depends on people, or if our experiments depends on producing physical items, if our experiments depends on some sort of resource, it may not be possible for us to have a very light, large number of repetitions. Even if our experiment is completely digital, if it's completely on top of a computer, but even in this case, it might take some calculation time, um, it might take uh, costs in terms of you have to pay to access uh, your supercomputer or something like that. So you might be limited on the number of experiments that you can do. So you cannot have an arbitrarily large experiment. Finally, uh, the number of observations that you have available will influence your data uh, preparation step. So before you do the data analysis, you might have to transform your data or you might have to maybe treat outliers. Uh, you might have different choices of uh, a, a, a statistical, a statistical tests that depends on how much data you actually have. So because of these codependencies, it's interesting that you know, you just, I mean, instead of just, okay, let's just get as many observations as we want, you want to calculate the number of observations that you execute in your experiment. So you can use this number to make several other decisions about data preparation, test selection, etc. So it's, it's good to calculate in advance uh, the number of observations in your experiment. Okay, so because of these reasons, we are interested in having a formal way to calculate the number of observations. Okay, so how do we do that? Some of you might have already started to read papers in the literature, maybe you have read papers for real research, or maybe you saw the experiments done by uh, older, other people in the laboratory, and you have come across this Let's, the experiment was repeated 30 times, this magic number. Lots of experiments, they do the, lots of papers, lots of experiments, they use this magic number. Let's repeat the number of experiments 30 times. Sometimes 20, sometimes 40, but it's like a number that comes out of nowhere. It's a very nice round number. Where does this number come from? Okay, why repeat the experiment 30 times and why is that not a good idea all of the time? So the 30 times comes from the central limit theorem. Do you remember the central limit theorem? We talked about the CLT in the second lecture when we were talking about uh, confidence interval. So the CLT is that idea that if you have a process that has a distribution, okay, and you calculate some statistic on a sample of that, that process. For instance, you calculate the mean based on a sample of size five. Now, the observations have a sample, but the mean calculated from samples also has a distribution. So the observation has a distribution and the mean estimator also has a distribution. And the distribution of the mean estimator 
that is made from a sample, well, the CLT says that the larger the sample size, the closer this mean estimator distribution will be to a normal, okay? So to put it more formally, the CLT states that the distribution of sample means tends to follow a normal distribution. And this effect, it can be observed even on means of very small samples. For instance, if you're taking um, one number that follows a uniform, uniform distribution, okay? So it's a random variable from a computer. It goes from zero to one with equal probability for all values. This is a uniform distribution. If you take a sample from this uniform distribution, like you take five values of from this uniform distribution, and that you calculate the mean, the distribution of the, this mean estimator will be very, very close to normal, okay? So the idea is that if we take samples from well-behaved distributions, these samples will follow, uh, 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 statistics on these samples will follow uh, normal distribution with very small sample sizes. Now, however, in general, when you have less well-behaved distributions, distributions with large bias or distributions that are very far away from normal, the CLT will still hold for N that is uh, around 30, except in cases that are very extreme. So this 30 times comes from this result that in general, if the CLT will hold, you will observe the CLT holding for N around 30. Okay? Um, so that's where the 30 comes from. You put 30 and you can kind of ignore the, 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 the distribution of your population. You know that the CLT will make the distribution of your sample follow a normality, okay? Now, uh, why this? Because many statistical tests require the normality distributions. You saw in this lecture, more than half of the statistical tests that we described require the, the, the assumption of normality or the assumption of a normal distribution. So people developing this test, and especially people using these tests, they required an N equal to 30 to guarantee that in not, if, you, if, if you don't have a lot of information about the underlying distribution of your data, you can kind of expect the CLT to do its job and give you a normal distribution for your estimator, okay? Does this mean that we have to use the study, okay? Well, there are some cases that 30 is not the right value, okay? For example, if the underlying distribution of the population is very well behaved, and I gave you the example of your population following an, uh, uniform distribution, okay? In that case, you don't need 30. You can get the normal T assumption from a much lower value, okay? Uh, also, if you're doing a statistical test that does not require the underlying distribution to be normal, then there is no really reason. The, the rule of thumb of 30 repetitions also does not apply here because 30 is to guarantee that the CLT will work. So this reason is not, is not meaningful anymore if you're not assuming, assuming normality of your data, okay? Uh, another situation where the rule of thumb of 30 is not very appropriate is when you're comparing two samples and the two different samples, they have different, uh, very different uh, variance, not variance, variance, uh, typo here, okay, typo, yeah. Okay, so if you have two samples and they have very different variances, then it, it's kind of, uh, we're gonna talk about this later, but the idea is that the sample that has a higher variance requires more uh, observations than the sample that has a smaller variance. So you can have less samples, less observations here and more observations here, okay? Uh, a different case is that your experimental budget simply does not allow, you cannot do 30 experiments. So if you do not have enough money to do 30 experiments, what do you do? Or even if it's not a budget, but for instance, let's say that you are doing some sort of drug test 
or you're doing some sort of test that require cooperation from humans and you want to minimize that you want to have as few people as possible so in that case you don't want to use this rule of thumb you want to explicitly calculate the minimal number of observations that you require for your experimental assumptions okay so all of these are strong reasons to do an explicit calculation of sample size and not just use 30. okay okay so let's talk about this last case what happens if you don't have enough money and you say look uh, it doesn't matter what i calculate i can only run five experiments okay if you only have money for five experiments what do you do okay even in the case where your budget constrain the number of experiments that you can do you know, the number of observations that you can have it's still good to calculate the number of observations and why is that it's because the number the, the calculations for sample size are very closely related to the calculations of power if your number of if your number of observations is constrained you want to calculate the power of your experiment given that the that number of observations so you know if your experiment is uh, um, if your experiment is sensitive or not okay so the power of an experiment is an expression of the probability of type two errors false negatives in other words if your experiment has low powered if it's a low powered experiment there's a very high chance that you will not be able to find the effect that you are trying to find even if the effect exists let's say that you generate a new drug that can cure a certain disease if you do not test it on enough people you might not be able to obtain enough information to show statistically that your drug has the desired attributes okay that's because your experiment is not powerful enough uh, your experiment is not uh, your experiment is not powerful enough okay so if your experiment is constrained by budget we want to do a power analysis to see how much of uh, how sensitive it is how much of an effect i can expect to detect with an experiment with that budget if the sensitiveness is not enough then i might want to see that maybe talk to your to all to your to your institution to see if you get a bigger budget or maybe you have to rethink your experiment rethink your analysis go back to the drawing board and see what kind of science you can do with your limited budget okay so let's talk about uh, more about sample size and type 2 error okay so given a certain statistical test the power of the test is a, essentially a function of four elements okay the size of the difference in other words the amount the size of the effect that we are trying to observe and remember from lecture number three that the minimum effect is the difference that we are trying to observe for example let's say that we are comparing two algorithms for their speed the size of the difference is the minimum the, the minimal amount of time difference that we are interested maybe we don't care if algorithm a is 0 0.01 second is one millis if algorithm a is one millisecond faster than algorithm b we don't care for some reason but if algorithm a is one second faster than algorithm b then that's important so in this case the minimum effect that we are interested in is one second okay now the second uh the second thing that we are interested in is the variability of the observations so the bigger the variance uh the larger the probability of a type 2 error okay the significance level the value of alpha is one parameter that we choose when we define the experiment and it also influences the power of the experiment experiments with a higher significance level will have lower power they will have a lower ability to detect uh, attributes of that significance finally uh, sample size is 
uh, another factor that influenced the power of the, the experiment. Bigger sample size implies a bigger power for our experiment. In general, we don't control these first two. Like the size of the difference is the difference that exists. If there is no difference, then we cannot detect anything. If the difference is too small, we cannot detect it. Or if the difference is too big, then it's easy to detect with a not very high power test. Uh, the variability of observations is also the reality. We cannot control it. Uh, we can indirectly reduce the variability of the observations by increasing the sample size. And we can reduce the significance level uh, as a trade-off with the power of the test. So to estimate, so the idea to estimate the power, the minimal power of the test is to define the minimal interesting effect delta. So this delta, so if we go back, the actual size of the difference is the real difference between the, the, what we are, the, the new hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis. The actual size of the difference is the real difference between the two algorithms that we are comparing. But we need, we can define, we cannot control the real difference. The real difference is the real difference. It exists. But we can control the minimal interesting effect, the minimal interesting difference. The difference that we can, we can control this threshold that we say, a difference under this threshold, it's not important enough for us. A difference above this threshold is important for us. So we can define that. Okay? Now, how do we define that? The minimal difference depends on the scientific knowledge about the phenomenon. So if it's a completely theoretical experiment, uh, a completely theoretical research, uh, it might depend on the bibliography. If it's an experiment, uh, if it's a research based on some practical application, you have to talk to the engineer or to the social scientist or to the historian that you are talking to in this experiment to define what is the minimal interesting effect. Okay, so you need a good understanding of the exp of the uh, field where the experiment will be conducted to know what is this minimal uh, interesting effect. After we define the minimal interesting effect, we can ob obtain an est we need to obtain an estimate of the variance of the observations. Now there are many different ways to obtain the to estimate this variance. We can also obtain the variance from uh, domain knowledge. So if it's, for instance, an analysis of a machine of a factory, maybe the engineer that designed the machine, maybe they know what is the what is the variance for that process or if it is a historical process we can look at historical data to estimate the variance if it is a future process we can try to do a pilot study to try to obtain this variance <clears throat> so there are different ways okay so after we have an estimation of the variance and after we have a value for the minimal interesting effect we can uh, run the calculate the type two error, and by knowing the power of the experiment, the probability of type two error, we can run the experiment with a better understanding of how, what is the ability of this experiment of detecting the uh, effect of interest. A test with lower power, a test uh, even when we have a power for a given difference alpha. This means that dif delta, it means that differences smaller than delta can still happen, but they might not be detected by this experiment. And differences bigger than delta, they will be detected more easily by this experiment. So this may give us some information about what do we do if our, um, what do we do if our um, test is, uh, does not return a statistically significant result? The meaningful, the, the, uh, how meaningful is a, a, a rejection or a known rejection of new hypothesis depends on the power of the test that we are executing. Now let's see a concrete example. Imagine that we have one, one experiment uh, where we take one sample and we compare it against a fixed value. 
So here, the new hypothesis is that the mean, the mean of the sample is below a certain value. And the alternate hypothesis is that the mean of the sample is not below the certain value. Now, for this experiment, we have a fixed sample size of 10. And we determined that the minimal, value, the minimal effect of significance is 0 0.5. So we are only interested if the difference between our sample and this value is of at least 0 0.5 or is it 0 0.5 seconds or 0 0.5 kilos? It depends on our experiment. We have an estimate for the standard deviation of out of one, sigma equals to one, and our desired significance is alpha 0 0.01. So until now, if you did an experiment, this would be the attributes that you would select. You would select a sample size, maybe arbitrarily, maybe depending on some sort of limit. Uh, we will define a significance. We want 99% of confidence. So our significance alpha is 0 0.01. We have an estimate for our standard deviation and we have our minimal value of interest, 0 0.5. Given these values, how do we calculate the power of this experiment? Well, usually we uh, are as well as Excel, as well as SPSS and other softwares with statistical capability, they will have power calculation tools. So in R, if we're, our experiment is a t-test, we can calculate the power of the t-test with the power t-test function, and we give information about our experiment. We have a number, a, num a number of observations equals to 10, the delta equal to 0 0.5, standard deviation one, significance level 0, 0, 001, okay, these are our attributes. We're doing a one sample experiment, with the alternative hypothesis being one-sided. In other words, we are interested if our method has a mean under uh, the new hypothesis value, under zero, and not, <clears throat> uh, and not different, yeah, just under. So in these cases, uh, we get this information. So notice that here, we do not run the experiment yet. The actual value of the experiment is not necessary for the calculation of power. We just need to know the parameters for the experiment design. So the power calculation and the sample calculation, they all happen before the experiment at the experiment design stage, okay? So we have the number of observations is 10, delta 0, 5, and here we have our power. Our power is 0 0.16, okay? or beta is 0 0.16. So this is a very low power, okay? Uh, we have one minus this is the probability of um, type two errors if the, dif the real difference is 0 0.5 or less. So if the real difference between the, if the real difference between the sample and the target value is 0 0.5, we have an almost 85% chance of having a false negative. Okay, so this is a very low powered experiment. We have a very high chance of not being able to detect uh, the real difference, uh, the, the difference of 0 0.5 between our data and the target value. So what if, so what, how many, so we have a low power experiment. Let's say that we can increase the number of observations. We want to know how, how many observations we need to have an experiment of power 85, to have a, a, a 0 0.85 powered experiment, B, beta equals 0, 0 0.85. So we can use the same, uh, the same function, but instead of specifying n, we're gonna specify the power. So we say we want the power to be 0 0.85, but we don't give n as one of the parameters. So again, it will calculate, <clears throat> we'll do the power, the power calculation for the test, and n here will be 47.98. Uh, usually we round this value up, so this, uh, this is the minimum n for to have the desired power, but because we cannot do 47.9 experiments, we round this up, we get 48 experiments, okay? So we need 48 observations in our sample to detect a one-sided deviation of 0 0.5 or more uh, on, the mean, <clears throat> on the mean 
with a power level of 0 0.85, okay? So this would be a very simple case of a one sample uh, experiment. And, <clears throat> but let's consider a more standard uh, case where we are comparing two means. We are comparing the means from two samples, okay? Uh, well, it has been about 30 minutes for this video, so in the next video we will look at these more specific examples. So, see you uh, there. Hello everyone, uh, this is Klaus Aranha from the University of Tsukuba, and this is Experiment Design, uh, Topic 7, um, in some calculation of sample sizes. In the last video i talked about the ideas behind calculation of sample sizes the relationship between calculations of sample size and power and on this video i will talk about some specific cases of uh sample size calculation okay so here let's consider a general case especially for computer science where we have two means and from two different samples and we want to compare them so as i said before uh the sample size calculation is something that you do at the experiment design stage before you do the experiment. So you use parameters from the, um, you, you define the parameters for your experimental design in order to calculate the sample size. So in this case, let's assume that we want a significance alpha of 0 0.05, okay? So a traditional value, 95% significance, and we desire a power, one of minus beta, of 0 0.8. Okay, so our power here is, um, we want a 0 0.8 power. Now, for this experiment, our minimally relevant effect size, okay, so the effect size that we are interested in detecting is 15. Okay, but we don't know the variance of the, of the two samples. Okay, so how can we obtain the, the required sample size in this case? Okay. If we don't know the variance, but we know that they are approximately equal, the calculation of the sample size is given by this formula. N, which will be the sample size for both samples, so the number of experiments in sample one and the number of experiments in sample two, will be two, uh, will be approximately equal to two times the uh, uh, the, quanta the alpha divided by two quantile of active distribution with 2n minus n degree of freedom and the beta quantile plus the beta quantile of active distribution with 2n minus 2 degrees of freedom um, divided by the d, d star where d star is the minimal significant effect divided by sigma which is the variance so this is we talked about this before is the standardized minimally interesting effect size the minimally significant minimally interesting effect divided by the uh, variance of our system okay so how can we do can we do this calculation so we have a formula uh, take a quick take a look at this formula and see if there is anything that's missing here well one thing that's missing here is that we need the variance to calculate the sample size. But if we don't do the experiment, how do we know the variance? How can we know the variance before doing the experiment? Okay, there are a few ways to proceed. There are a few ways to deal with this problem. Uh, in general, we can say that if we have process knowledge, so like I mentioned before, we have an engineer that knows the process, or we have like a human scientist that knows the situation that we are investigating, or we have a manual or something like that, a simulator, a model. We can use this domain knowledge, uh, this domain knowledge to have an initial estimate of the variance. Of course, this initial estimate of the variance will become one of the assumptions of our, uh, of our test. So here we are creating a new assumption to our, to our statistic, and this assumption will have to be validated. So if we say, okay, using this estimate for the variance, we decided that we need uh, 30, uh, we need 15 uh, observations in your sample. Then you do your experiment. After you analyze your experiment, you validate, is my variance really 
this is, is, is my variance really this value? If the variance is bigger than what we estimated, then the power of our experiment will be lower. We have to recalculate the power of experiment to see if it's still acceptable. If the variance is smaller, well, great. Then the power of our experiment is higher, so nothing was lost, okay? Um, we can also use uh, a standardized minimal value to calculate sample size. So instead of using uh, a minimal value of interest, we can use something like, okay, I'm interested in a difference of at least 5%. This 5% does not depend on the variance. So we can use this value uh, as a proxy. It's not as precise, but uh, we don't know if 5%, depend, depending on the application, this might not be feasible, but it's something that you can use if you don't know the variance. Finally, uh, we can form a pilot study. A pilot study is when you do a small number of experiments to estimate some of the parameters necessary. In this case, I'm doing, uh, I'm collecting a small number of observations in order to estimate the variance for the design of the main experiment. Okay, each of these approaches has their advantages and the drawbacks, and you have to decide which approach you are going to use to obtain um, values for your power calculation. Let's think about the pilot study, okay? If we don't have no information at all to estimate the variance of the process, uh, we have to perform a pilot study. Uh, the sample, the, how do we calculate the sample size for the pilot study, okay? There are some formulas. For example, one example of a formula is that the end of the pilot study can be two times the percentile of the significance uh, in uh, the percent, the significance person significance quantile of the z distribution divided the, by e, where e is the maximum relative error, like the our maximum possible estimate of a relative error. Now, this kind of calculations generally usually generates some very very large sample sizes, so it's not a very recommended approach. Uh, you need to, use, I mean, if you have no other information, well, that's got to be what you're going to do, but uh, it needs to be used carefully. <clears throat> but let's assume that we have the standard deviation. We obtain it somehow from a pilot study or maybe from some manual or maybe use a relative case. Well, in that case, um, let's say that for our, the experiment that we said before, we, uh, we discovered that the standard deviation of sigma is approximately equal to 50. So we can go back to that uh, equation and uh, we assume that we have equal sample sizes and we have here delta that we have our minimal delta that are our, mean, our, our minimal effect significant effect. We have our variance and now we just need to calculate this, right? We have just, to cal we, we have a formula for the, for the quantile for the key distribution. Any other problems? Well, there is still one more problem that we have to solve. To calculate the quantile, we need to know the degrees of freedom. And to calculate the degrees of freedom, we need to know the number of samples. So now we have the chicken and egg problem here, right? To know the number of samples, we need the number of samples. This is called a transcendental equation. So this equation is transcendental. You need, we need a value to calculate that value. How do we do that? Well, the standard approach is to do iteration. We estimate an initial value for n, or in this case, we need to calculate this t. So we estimate an initial value for tk to be approximately equal to zk. So we use the normal distribution as a proxy here. And then we calculate this formula using z and we're gonna have a val initial value of n using this new initial value of n we calculate this formula again using t and n and we're gonna see the difference this we're gonna give us a different value of n so we repeat the, the we repeat the formula over and over again until it converges to a fixed value of n okay so we need to find the smallest n that satisfies n is bigger than the estimated uh, estimated uh, deviation divided by the minimal value of interest 
T alpha, alpha divided by 2 plus TB. Okay? All right. Uh, of course, uh, we can program this depending on the case. Uh, but in practice, we are going to use uh, a, a sample size calculator. For instance, here in R, for the comparison of two, um, two samples with no significant, with no standard deviation, uh, we can use the power t test again. So here we have the power t test, we have the delta, the, our, the, our delta was 15 and our standard deviation was also 15. We have our significance level equal to 0 0.05 and our, our power equal to 0 0.8, okay? So when we calculate here, and here we see we're doing a two sample test. We're gonna have the same output as before, and we see that for a significance level of 0, 0, 0.05 and a power of 0, 0.8, uh, the power test is recommending a sample size of 13. Well, 13.09, so 14, right? We have to round this up. Very important to note that this N is for each group. So it's not the total number of samples, in, of observations, is the number of observations in each sample. So the first sample needs 14 observations, the second sample also needs 14 observations. What if the variances are not equal? Okay, so if we have unequal variances, we are going to use the Welch t-test. And in this case, um, <clears throat> we are going to, um, the, the, the calculation of sample size for the unequal case is not very difficult. Um, if we're going, we could do a, a balanced test, we could use both, but we can do an unbalanced test where the sample with a smaller variance has less observations than a sample with more variances, okay? In this case, it's not hard to show that the optimal allocation of observation is to keep the proportion. So the proportion of samples between the, the proportion of observations between the first sample and the second sample should be equal to the proportions of variance between the first sample and the second sample. So if we have a good estimation of the variances for both, well, for both samples, we can use uh, a proportional number of um, observations for each sample. In the case of pair tests, Okay, pair, pair test, as we saw in the, in, the, in the lecture number four, pair tests usually are more sensitive than unpaired tests because they include the assumption that the observations of two samples, they are correlated, okay? So if you don't remember the lecture, pair test is when you have for both treatments, say for algorithm one and algorithm two, you have the same sets of uh, input data, let's say graphs, and you test algorithm one in graph one, algorithm two in graph one, algorithm one in graph two, algorithm two in graph two. So in this case, each observation is, they have a relationship and you can use this relationship in your test to make the test more powerful, okay? So pair tests usually require small, smaller sample sizes for the same power and the same uh, significance. Okay, in this case, this is especially true when the variation, so for instance, if each case has a very, diff has, uh, if there's a lot of variation differences between each case, but the repetitions in one case itself, they don't have a lot of variation, okay? So if we have a in-level variation, in other words, the variation of uh, each case is sigma e and it's much smaller than the variation of all cases which is sigma u then if we have a large enough n we can see that the n for the unpaired test divided by the n for the paired test would be two of the uh, proportion of these two variances plus one so we can calculate the n for an unpaired test if, and from that we calculate what would be the n for the paired test Okay. okay, all of these are comparisons between two means to show difference. 
But we also saw in lecture, we also saw in lecture five, a special case of a test to uh, test equivalence. So how do we calculate the sample size for equivalence? If you remember, the test for equivalence is two tests. One test to show that a sample is smaller than a certain value, and one test to show that a sample is bigger than a sample value. So we have the sample is smaller than this, but the sample is bigger than this. Therefore, the sample is equivalent to this middle value, okay? So in the case of a, a single sample, we have, uh, we calculate the N, we still calculate using the interactive process, but in this case, the interactive process is this inequality. N is the smallest N that is bigger than the T, the alpha, uh, uh, the alpha quantile of T with N minus two degrees, of, two, N, two N minus one degrees of freedom, plus the beta quantile of T with N minus one degrees of freedom, with uh, estimator of significance alpha. And here we subtract from the minimal value of uh, interest, this delta U, which is the difference, uh, which is the limits of the means that we are testing, okay? So as, before, as I explained in the beginning, we use an interactive, uh, interactive process where the initial estimate for Tx is Zx, which is the, uh, the normal distribution. And then we repeat the iteration until the, we find the smallest n that obeys this equation. If we have, if we're trying to show equivalence between the two means, it's a very similar calculation as to show the difference between two means. If the sample, if the samples, if both of them have approximately the same uh, the same deviation. And if we're trying to show equivalence, usually they have the same, the, the same, uh, the same deviation. So we can use similar sample sizes, n1 equal to n2 that's equal to n. And we're going to use here, um, n is, will be the, this will be the inequality. n will be bigger than t alpha v, t beta v, with the, two, the sum of the two deviations and the minimal effect minus delta mu. And delta mu, which is smaller than the minimal effect, is the maximum real difference between the two means for which uh, the power is desired, okay? So these are all the cases for, uh, these are all cases for two samples that we studied in this course. Finally, we'll quickly think about the sample sizes formula for ANOVA, okay? So if you remember, uh, this is from the last lecture, ANOVA is the test that you use when you have multiple samples, like four, five, six samples, and you want to identify whether some of these samples are, have a difference, uh, have, a, have a difference distribution than the overall distribution that include all of the samples. So this is done by calculating a proportion of the variances, okay? Now, if you remember from the last lecture, the ANOVA has two stages. The initial stage where we compare all the samples to see if any of them will be different from the overall population. And the post hoc step where we saw that there is a difference, but we don't know where the difference is. So we compare each of the samples in order to, uh, to determ determine uh, where the difference is. Um, first, let's talk about the, the sample size of the initial ANOVA test, okay? So the formulas are almost as simple as those used for the t-test, okay? First, we, we need to know, we want, we, the formulas are based on this equality. The F distribution, the F quantile for one minus alpha will be equal to the F quantile for B, um, oh, uh, where the, for, uh, the parameter, the, this parameter is given by this value, the sum N of one to A. And if you remember, this is the error factor, uh, this is the error value for uh, the factor A in the statistical model, divided by the grand, uh, the grand deviance. Okay, 
So this is the no centrality parameter. This is the parameter that indicates how much some of the factors A uh, will deviate from the central location. Of course, uh, as you can see here, we need N to calculate this and we're trying to calculate N. So this will be an interactive process. Okay, let's, give, let's go back to using the numbers that we used in the paper new example from the last lecture. So in the paper new examples, we had four levels, four types of paper with alpha 0.05. So we were, were interested in a 95% confidence. And the overall error is seven. Okay, <clears throat> and we want to be able to detect whether two any two means have a difference of magnitude. Any of the two mean any of the two factors have a difference of magnitude at least twelve, with power one minus beta zero point eight power zero point eight. Under these conditions, uh, there are different several cases that we discussed for the post hoc test. Right? Maybe uh, some of the we want to know if any of them is different from the grand mean, or we want to know if one level is different from all of the other levels. In the case where we want to have some levels different from the grand mean, we can use these the t values as uh, one level is sigma is smaller than the grand mean, one level is bigger is smaller than the grand mean, and two levels are equal to the grand mean. And the second assumption is like, okay, we have one level that is uh, alpha minus one, uh, level one is smaller. And all the other levels, they are bigger. So one level is smaller than the grand mean by, uh, by delta, and all the other levels are bigger than the grand mean by delta. Notice that these are not the only two uh, possible uh, options, like how you define these vectors. So these are the vectors of the differences that we are trying to detect. Okay, so this is one estimate for this vector. This is another estimate for this vector. Uh, the estimates for this tau vector depend on your experiment design. What are you expecting what, what to happen? Uh, the order doesn't really happen, matter. It just matters, okay, we want one of the factors to be smaller, one of the factors to be bigger, and there are two other factors I will expect that they behave kind of similar. So this is the minimum difference that you can detect. Uh, this sigma here, it's not only for one value, like when we're comparing only two, 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 only two samples, this sigma must be uh, equivalent, must, be, must refer to all of the samples that we're dealing with. Okay, so let's try to do the calculation by hand. So our no centrality parameter becomes four uh, times Six, six, so this is extracting these numbers and putting into the formula. So we have that the non central parameter becomes 5.88, and we can now do the iteration on this formula. So by doing it by hand, we can see that the tau will be uh, minus delta delta zero zero, okay? And we can do this for, while the quantile of f for one minus alpha, alpha a minus one, a times n minus one is bigger than the quantile of f of beta a minus one, a times n minus one times the uh, tau parameter, okay? And we are going to keep increasing n, increasing the value, we start with our initial value of n and we're gonna increase the value of n until we find the smallest n that can satisfy this equation. And we see with this interactive process with this loop, the smallest n is nine. So nine will be the number of samples that we need for each of the wood types, okay? Of course, we can do this uh, using the function, uh, the power function, and the power function will find exactly the same value. So power ANOVA test, just like we have power t test, we have power ANOVA test, and the power ANOVA test for four groups, um, variance tau, um, and we have also the within variance sigma two and the sigma level alpha and the power one minus beta, and the t value will be eight point four. Um, <clears throat> the second case, so that was for the first case. The second case is the same. Okay, so we define tau 
as delta for this and we calculate the variance of tau of the non centrality and we can calculate the same thing and if we are calculating one against all the others we just need uh, six uh, observations for each sample now it's important to notice that this procedure is to calculate the uh, sample size for the ANOVA test. But if you remember from last class, after the ANOVA test, we are going to do a, a series of t-tests, like one versus all or all versus all. And these t-tests will have a modification to the uh, alpha value given by the multiple comparison adjustment. In this case, in the case where uh, we have this post hoc, it turns out that the number of observations in the post hoc tests is usually much higher than the number of observations in for the ANOVA test. So it's more common if you design the experiment using the um, the, the sample the sample calculation for the post hoc test then using the sample calculation for the ANOVA test. So you think about all the paired comparisons that you need to do in the post hoc test, and you see the number of observations that you need for those, and you use those number of observations as the number of observations in your experiment. Okay? Well, to, come to summarize these formulas and concepts, so I explained several formulas and concepts for calculating uh, sample size in several of the tests that I described in this course, but this is only scratching the surface. Depending on what kind of test you are doing and um, what is the type of data that you have, they are different versus we did not mention sample size calculations for uh, non-parametric tests, etc. So, but the key idea is that you understand the characteristics of the population, like what is the minimum value that you are interested in? What is the power that you are interested in? So you have to understand what is the influence of power on the analysis of your test? What is the, um, and by understanding all of this, that, uh, this information about your experiment, uh, you can inform yourself about what is the uh, sample, sample size calculation that you need, okay? For more information, especially focused on computer science, there is this paper from 2019 uh, that describes a very detailed way to calculate uh, sample size for the specific test of comparing the performance of two algorithms. So you have two algorithms and you have a measure of performance and you want to compare the two algorithms. Uh, Felipe describes in this paper a very specific way to calculate the sample size. So I recommend uh, for everyone that is watching this video to read this paper as a complement to this lecture. Okay, so also there are, so this is the first link for the recommended read. There are two more links, the two more papers that talk a little bit more about sample size calculations in different situations. And that is it for this lecture. I hope you enjoyed and I see you Friday for the question session. Thank you.